Chapter Twenty One of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Look my best, Elizabeth repeated, standing before her muslin skirted dressing table and staring at the haggard apparition that met her eyes. Wear my most becoming gown, do my hair in the most becoming way. It all sounds so easy. But what can bring back my color? What can take away these terrible dark rings, this horrible, strained, anxious look? Any one can see to look at me that I've something on my mind. I shall never tell him the truth, never, never. I may beat about the bush, but I shall always leave myself a loophole to crawl out of. And yet, if I could only consult him, consult someone, find out what I really ought to do, but no, no, I don't dare risk it. It would be terrible to be advised, just the way I don't want. I must decide on some plan myself, but heaven knows what. She stood for a while motionless, gazing helplessly into a mist of perplexities. The little Sevres clock on her mantelpiece roused her as it struck the hour, and she began hastily to dress. She drew the rippling waves of her hair into the fashion that Mrs. Bobby liked. She put on her favorite gown, a charming creation of white lace and chiffon, relieved by touches of pale green. She tried conscientiously to look her best, but still her cheeks were pale. There was the strained look in her eyes. She was about ready when Mrs. Bobby's maid came to help her, bringing a box of flowers that had just that moment arrived. Celeste, a thrifty person, regarded them with some disgust. She could tell them, these gentlemen, that it was of little use to waste their money on Mademoiselle, who did not care about, sometimes hardly glanced at, the flowers, which some other young lady would give her eyes to receive. Ah, well, that was the unequal way in which things in this world were arranged. Celeste disposed of the matter thus, with a philosophic French shrug of her shoulders. But there was no counting on such a capricious person as Mademoiselle, Tonight, as she glanced at the card in the box, she blushed beautifully, took the flowers out with care, and read with eager eyes the few lines that the giver had scrawled, apparently in great haste and in pencil. This afternoon I was unspeakably rude, even brutal. Forgive me. What right had I to take you to task for your actions? My only excuse is that I care. I can't help caring so desperately. I send you white roses. They suit you best. You wore one that I gave you, do you remember? But probably you don't. The first night I saw you. If you are very merciful, if you accept my repentance, wear one tonight in token of forgiveness. In token of forgiveness? Elizabeth pressed one of the exquisite, creamy white roses against her glowing cheeks. You wore one the first night I saw you. Probably you don't remember? Ah, yes, she remembered. But that was different. She could not wear one now. Yet, only in token of forgiveness? With a quick, passionate gesture, she raised it to her lips, then fastened it carefully amidst the lace of her gown. Celeste, whose presence she had forgotten, bent down discreetly, with a suppressed smile, to arrange the folds of her train. Ah, clearly, after all, there was one gentleman who did not waste his money on Mademoiselle. Madame wished Mademoiselle to look well tonight, she observed, after a moment. I think Madame will be satisfied. Mademoiselle glanced at herself again, and started as she looked. Could this brilliant young beauty, her small head proudly erect, her eyes brilliant, her cheeks aflame, be the same woman whose haggard reflection had stared back at her from the same mirror only half an hour before? She did not feel like the same woman. The doubts, the fears which had beset her then seemed mere chimeras, the fancies of a morbid brain. She felt gay, confident, strong enough to conquer even fate. Celeste was right. She looked her best. Mrs. Bobby's words rang in her ears. Such trifles have their effect even on a paragon. And then again, he would think you perfect as you were if he loved you. No, 
He need not think me perfect, she murmured to her mirror. But he must, he shall think me beautiful. And that is more to the point, she concluded, as she gathered up fan and gloves and left the room. The opera that night was Carmen, which peculiarly suited her phase of mind. There is no other which so thoroughly embodies the spirit of recklessness, the triumph of the senses, the frank, impulsive, untrammeled enjoyment of life and of living. To be sure, there is the tragic ending, but before that three acts of brilliant melody, glowing with color, with warm, sensuous pleasure. Gerard was waiting in the box when they arrived. On the stage, Carmen, that ideal Carmen of whom Mermé dreamed, and Bizet set to music, had just appeared upon the scene of Don José's misfortune, and was warbling with bewitching abandon the notes of the habanera. Gerard's face, which had an anxious look, brightened wonderfully, radiantly, as the two women entered the box. He murmured eagerly a few grateful words in Elizabeth's ear, and took the seat directly behind her, which he did not abandon, even though his predictions were justified and Mrs. Van Antwerp's box was filled, after the first act, with men who looked anything but pleased at finding that particular place monopolized. Mrs. Bobby, however, seemed delighted to entertain them, was gracious, charming, and piquant, and elicited from a stern dowager in the next box severe criticisms on the wiles of young married women and their reprehensible manner of diverting to themselves the attention due to the young girls under their charge. Elizabeth hardly noticed the men who entered the box. She sat with eyes fixed upon the stage, upon that intensely real music drama, which she had seen many times already, but which never lost its fascination. Yet acutely conscious, all the while, through every fibre of her being, of Gerard's presence, of his watching her, of his bending over her now and again to murmur a word in her ear. And as for him, she had appealed to him most perhaps, at least to a certain side of his nature, that afternoon in her pale languor, and yet he could not but feel his senses thrilled, his pulses throb, when she was so warmly, vividly, humanly beautiful as she was to-night. For the moment he was carried beyond himself, the doubts dispelled, or at least forgotten. And yet, as the evening wore on, some subtle influence in the music or the play seemed to recall them. At the end of the second act she turned to him, the strains of the Turiedor song still ringing in her ear, and felt insensibly a sudden lack of sympathy, a cloud that seemed to have drifted between them. His brows were knit and his face moody. "'You don't like it?' she said, staring up at him with wondering, disappointed eyes. "'What, the opera?' He stared as if his thoughts had been elsewhere. "'No, I don't like it,' he said frankly. "'It jars upon me somehow. Brings up memories.' He paused. "'Oh, it's some drop of Puritan blood, I suppose, that asserts itself in me. I can't view the thing from an artistic standpoint,' he went on impatiently. "'I can't forget for a moment what a heartless creature the woman is. When I see her ruining men's lives, luring them on, turning from one to another, it's too realistic. There are too many women like that. He was speaking low and bitterly, with a strange vehemence, but suddenly he broke off with a short laugh. Oh, it, it's absurd, he said, to take a thing like that seriously. Elizabeth did not smile. She leaned back in her chair as if she were suddenly weary. Poor Carmen, she said in a low voice. You're very hard on her. She held up her fan before her eyes, as if the light hurt them. A shadow seemed to fall upon her beauty, effacing its color and brilliance, bringing out again into strong relief the dark rings under her eyes, the lines about the mouth. She sat in silence for a while, but suddenly she turned to him. "'I'm going to shock you, I'm afraid,' she said. "'But, do you know, somehow I can't help seeing the other side. What is a woman to do?' If she changes, against her will, is she to abide always inexorably by the results of a mistake? A note of passionate feeling thrilled her voice. She fixed her eyes anxiously, intently upon Gerard. There are so many questions that might arise, she went on eagerly, as he did not answer at once. 
one might for instance make a promise a very solemn promise and find out afterwards that it was a mistake that it would ruin one's whole life to keep it and and one might break it and the other person might think himself very much injured and yet would you think the woman in that case so very much to blame gerard thought he understood with the conviction came a sense of passionate relief which yet he hesitated with the fastidious scruples of a proud and honorable man to grasp in its entirety i i don't think i'm competent to express an opinion he said in a low voice you should ask some one else there's no one else whom i can ask she said quickly and with her eyes always fixed imploringly upon him tell me what do you think what should a woman do in a case like that it it's a difficult situation he said still holding under control his eager desire to advise her in the only way in which it seemed to him possible to advise her but how could he trust his own judgment i he hesitated personally he said i can't imagine holding a woman to a promise that she has repented of but other men might probably would feel differently yes she said sadly he this man does and you the woman is quite sure she has made a mistake he asked eagerly yes yes quite sure she said quickly a terrible mistake then said gerard and he drew a long sigh as of intense relief i don't think there could be two opinions on the subject no one could advise you this woman to ruin her life for a mistake especially if the man were unworthy he looked at her questioningly he seemed to her unworthy she said in a low voice then for heaven's sake he asked almost fiercely how can you hesitate she did not speak but turned her eyes toward the stage and again placed her fan so that it shielded them all over the house there was the subdued rustle of people returning to their seats the orchestra sounded the first notes of the third act the curtain rose upon the gypsy camp during michaela's solo and the scene between the two men elizabeth still sat silent her fan before her face the act was well advanced before she turned to gerard then she said you would advise me to to break my word under the circumstances yes he said steadily but don't he went on quickly and a passionate vibration thrilled his voice more unrepressed than ever before don't be guided by my opinion in this particular case it is it is impossible for me to judge impartially is it she asked softly and then added quickly as if to avert an answer still i'm glad to know your opinion i feel sure you wouldn't say what you don't think thank you thank you very much her tone was low and subdued like that of a grateful child she leaned back in her chair with a look of relief that seemed both physical and mental she did not speak again till near the end of the act when carmen reads her fortune in the cards i wonder elizabeth said then softly what she sees in them i had my fortune told once she observed turning to gerard as the curtain fell it was when i was at school and i went out with one of the girls to a famous palmist he told me all sorts of strange true things about the past and about the future she paused well about the future he asked smiling one doesn't care about the past but he predicted no doubt all sorts of delightful things about your future no she stared thoughtfully before her with knit brows he said she spoke low and hesitatingly he said there was luck in my hand plenty of it i should have splendid opportunities but he said that there was a line of misfortune which crossed the other line and might make it utterly useless that there was danger of some kind he couldn't tell what threatening me about my twenty-first year and that you know is very near he said there were strange lines tragic unusual she stopped it sounds very ridiculous but though she tried to smile her voice trembled and yet i remember it frightened me at the time and does still a little when i think about it 
"'But you don't, surely,' cried Gerard. "'My dear child, you don't suppose he knew a thing about it?' "'I don't know. I believe I'm superstitious, are you not?' "'I'm afraid I am,' he said. "'But not about things like that. I've seen too many predictions of that kind prove false to give them any thought.' "'It is foolish to worry about them,' she admitted. But still she sat, apparently deep in thought, and played absently with her fan. At last she looked up with her most brilliant smile. "'I don't know why it is,' she said, "'but we seem to be fated on unpleasant subjects. And yet the opera is so gay. Do let us try for the rest of the evening to think of pleasant things.' She turned and held out her hand, smiling, to a man who entered the box. For the rest of the opera she was brilliant, animated, beautiful as she had been at first. "'And now you are satisfied,' she said, looking at Gerard with laughing eyes as the curtain fell for the last time. "'Carmen comes to a bad end. According to your principles, she deserved it.' "'Ah, my principles,' he said, smiling. "'I'm afraid I don't live up to them very much.' "'Don't you?' She gave him a quick searching glance as he stood with her cloak in his hand. "'I wish I could believe that,' she murmured. I should be a little less afraid of you. He placed the cloak about her shoulders. It is I who am afraid of you, he whispered, bending over her, and have been ever since I knew you. Her eyes fell, and she fumbled nervously with the fastening of the cloak. You're afraid of me, she said under her breath, and now, oh, I've grown very brave, he murmured, as he followed her out of the box. You can't frighten me away any longer. The jesting words lingered in her ear as they left the opera house. Ah, if he knew, she said to herself as she sank into the corner of the carriage. He doesn't know, and yet I told him the exact truth. It's not my fault if he misunderstood. And Gerard, meanwhile, was telling himself that he understood it all. "'Poor child,' he murmured to himself as he lit a cigar and sauntered slowly home. "'So that was it. Of course she thought she loved him. The first man she met, and when he turned up, felt herself bound. I see it all. And she has suffered, had terrible pangs of conscience over the thing. And I, who misjudged her all the time, imagined I don't know what. Could I have advised her differently? Surely not.' The fellow's not worthy of her. Neither am I. She won't look at me, probably, and yet one can but try. End of chapter 21「Chapter 22 of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was mentioned generally, at various sewing classes and other mild functions during Lent, that Julian Gerard was very attentive all of a sudden to Elizabeth Van Vorst. Some people, less accurate or more imaginative than the rest, went so far as to announce the engagement as an actual fact. "'And if so, it's all Eleanor Van Antwerp's doing,' Mrs. Hartington observed in private to her intimate friends. She was determined to make the match from the beginning. I saw the way she threw the girl at his head at a dinner in the country, but I never for a moment thought that she would succeed, with Julian Gerard of all men, who was so desperately afraid of being taken in. Julian Gerard, by that time, had well nigh forgotten that such a fear had ever disturbed him, or if he did remember, it was to regard it, so far as Elizabeth was concerned, as profanation. Since that evening at the opera his remorseful fancy had placed her on a pinnacle, which she found at times, it must be confessed, a little difficult to maintain. It was his misfortune and hers that he could never view her in the right perspective, never realize that she was neither a saint nor the reverse, but merely a woman, and painfully human at that. But since he chose to consider her a saint, she did her best to live up to the character— she kept Lent strictly that year as she had never done before, went to church morning and evening, denied herself bonbons and other luxuries, and worked with unskilled fingers but great diligence at certain oddly constructed garments, 
which were doled out to her and other young women every week as a Lenten penance, and incidentally for the good of the poor. If, in most cases, the actual penance fell to the lot of their maids, why, the poor were none the wiser, and certainly much better clothed. But Elizabeth insisted on putting in all the painful stitches in the hard, coarse stuff herself, and looked very pretty bending over it, as Mr. Gerard thought when he came in one day and found her thus employed. It pleased him, of course. He did not attach much importance himself to these things, this constant church-going, these small penances. Yet, man-like, it seemed to him right and fitting that she should regard them differently. And then it was pleasant, after service, to meet her in the vestibule. How many incipient love affairs have been helped along, brought to a climax, perhaps, by the convenient afternoon service and the sauntering walks home in the lingering twilight. To Elizabeth there was an indefinable charm in those ever-lengthening Lenten days, rung in and out to the music of church bells, and marked, as the season advanced and Easter approached, by the growing green of the grass and the budding shoots of the trees, and the intangible feeling of spring in the air. That sense of dread, of impending misfortune, which had been for a short time almost unbearable, was lulled to sleep as by an opiate. She did not think of the past or the future. She simply drifted from day to day, and each of these was pleasanter than the last. For one thing, she had grown hardened, indifferent almost, to the constant meeting with Paul Halleck. She had kept her word and obtained for him all the invitations in her power, until he no longer needed her help. He was a great success. Mrs. Van Antwerp's informal little musicale had been only the first of a series of more elaborate ones, at which Halleck was often the chief attraction. Young girls admired him extremely. Elizabeth could hear him talking to them, just as he had once talked to her, about Swinburne and Rossetti and the last word in art, and she saw that, like herself, they thought him very brilliant. It was an admiration which had tangible results, since it led to an interest in music and a desire to take singing lessons from the talented young baritone. Before long he took a studio in Carnegie, near Dauteville's, and furnished it luxuriously, on the strength of his new prosperity. He was very much the fashion and absorbed in his success, and seldom had the time, or perhaps the inclination, to encounter Elizabeth's unflattering indifference. So, for the most part, he left her alone, to her intense relief. One incident, a chance word in a retrospect of that time, afterward stood out in Elizabeth's mind, though at the moment it seemed to make but a slight impression. It was one Sunday afternoon when a number of people, Paul Halleck among them, had dropped into afternoon tea, and the conversation happened to turn upon palmistry. Elizabeth did not prefer her own experience. She listened silently to what the others said on the subject. "'I can't say I have implicit faith in it,' observed Mrs. Bobby. "'I was told by a fortune-teller that I should marry a dark man who would beat me and treat me horribly. And as you see, I've married a fair man who treats me pretty well on the whole.' Bobby, who was leaning against the mantelpiece, his teacup in his hand, smiled serenely. "'Don't boast too soon, Eleanor,' he said lazily. "'There's no knowing what brutal tendencies I may develop yet.' Mrs. Hartington, who was seated near him on a low chair, looked up into his face with a sympathetic smile. "'Are you one of those long-suffering husbands who turn at last, Mr. Van Antwerp?' she asked sweetly. "'It would be good discipline, I think, for Eleanor not to have her own way always.' Bobby looked down at her coolly for a moment with his calm blue eyes. "'No doubt it would be good discipline for all of us, Mrs. Hartington,' he said in his pleasant, clear-cut tones. But as my wife's way and mine are generally the same, I'm afraid I'm not likely to inflict it." Mrs. Hartington looked down with an injured air, adding another to her list of grievances against her dear friend and neighbor, Eleanor Van Antwerp. "'I should never go to a common fortune-teller, my dear,' she observed in a louder tone, for the benefit of the assembled company. "'Yours was probably just an ignorant person. But I did go to one who you know charges a small fortune, and he told me the most extraordinary things. I have perfect confidence in him. Every one I know thinks him quite infallible." "'Do they?' said Paul Halleck, suddenly turning from the piano. 
He shrugged his shoulders. "'I devoutly hope you're mistaken,' he said. "'I had my hand read in Paris, and was told some very unpleasant things, among others that I was probably destined to a violent death. This year of my life, by the way, the twenty-seventh, was to be my fatal year.' He spoke half-laughingly, but the words produced an effect. There was a general exclamation of horror, and Elizabeth, who was pouring tea, dropped the cup that she held in her hand. Julian Gerard, who was standing behind her, bent down to recover the fragments. "'It's odd,' he said, as he placed them absently on the table. "'His year of danger, and yours, seem to correspond.' The words rose involuntarily to his lips and an instant later he wished them unspoken. She flushed a little, then grew pale. "'Oh, I'm sorry you remember that nonsense,' she said. "'I don't really believe in these things.' But her hand trembled as she poured out the tea, glancing furtively at Halleck as she did so. He was enjoying the sensation that his announcement had created. "'Yes,' he was saying. If I live to be a year older, I am safe, but till then heaven knows what danger threatens me." He shrugged his shoulders with a light laugh. The prediction did not seem to trouble him greatly. Elizabeth wondered if he had not invented it for the sake of the effect. And then, involuntarily, the thought crossed her mind. What if it were really true, and the prediction were fulfilled? Such things had been known to happen. There might be something in it. Quick as lightning, the thought flashed through her mind of all that his death might mean to her. The merciful release, the solution of all difficulties. Just for a moment, the idea lingered, while the others talked, and she shuddered. "'You are quite pale,' said Gerard, fixing his eyes upon her. He was still sensitive to any sign of feeling which Halleck seemed to arouse in her. "'I believe you are really superstitious.' These things seem to frighten you. Am I superstitious? She looked up at him dreamily. Perhaps I am. It would be nice, I think, if there were something in it. If one could tell what is going to happen, one could act accordingly. I should like, for instance, her voice sank, I should like to look into the future one year and see what fate has in store for me. If I had any control over fate, Gerard crushed back the impetuous words that followed. Not yet. The moment was not propitious. Besides, he was not sure of her. There was still at times something in her manner that was baffling, uncertain. And just then Paul Halleck sauntered up and bent over her in that intimate manner which still annoyed Gerard's fastidious taste, even though he had long since convinced himself that he had no cause to fear him as a rival. "'Did you hear my terrible prediction?' "'Miss Van Vorst?' Paul asked, smiling. "'And aren't you sorry for my untimely fate?' End of chapter 22「Twenty Three of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Why will you never play for me? Gerard stood leaning on the piano, his eyes half smiling, yet with a look of mastery fixed upon Elizabeth. She was sitting in a low chair by the fire, the book on her lap which she had been reading when he came in. It was a stormy March afternoon, and the dusk was closing in prematurely. The room was already in shadow, except where the firelight formed a little circle of radiance illuminating Elizabeth's face and hair. Seated thus in the full glow of light, with the shadows in the foreground, all the little details of her appearance, the broad sweep of rippling hair on her forehead, the soft laces at her throat, the pale dull green of her gown, even to the buckle on her slipper and the one white rose in her belt, each trifling part of the harmonious whole impressed itself upon his memory, haunting him afterward with a keen sense of pain. She looked up at him now from under her long lashes, with the old light in her eyes, half defiant, half tantalizing, that spirit of revolt which still glanced forth at times to baffle and disturb him. I don't want to play this afternoon. I don't feel in the mood. You are never in the mood when I ask you. Silence. 
"'Confess at once,' said Gerard, with some heat, "'for it would really be quite as civil, "'that you don't wish to play for me.' "'Another swift upward glance. "'Perhaps I don't,' demurely. "'You're too severe a critic.' "'You know,' said Gerard, "'that that is not the reason.' "'Silence again. "'Will you tell me the reason?' he asked. "'She answered him this time with a flash of defiance. "'I don't know what right you have to demand it,' she said. "'But if you insist upon it, I'll tell you. "'You—you you don't like my playing, and it's very absurd, of course, "'but I can never play for people who don't.' "'I don't like your playing?' He shielded his eyes for a moment, as if from the glare of the fire. When he spoke again, his tone was peremptory. "'You foolish child,' he said. "'Come and play for me, and I'll tell you afterward what I think of it.' She looked up at him, startled, rebellious, met his eyes for a moment, then rose, pouting like the child that he called her, constrained against her will, put down her book, and moved slowly toward the piano. "'You are so terribly determined,' she complained. "'And you are so terribly perverse. "'But when I want a thing very much, I can be determined, as you say. "'Play me the fire music,' he went on. "'And, and Tristan and Isolde, as you did, do you remember, the first night I met you?' She paused with her hands on the keys. "'I, I thought,' she began, and then broke off suddenly and began to play as he bade her, at first faltering uncertainly, with a strange hesitation, then more firmly as the keys responded with the old readiness to her touch, and then she lost herself in the music. Outside the storm increased, the rain beat against the windows, the room grew dark, and once Elizabeth paused she could hardly see the keys, but Gerard murmured, Ah, the love music! And she played on. All the terrible distress the maddening perplexity of the last few months seemed to express themselves, in spite of herself, in those surging, strenuous chords. All the hope, too, and the wild, unreasoning happiness. She was startled, almost as if she were telling the whole story in language so eloquent that he must surely understand it without further words. But Gerard, as was natural, read into it only his own feelings. He stood leaning on the piano his hand shielding his eyes, which were fixed intently upon her. It was so dark now that he could hardly see her face, only the shimmer of her hair standing out against the dusk, the movement of her white hands on the keys. She faltered at last, struck a false chord, and broke off in the very midst of the love music. I, I can't see, she murmured, and let her hands fall in her lap. Do you remember, Gerard said, that first night you played? I had talked to you at dinner. You know, you, you repelled me a little. I thought— I am telling you the bare truth, you see. You were a little cynical, a little hard. It seemed a pity when you were so— He paused for a moment, and his voice softened as he lingered over the word. So beautiful. I couldn't understand you. I thought— I wouldn't try. It wasn't worth while. Most things were not. And then you played. He paused again for a moment. You know what most girls' playing is like? Yours has soul, a fire. I don't know where you get it. It moves me, set me thinking as no other woman's playing had done for years. He paused again. Elizabeth looked up quickly. I thought, she murmured, that you didn't like my playing, that you were bored. Ah, you thought, he said that when a man feels very much he can make pretty speeches? I can't, at least. Oh, I've no doubt, he made a resigned gesture, I've no doubt that I behaved like a brute. Women have told me that I generally do. I said to myself, that girl is dangerous. She could make a man fall in love with her, even against his will. I was in love once, but that's another story. I never wanted to repeat the experiment. And so, as you know, I avoided you, like a fool I used to go to look at your picture, and then keep away from you, evening after evening. I struggled with all the strength I have. I struggled not to love you. And then, as you know, he looked her straight in the eyes, as you have known well these last few weeks, I failed. There was silence for a moment. She was very white. 
Her hands were tightly clasped in her lap. I... She gave a little shuddering sigh. It would have been better if you hadn't. Elizabeth! She felt rather than saw how his face changed. Elizabeth, he said hoarsely. Do you mean that? Then, as she sat silent, then you don't love me? Oh, for the strength to answer no, and end this scene, this useless, perplexing scene, which she should have been prepared for, which yet seemed to have come upon her unawares. One firm, courageous no, and a man like Gerard would not ask her twice. Instead, a compromise, useless, feeble, hovered on her lips. I... I shouldn't make you happy, she faltered out, despising her own weakness. <laughs> Is that all? He laughed out loud in sheer relief. My darling! The triumphant tenderness in his voice was hard to bear. Don't you think that I can be the judge of that? She was silent, and he drew nearer to her, and took her hands in his. You needn't be afraid, he said. I shall worship the ground you tread upon. If, if you will only consent. You will, Elizabeth, won't you? She had not known before that his voice held tones so caressingly gentle. For a moment she sat motionless, passive beneath his touch, and then suddenly, I can't, she broke out hoarsely, drew her hands away from him, and going over to the mantelpiece she leaned her arms upon it and hid her face. When he spoke again, after a long silence, his voice was entirely changed. There is something here I don't understand, he said coldly. One moment you seem to yield, and the next— he made a step toward her. "'Tell me the truth,' he entreated. "'Don't spare my feelings. It's a false kindness. You love someone else. Is that it? Then tell me so, and I won't reproach you or trouble you again.' She turned her face toward him. It was white, quivering with emotion, but she answered firmly, "'No, you're entirely wrong. There is no one else.' "'Not Halleck?' he asked, watching her intently his face dark with the old distrust. She made a quick, involuntary gesture of repulsion. "'Not he, not he of all people,' she said bitterly. He still eyed her doubtfully, unsatisfied. "'You're sure?' he insisted. "'You're telling the whole truth? Don't deceive me now, Elizabeth. I could forgive anything but that.' How many chances were given to Elizabeth only to be thrown away? She answered him steadily. I'm not deceiving you. I tell you frankly that when I first met Paul Halleck I thought I cared for him. He was the first man I had ever known. But now he is nothing to me, and I have told him so. I think, I think I almost dislike him. There was no mistaking the accent of sincerity in her voice. It was fortunate for Elizabeth, since she was no adept in lying, that the truth and the falsehood were in this case so nearly identical. Gerard was satisfied. "'Then what?' he urged eagerly. "'If there is no one else, what stands between us?' She hesitated. There were voices in the hall, some visitors requesting admission, the butler parlaying a little, the discreet, intelligent butler, who had so considerately refrained for the last quarter of an hour from coming in to light the gas. Gerard was too absorbed to notice anything outside of the cause he was pleading. "'Tell me,' he repeated, his eyes fixed intently upon her face, "'what stands between us?' She put out her hand with a deprecating gesture. That threatening interruption seemed to give her courage. She was quite herself again. "'Can't a woman hesitate for no definite reason?' she asked. "'You yourself, didn't you hesitate, for reasons that I must confess seem to me rather vague and not very complimentary?' The argument struck home. He changed color. "'Don't cast that up against me, Elizabeth,' he pleaded. "'It's not worthy of you. I told you the plain truth, badly as it sounds, because it seemed due to you. I wanted you to know the worst. And you must remember that I had no reason to suppose that you cared, or would ever care, anything about me. It was only I who suffered when I kept away from you. But you, now that you know how— how madly I love you! Don't trifle with me. Be generous. Give me a definite answer. 
"'But I, I can't,' she returned in her old wilful way. "'Just on the spur of the moment like this, I don't want to marry any one, not just now, at least. I, I, I like my freedom.' The words died away on her lips. She broke off suddenly, turning very pale, as the importunate visitor, whom the butler had vainly endeavored to show into another room, drew aside the portiere and entered brusquely. It was Paul Halleck. He had a strangely excited look which increased as he surveyed the two people on the hearthrug, whom he had evidently interrupted at a critical moment. To one of them, at least, his entrance was most unwelcome. Not all of Gerard's carefully cultivated self-control could avail to hide his annoyance. He uttered under his breath an angry exclamation, and going over to the piano stood moodily turning over sheets of music. Elizabeth, to whom Paul's appearance was for some reason still more disconcerting, showed greater self-possession. She held out her hand coldly but composedly, and with a few mechanical words to which he barely responded. There was an embarrassing pause broken by the butler, who made his belated majestic entry, lighted the chandeliers, and drew the curtains. The effect of the illumination was startling, as it threw into strong relief the look of agitation on each of their faces. It's, it's storming still, isn't it? said Elizabeth, and then remembered that she had asked the same question already. Gerard started up and reflecting gloomily that it was of no use to try to stay that fellow out. He took his leave. Paul and Elizabeth were left alone. His presence seemed a matter of absolute indifference to Elizabeth, who sank again into the low chair by the fire, and picking up the book she had laid down, turned over its pages with an air of icy unconcern. He came and stood beside her, leaning against the mantelpiece, a look of brutality on his handsome face. So, he said, I've driven Gerard away. A case of two is company, evidently. Her expression did not change. Oh, he had been here some time, she said coldly. No doubt he meant to leave in any case. Oh, no doubt, he sneered angrily. Do you know what I heard today? He went on. I heard that you were engaged to him. She flushed a little. Did you? she said, and then quietly. But that means nothing, you know. But you are together all the time. I can't come to the house without meeting him. You encourage him, accept his flowers, lead him on. Pray, how long is this sort of thing going to last? They eyed each other for a moment. He flushed with anger, she cold and hard. You have no right, she said icily, to ask an account of my actions. No right, he repeated, as if thunderstruck. I should like to know who has a better— no right that I acknowledge, at least, she amended her first sentence. He paced up and down the room, struggling for self-control. Whether you acknowledge it or not is immaterial, he said, stopping suddenly in front of her. I claim it, and that is enough. You must give up this infernal flirtation with Gerard, or—or or what? she insisted haughtily as he paused. I shall go to Gerard at once and tell him the truth, he concluded defiantly dead silence. The book she held fell from Elizabeth's nerveless hand. The steady ticking of the clock in the stillness seemed to beat an accompaniment to these words. Don't deceive me now, Elizabeth. I could forgive anything but that. Paul? Her voice was no longer icy, but soft with caressing tones. Paul, you wouldn't be so unkind. What difference does it make to you? He said, eyeing her keenly whether I tell Gerard or not. You can't marry him, you know. It's impossible. I don't want to marry him, she said, gathering all her powers of resistance. But he's a friend of mine. I don't want him to be told things about me by an outsider. Ah, oh, you call me that, he said, his anger roused again. Well, outsider or not, I hold the cards. I shall go to Gerard at once and tell him that we were married at Cranston last July. If he doubts my assertion, the record is there, and it won't be very hard for him to verify it. Silence again. Elizabeth sat musing, her brows knit, her under lip slightly thrust out, in a fashion that seemed to express all the obstinate resolve of her nature. I will do as you wish, if you will keep silent. Will you write a note to Gerard? Paul demanded, sending him away. No, she said sullenly. I won't do that. 
"'Then there is nothing else you can do,' he declared. Elizabeth mused again. "'I would give money,' she said. The last word was spoken very low. He started and flushed. "'Do you want to bribe me?' he asked angrily. She shrugged her shoulders. "'I'm quite aware that you will not do anything for nothing,' she said. Paul fell again to pacing up and down the room. His face showed traces of a mental struggle. Elizabeth watched him from the corners of her eyes, and she saw that her offer tempted him more than she dared to hope. He stopped at last in front of her. "'How much can you spare?' he asked in a voice in which a certain bravado strove to gain the mastery over inward uneasiness and shame. "'The truth is, I am most confoundedly hard up just now, what with furnishing the studio and everything, and if you could help me a little it would be very convenient. I could pay you back later with interest a hundred times.' "'I have told you,' she said coldly, "'what payment I want.' He shrugged his shoulders with an attempt at nonchalance. "'Oh, as to that, I never really intended to tell Gerard.' Elizabeth's lip curled. "'How much money do you want?' she asked curtly. "'A hundred? Two hundred? Her ideas of such matters were vague. Paul's face fell. "'I should need five hundred at least, if, if it's to be any use.' he said gloomily. It was more than she expected, but she showed no signs of flinching. Five hundred, then, she said, rising as if to conclude the interview. Will it do if I let you have it to-morrow? Perfectly. Elizabeth, you're an angel. I can't thank you enough. He advanced toward her with outstretched arms, but with a gesture of repulsion she waved him aside. Don't thank me, she said coldly. This is a bargain for our mutual advantage. I will fulfill my share of it if you remember yours. And now, as we have nothing more to discuss, I think I will ask you to excuse me. She made him a stately inclination, picked up her book, and sailed from the room in undiminished dignity and apparent unconcern. But when she was alone and had locked herself in her room to think over her misery, then, indeed, the situation stared her in the face in its true colors. Her own words— I like my freedom, rang mockingly in her ears. She was not free, but a slave, slave of a man who had her in his power and would use it as time went on more and more unscrupulously. This time it was five hundred that he demanded. Next time it would be a thousand. What could she do? Somehow or another he must be satisfied. Anything was better, any sacrifice, any humiliation, than to allow him to go to Gerard with the bare statement of facts. We were married at Cranston last July. The truth, devoid of any of the softening evasions by which she cloaked it to her own mind, the redeeming circumstances which excused, if they did not justify, her silence. Her bitterest enemy must admit that the position was a hard one a contract entered into hastily by a thoughtless girl, on the impulse of the moment, a quarter of an hour in an empty church one summer day, a few words spoken before a sleepy old clergyman and indifferent witnesses. Could such things as these have power to ruin one's whole life? No, no, her heart cried out wildly to the contrary. The whole episode seemed in retrospect so dreamlike, it was easy to imagine that it had never happened. And yet had she the courage to ignore it? And even if she had, there was always Paul to remind her of it, who would not give her up without a terrible struggle that must, without fail, come to Gerard's ears. There was only one hope that she could see, and that was wild and irrational, the hope Paul had himself suggested. If that prediction could be fulfilled— Elizabeth shuddered. It was terrible to think of such a thing, terrible to obtain one's own happiness at the cost of another person's life. She did not really wish Paul dead. That would be wicked. And yet, and yet, the thought pressed irresistibly upon her. If it had to be, if it had to be, what a blessed relief, what an end to all this misery. Oh, I do wish it, I do wish it, she broke out, speaking aloud unconsciously. I would give anything in this world to hear of his death. She stopped, startled at the sound of her own voice. The wish shocked her, even in the moment of expressing it. Her wishes were so often fulfilled, 
she had an almost superstitious faith in their efficacy. If this one were fulfilled, what then? For a moment she, thinking it over, balanced possibilities, and then with a stifled cry fell on her knees and hid her face in her hands. "'Oh, I am growing so wicked,' she sobbed out. "'It's because I'm so miserable. Only let me have what I want, and I'll be different. I'll be the kind of woman that he admires. Only I must find a way. I must have what I want. First. End of chapter 23「twenty four of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The next day dawned clear and bright, a beautiful morning in early spring after a night of storm. Upon Elizabeth's spirits as she dressed, the weather produced the illogical effect that it does upon most of us. Reviewed by daylight, the situation seemed to her many degrees less desperate. The night before, there had seemed to her only one way out, and that a tragical one. But now there were, there must be, a hundred ways, if only she could gain the time to think of them. The first thing was to obtain the money, but this in itself was no easy matter. She had promised it to Paul as if it were a mere trifle, yet, as a matter of fact, she was as badly off herself at the time as was to be expected of a young woman who had gone out a great deal, and established and lived up to an expensive reputation for being always well and appropriately gowned. She reviewed her resources. Mrs. Bobby would have lent her the money at once, and asked no questions, but from this course Elizabeth's pride shrank uncomfortably. She preferred to take a sum she had just laid aside to satisfy, to some extent, the claims of a long-suffering and complacent dressmaker, but even with this sacrifice determined on, she was still far short of the amount required. She took out in desperation her various jewels and trinkets, and looked them over, wondering how much they were worth. There were many pretty things her aunts had given her, none of them probably of any great intrinsic value, and there were the beautiful gifts that Mrs. Bobby had showered upon her, and finally there was the string of pearls which she always wore about her neck one of the few heirlooms which old Madame Van Borst had once kept under lock and key, and which her daughters had, of course, made over to Elizabeth. The girl stood now hesitating with the pearls in her hand. She had worn them to every ball that winter, she was wont to say, with her half-joking, half-real touch of superstition, that they brought her luck, as if, with their possession, something of the spirit of that proud beauty of a bygone day had entered into her enabling her to conquer the world in which the older woman had been naturally at home. Would the power leave her with the pearls? The fantastic thought lingered for a moment, and then impatiently she thrust it aside, and put the precious heirloom in with the rest of her possessions, which she had resolved to sacrifice. It was not a moment when she could afford to dally with sentiment. Yet what a strange, disreputable proceeding it seemed! She was haunted with a vague sense of losing caste, as she took her trinkets to one of the smaller jewelry shops, and faltered out her improbable tale of their being unbecoming and of no use to her. The jeweler, well used to the straits of fashionable young women, listened without a smile, and offered her on the whole a fair price, though it was much less than she expected. There was nothing that she was not obliged to part with from the jewelled watch which Mrs. Bobby had given her at Christmas, to the pearls which proved to be the most valuable of all. When she left the shop she had deprived herself of all her ornaments, but she held the necessary bribe in her hand, and as the simplest way of conveying it to Halleck, she got on a cable car and went up at once to his studio at Carnegie. There was nothing startling in the proceeding for he had now a number of pupils who came to him at his studio, and though the girls whom Elizabeth knew always brought their maids, or a chaperone of some sort, she was not in the mood to waste much thought on conventionalities. Her one idea was to fulfill her share of the bargain before he should, perchance, have repented of his, and she did not think of the chance of meeting any one. 
her own affairs had reached a crisis which blinded her to the fact that to other people the world was progressing peacefully in the usual order of events. This streamlike state of indifference to all but the one anxiety continued till she reached Carnegie, and was borne up in the elevator to Paul's studio, which was directly opposite to Mr. Dauteville's. And here, for the first time, she paused, seized by a sudden panic. From behind the closed curtain at the end of the small vestibule there came the sound of a woman's voice, strained, nasal, raised high in what seemed a tirade of denunciation. To Elizabeth's mind, as she heard it, there arose an involuntary recollection of Bassett Mills, and of the gaudy little parlor behind her aunt's shop, and some bitter words directed against herself, in what seemed a past period of her history. She stood hesitating, terrified. Then the curtain was pushed aside, and a woman came out. It was her cousin Amanda. Her face was white and set, her eyes blazing. She stared at Elizabeth for a moment as if dazed, then brushed past her without a word. Paul stood on the threshold, a picturesque object in his velveteen coat and turned-down collar, against the artistic background of the luxuriously furnished studio. He looked flushed, annoyed. The scene which had just taken place had evidently been a trying one. But when he saw Elizabeth standing doubtful in the hall, his face cleared, and he came forward to greet her with effusion. "'Darling, how good of you to come here!' He evidently hailed the visit as an overture towards reconciliation. She hastened to disabuse him. "'It was the easiest way to bring this,' she said, handing him the package which she had clasped nervously all the way up. "'Will you be kind enough, please, to count it and see if it is all right?' It was impossible to speak with more icy brevity, or to impart to any proceeding a more severely business-like air. He flushed uncomfortably, but did not allow his vexation to interfere with the evident necessity of counting the money. "'It is all right,' he said, biting his lips, as he put down the last roll of bills. "'Do you wish me to give you a receipt?' he asked, with fine sarcasm. "'No,' said Elizabeth gravely. I rely on your word. Paul bowed. Thank you, he said. And now, is there anything else I can do for you? Nothing, said Elizabeth briefly, except what you know already. And now I must go. She moved toward the door, but he placed himself in her way. Come, come, Elizabeth, he said. I'm not going to let you go like that. For the first time you make me a visit. Give me a kiss now, just to show that you don't bear malice." Elizabeth's only reply was a look of ineffable haughtiness. "'Will you let me pass, please?' she said in a low tone of concentrated wrath, and with an uneasy laugh he obeyed her. "'What a virago you are,' he said, almost as bad as your cousin Amanda. It must be the hare," he added with a sneer. But Elizabeth did not pause to reply. Anxious only to escape, she closed the studio door hastily behind her, and a moment later the elevator bore her swiftly down, and she regained the street with the feeling of having staved off misfortune, for the moment at least. She found, when she got home, a note from Gerard, informing her that he had been unexpectedly called out of town for a few days on business, but hoped to see her on his return. There were the flowers, too, which he sent her daily. He had no intention, evidently, of taking her answer of the day before as final. She realized this with a thrill that held in it more of pleasure than alarm. Still she was glad that he was out of town. His absence was a reprieve, giving her more of the time she wanted, though it is hard to say what she expected to gain by it, but very little often sufficed to restore Elizabeth's spirits. She was going out to dinner that evening and she dressed for it with a mind that was comparatively at ease. But poor Elizabeth's moments of tranquillity were just then short. She was nearly dressed when Celeste entered with the information that a young person had called to see Mademoiselle, who insisted upon seeing her at once. "'I told her that Mademoiselle is dressing,' said the maid, with expressive gestures, "'that she has an engagement. It is most important, but—but but she is a most determined young person.' She insists that I bring up a message at once. 
"'It is Amanda, of course,' thought Elizabeth, with a terrible sinking of the heart. She had forgotten until that moment the meeting in the studio. She glanced at the clock. "'I have fifteen minutes, Celeste,' she said. "'Show her up. She may want to see me about something important.' The maid departed, and Elizabeth bent down nervously to sort out gloves and handkerchief, wondering, as she did now at each unexpected incident, what danger it might portend. "'I thought,' said Amanda, "'I might come up. Scenes were first cousins.' She stood in the doorway, her eyes roaming about the room, taking in every detail, the soft prevailing harmonies of the pale blue and rose, the firelight flicking on the tiled hearth, the shining silver ornaments on the dressing-table, the profusion of bric-a-brac, of cotillion favors, the roses in the china bowl, the general air of luxury. All a fit setting to the proud young beauty, standing before the mirror in her shimmering white satin and laces. "'My, my, but you look fine,' said Amanda, under her breath. A slightly awed expression crossed her face, modifying the assurance of her entrance. "'You're going out?' she asked, looking almost ready to retreat. "'To dinner, yes, but not just yet. Won't you sit down, Amanda?' Elizabeth said, trying to speak easily. I "'I'm glad to see you. How is Aunt Rebecca and everyone at Bassett Mills?' Amanda sat down her eyes still wandering eagerly across the room. Elizabeth, looking at her, saw the unfavorable change that a few months had made. True, she was smartly dressed, with the cheap, tawdry smartness that can be bought ready-made at the shops, and her hat was tilted carefully at the fashionable angle. Her hair, growing low about her forehead, had still the plenty natural wave to it, which was a legacy from the fever, and the general effect at first glance was striking— but the face under the jaunty, befeathered hat was white and haggard. The eyes had a wild, restless look. There were hard, vindicative lines about the mouth. Her hands moved incessantly, plucking at the fringe on her gown. Glad? Well, I guess you're not very glad to see me, she said with a strange, mocking smile, ignoring the latter part of Elizabeth's speech. There never was much love lost between us, and now— but still I thought I'd pay you a visit. I'm staying with Uncle Ben's folks, and they told me I ought to look up my swell cousin, since you were so sure to want to see me. She gave a short, jarring laugh. Ha! <laughs> that stuck-up maid wouldn't believe me. Thought I was crazy. When I said we were first cousins, I don't see why. I'm sure I don't look so, well, so different as all that. Her voice sank into rather a wistful key, and she stole a glance at the long pier-glass that stood opposite her. I got my suit at a bargain sale, she said. The girl said it was real stylish. It's very pretty, said Elizabeth gently. She glanced at Amanda with a sudden pity that overpowered her first annoyance and alarm at the inopportune visit. What had brought her to town? Some vague or rational hope of winning back Paul's admiration, perhaps, with this gown that was real stylish, and the new hat, and the general tawdry attempt at smartness. It was that, probably, which had taken her to the studio, and no doubt Paul had been disgusted with this attempt to revive an old flirtation, and in his irritation had convinced her somewhat rudely of his indifference. Poor Amanda! Really, she had not seemed quite right in the head since the fever. "'Were you surprised to see me this morning?' said Amanda, watching her and seeming to read her thoughts. "'I went to call on another old friend, and I wasn't welcome.' She gave another jarring laugh, which ended this time in a sob. <laughs> he, he didn't seem glad to see me, considering how well he used to know me, once. Her voice broke piteously. She paused for a moment, and then, I hate him, I hate him, she broke out fiercely. I'd give anything in this world if I had never known him. So would I, said Elizabeth, low and bitterly, and then stopped frightened at what she had said. But Amanda showed no surprise. "'Uh, you think that now,' she said slowly. "'But you didn't used to. You've got so many rich bows now that you don't care about him any longer. But I wonder what they'd think, these rich bows of yours, if they knew how wild you used to be about him, how you were wandering about the country with him, if they knew.' Amanda leaned forward and spoke in an impressive whisper. 
if they knew that you have to do what he wants now, and you are afraid of him. There was a silence. Elizabeth, faint and giddy, sank into the nearest chair, and put up involuntarily her hand to her heart. So here was another danger threatening, another person who knew something, everything, perhaps. Her brain reeled. Amanda leaned back in her chair, watching her triumphantly, a hard, bright glitter in her eyes. Amanda! Elizabeth's white lips tried in vain to frame a coherent question. Amanda! She made another attempt. What do you mean? Amanda smiled contemptuously. Oh, you know well enough what I mean, she said. Why did you go there this morning when you don't care for him any more, and are sorry you ever knew him, unless you are afraid of him, and you have to do what he wants? Oh, is that all? Elizabeth drew a long sigh of relief. I went there this morning because—because because I wanted to meet a friend. She broke off in confusion before the look on Amanda's face. Then, with a sudden reaction of feeling, she raised her head haughtily. "'It doesn't matter,' she said, "'what I went there for. "'It's a—a a studio. "'All his pupils go there. "'I might have wanted to see him about singing lessons, "'about anything. "'If that is all you base your suspicions on, Amanda—' "'She stopped. "'Ah, but if it isn't,' said Amanda, in her impressive whisper, "'which seemed fraught with a mysterious consciousness of power. "'Another silence.' The defiant look on Elizabeth's face faded. She leaned back in her chair and half closed her eyes. Ah, oh, she was weary, deathly weary, of these constant nervous shocks. How much did Amanda know? How much? If she could only be sure. I think they'd be rather surprised, Amanda went on in unnaturally quiet tones. These swell friends of yours, if they knew all about you, they think you very sweet. They give you lots of things. Amanda's hard, restless eyes roamed again about the room and rested on Elizabeth's beautiful gown. It don't seem fair, she broke out suddenly with a fierce little sob. It don't seem fair that you should have so much, and then to be so pretty, too, as well as all the rest. She was silent for a moment, struggling with the tears that threatened to break forth, and Elizabeth began to breathe more freely. All this bluster, after all, these vague threats, seemed to resolve themselves into the old unreasoning powerless jealousy, nothing more. And with the relief came again the sense of pity, of a certain justice in Amanda's point of view. "'It isn't fair,' she said softly. "'I don't deserve it, but—' "'Well, fair or not, I guess it don't make much difference,' Amanda interrupted her drearily, rising to her feet. You've always had the best of me, and probably you always will. But if ever you don't— She broke off suddenly and moved toward the door. I guess I'd better be going, she said. You'll be late for your dinner. Only, before you go— She paused with her hand on the knob of the door, that hard, mocking glitter in her eyes. Before you go, just put on some of your jewelry, won't you? Seems to me you look bare without it. My, my jewelry? Elizabeth's heart, which had been beating more quietly, suddenly stood still. I, I don't wear jewelry, Amanda, she said, in a dull, toneless voice. What? Not your pearls? Amanda's hard, mocking eyes seemed to read her through and through. Your pearls you were so proud of in the country, that you said you would always wear. Seems to me you need them. Well, what with that fine dress? She stood hovering by the door, a weird figure in the exaggerated smartness of her attire, with her white face framed in the deep red hair, and that strange, uncanny smile gleaming across it, lighting it up into an elf-like suggestion of mysterious power. Elizabeth stared at her helplessly, fascinated. Then, with a great effort, she roused herself and hurried toward her. "'Amanda!' she cried desperately. Amanda, for heaven's sake, stop these insinuations. Tell me plainly what you mean. She gripped her fiercely by the arm. Her face was white and set. For a moment Amanda's eyes met hers. Then, as if in spite of herself, they fell. She freed herself sullenly from Elizabeth's grasp. 
"'Well, I guess I don't mean much,' she said awkwardly, "'or if I did, it don't matter. I wouldn't tell tales against my first cousin.' She turned the knob of the door, but again she paused, that weird smile still flickering in her eyes. "'Good night,' she said. "'I hope you'll enjoy your dinner. Too bad you haven't got your pearls.' She gave one last jarring laugh, opened the door, and went out. Elizabeth, white and trembling, sank into the nearest chair. "'How she frightened me!' she gasped out. These constant shocks will kill me. Does she know anything definite? Probably not, but what can I do? How can I find out? Ah, Celeste! As the maid appeared with an anxious expression in the doorway. The carriage is waiting. Very well. She hurried to the dressing table, caught up her gloves, and gave one hasty glance at her white face. Oh, how ugly I am growing, she thought, turning away with a shudder, quite like Amanda. I see the resemblance. It is this awful life. I wish—oh, how I wish I were home!" The thought swept over her, thrilling her with an intense, passionate longing for her aunt's presence, for the country, for quiet, for rest and peace. Yes, I will go home, she thought, as Celeste adjusted the cloak about her shoulders, and she hastened down to the carriage. I will go home, she repeated to herself at intervals during the evening while she talked and laughed with a restless light in her eyes and a feverish flush in her cheeks. The country will be so peaceful. I shall be quite safe there, away from all this agitation, this trying to keep up appearances. It is the best way out. How fortunate that he is away! I won't see him again before I go." It was, she felt, a heroic resolution. Yes, she would go at once, and she resolutely crushed back the thought. He will follow. End of chapter 24「Chapter 25 of the Ordeal of Elizabeth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Bell. Chapter Twenty Five of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. The Van Antwerps have come up for the summer, said Miss Joanna, who had made the same announcement, if you remember, not quite a year before. The butcher says they came last night. They never got here so early before. Elizabeth, who was arranging flowers, looked up suddenly. Yes, I know, she said quietly. Eleanor wrote me. She left her roses half-arranged, and wandered restlessly over to the long French window. Before her stretched the well-kept lawn, with its flower-beds and rose-bushes and beyond, field and wooded upland, all clothed in their newest, most vivid dress of green. Further still the river, with the white sails on its surface. That river from which, more than half a century before, another Elizabeth Van Vorst had resolutely turned away her eyes refusing to be reminded of the life that she had given up. But that woman of an older generation was made of sterner stuff, perhaps, than her granddaughter. And then there was not much travel in those days, no daily mails, no guests coming up to neighboring house-parties over Sunday. "'It will be nice for you, Elizabeth, to have Mrs. Bobby,' said Aunt Joanna, in her comfortable monotone, her knitting-needles clicking peacefully. You have found it a little dull, you know, dear, since you came back." A little dull? Elizabeth could have laughed out loud at the words. A little dull, with such exciting subjects to discuss as the new Easter anthem and the latest illness of the rectory children, with such diversions as a drive to Bassett Mills, a tea-party at the Courtenay's. If I am dull, she said, turning round presently with the ghost of a smile, it certainly isn't the fault of the neighbourhood. I didn't tell you that Mrs. Courtney has asked me to tea, a third time. She says Frank will see me home, no need to send the carriage. She laughed a little, not without a shade of bitterness. Fancy Mrs. Courtney suggesting that last summer. Well, dear, she means well, I suppose, said Miss Joanna, puzzled but kindly. Miss Cornelia raised her head with a little involuntary touch of pride. The Courtneys are, are really quite pushing, I think 
she said, a most unwanted tone of asperity in her voice. I told Mrs. Courtenay, Elizabeth, that you had been so very gay, with emphasis. You really needed a complete rest. Elizabeth laughed. And, of course, she said, that only made her, dear good woman, all the more anxious to provide me with a little more amusement. I never realized before how fond the girls have always been of me. But then that's the case, apparently, with the whole neighborhood. They always concealed their affection for me very successfully, until this spring. She paused. Her aunts made no reply. She went over to the piano and began absently turning over sheets of music. "'Do you remember, Auntie?' she said abruptly. Miss Joanna had left the room in response to a summons from the maid, and Elizabeth and Miss Cornelia were alone. "'Do you remember that I told you once that I felt myself a sort of nondescript, neither flesh, fowl, nor good red herring? But now I seem to be considered a very fine fowl indeed, the ugly duckling, probably.' that turned into a swan. "'You never were an ugly duckling, my dear,' Miss Cornelia could not help protesting, in spite of her principles. "'It certainly wasn't that.' "'Perhaps not,' said Elizabeth. "'At all events I'm no better looking than I was, let us say, last year. I heard a woman at the mills say the other day that I had gone off terrible in my looks. But that doesn't prevent Frank Courtney from coming here day after day, boring me to death, since he has discovered, as his mother tells me, that I am just the style that he admires. It doesn't prevent the Johnson girls from going into raptures over my beautiful hair and asking if I mind their copying my lovely gowns. They have copied my new spring hat, if you notice. Oh, it would be amusing if it wasn't so very petty. She put out her hand with a weary, contemptuous gesture. And then the funny part of it all is that I am not really so nice if they only knew it, as I was last year, when they all treated me as if I had committed some sort of crime, merely in existing. "'My dear,' remonstrated Miss Cornelia, "'how can you talk like that? I'm sure you're not a bit spoiled. Everyone says so.' "'Ah, they think so,' said Elizabeth quickly. "'They think me nice, because I've acquired a society manner, and say the correct thing, but if they knew everything—' She stopped suddenly, and stood for a moment— staring steadily before her with knit brows. "'Do you know, Aunt Cornelia,' she said abruptly, "'what I think I am? A sort of moral nondescript, neither good nor bad. I see the right way, oh, I see it so very plainly, and I want to take it, and then I choose the wrong. Always and inevitably I choose the wrong, and shall all my life, until the end. It's not my fault, really. I can't do right, no matter how hard I try.' "'My dear!' Miss Cornelia looked at her, puzzled and shocked. "'There's no one,' she said, putting into trite words her own simple conviction. "'There's no one, Elizabeth, who can't do right if they try hard enough.' "'Do you think so, Auntie?' said Elizabeth very gently. "'Then probably I don't try hard enough.' She went over to Miss Cornelia and kissed her on the cheek. "'If I were like you,' she said, "'I should.' Then, without further words, she sat down at the piano and began to play, as she did every day for hours at a time. Such restless, passionate, brilliant playing! A vague uneasiness mingled in Miss Cornelia's mind with her pride in the girl's talent as she listened to it. Something was troubling Elizabeth, evidently, something which had brought her home so unexpectedly, which had changed her in looks and manner beyond what could be accounted for by excitement and late hours. Yet innate delicacy and timidity prevented Miss Cornelia from forcing in any way the confidence which seemed to tremble now and again upon the girl's lips. She had a vague idea that the difficulty, whatever it was, would soon be decided one way or another, that the Van Antwerp's arrival, which Elizabeth seemed at once to dread and look forward to, would bring matters to a crisis, and the whole thing would be explained. Elizabeth was still playing when Mrs. Bobby interrupted her. That she had not allowed a day to elapse before hastening to the homestead was a fact noted with jealous care by the Mrs. Courtenay, who met her at the gate. "'He is desperate!' Mrs. Bobby's visit had not lasted many minutes before she murmured this, holding Elizabeth's hand, and scanning eagerly her averted face. At Mrs. Bobby's words it quivered, the colour flushed into her cheek, but otherwise she made no sign. 
when you first went away mrs bobby continued as no answer came he was all for coming up here at once he thought it a caprice a morbid unaccountable whim he was sure that if he could see you remonstrate with you and then there was your letter forbidding him to come he was beside himself it was all i could do to keep him from taking the first train up here i said wait it doesn't do always to force a woman's will give her a little time at least she has paid you the compliment which she has paid to no one else of running away from your attentions she paused her eyes still eagerly fixed upon elizabeth's face the colour in the girl's cheek was now brilliant her lips were parted but still she did not speak day after day said mrs bobby we have talked it over he walking up and down restless wild i trying to soothe him urging him to be patient sometimes he thinks that you are revenging yourself in this way for his former neglect that it is a little scheme to pay him back the idea drives him frantic makes him furious with himself yet he is always encouraged when he thinks of it and then again he thinks that you don't care for him that you never will that there is someone else ah my dear if you really do care you are cruel unpardonably cruel to torment him like this again she paused elizabeth with a quick impatient movement dragged her hand away from her grasp and began to pace up and down gasping as if for breath cruel she cried out cruel and you think it gives me pleasure to torment him if it doesn't said mrs bobby following her with her eyes and speaking with some coldness i confess i am at a loss to account for your behaviour elizabeth stopped suddenly and bending down almost buried her face in the roses whose fragrance she inhaled there never was a man said mrs bobby who loved a woman more than he loves you elizabeth and there isn't a man who i believe deserves a woman better deserves her murmured elizabeth deserves me oh good heavens the exclamation was barely audible and apparently addressed only to the roses i said to him yesterday said mrs bobby you'll come up saturday of course but he's proud now and hurt elizabeth he said i won't come i won't force myself upon her without her knowledge and consent if she knows if she's willing why then i'll come not otherwise there was a pause elizabeth turned presently a face which seemed to reflect the glowing colour of the roses over which she had bent what do you want me to do eleanor she asked softly tell me what i shall say said mrs bobby in the letter which i must write when i get home she went over to Elizabeth and put her hand on her arm. Shall he come, or shall he not? It rests with you. Chapter 26 of The Ordeal of Elizabeth This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Craig Kenneth Bryant. Chapter 26 of The Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. My dear Elizabeth, said Mrs. Bobby, I regret to say it, but you really are growing terribly spoiled. The winter was far advanced when Mrs. Bobby made this remark with lint growing every day nearer the whirl of gaiety grew ever faster and more furious it was not often that mrs bobby and her guest had an opportunity for private conversation but to-night as it happened they had merely been out to dinner and having returned at an unusually early hour elizabeth came into mrs bobby's boudoir in her long white dressing-gown and sat brushing out her masses of wavy hair while she and her hostess discussed the evening's entertainment and other recent events of interest. Mrs. Bobby's eyes rested upon Elizabeth with all the satisfaction with which a connoisseur regards some beautiful object of which he has been the discoverer. Elizabeth's beauty, Elizabeth's conquests, formed to Mrs. Bobby just then 
a theme of which she never tired nor did she fail to make them the text for various sermons that she delivered to bobby about this time on the subject of her own wisdom and his utter failure as a prophet confess bobby that my plans turn out well she would say and then i'm not such a fool as you thought me why i never bobby would protest thought you anything of the kind but she would go on unheeding it would have been a shame for that girl to be buried in the country and i do take some credit to myself for having rescued her from such a fate but after that all the credit is due to elizabeth i did what i could of course to launch her successfully but when all is said and done a girl has to sink or swim on her own merits elizabeth takes to society as a duck does to water it's her natural element and talk of heredity there are not many girls with the most aristocratic mothers who can come into a room with the air that she has as if she didn't care two straws whether anyone spoke to her or not and then of course everyone does now explain to me bobby if you can where the girl gets that air i suppose said bobby if i believed implicitly in heredity which i am not at all sure that i do i'd account for it by your own remark that she has plenty of good blood as well as bad oh yes said mrs bobby incredulously you can always make a theory fit in somehow but though mrs bobby exulted in that air of indifference with which elizabeth accepted as if it were a mere matter of course all the devotion offered up at her feet she was beginning to realize that the most admirable qualities can be carried too far and thus it was that she upbraided her this evening with being unreasonably spoiled and not sufficiently appreciating the good things which had fallen to her lot i don't know what you want me to do elizabeth said quietly when she had listened for some moments to this rather vague accusation i'm sure i go everywhere that i'm asked and that you must admit is saying a good deal i talk to all the men who talk to me and that again you must admit means a great deal of conversational effort and and i make no distinctions between them whatever and do my duty on all occasions i really don't know what more you can expect but that exclaimed her hostess is exactly what i complain of you go everywhere you are asked yes and you never express a preference for any particular place you talk to the men who talk to you and you make no distinctions no for apparently it's all the same to you whether it's this man or the other not quite said elizabeth placidly for one man amuses me and another doesn't but beyond that i don't thank heaven i don't care she broke off suddenly and she drew her comb with unwonted vehemence through her hair i don't know why you should thank heaven said mrs bobby watching her narrowly for a fact that is quite abnormal in a girl of your age who has some of the nicest men in town in love with her there are times when i think you are quite heartless and yet with that hair and those eyes and the way you throw yourself into your music you seem to have abundance of temperament on the whole elizabeth you are a puzzling combination what was it mr d'hauteville said of you that you reminded him of a lake of ice in a circle of fire mr d'hauteville said elizabeth yawning is fond of glittering similes this one sounds well but doesn't bear close consideration the fire i should think under the circumstances would dissolve the ice perhaps it will said mrs bobby when the right time comes which will be never said elizabeth with decision her hostess smiled as one who has heard such things before after all she resumed after a pause returning to the grievance which had first started the conversation i could forgive you everything else but this indifference about your picture one would think that when a great artist asks as a special favor to paint your portrait you might at least have the decency to go look at it when it is on exhibition and all new york is talking about it that's the very reason said elizabeth why it strikes me as rather bad taste for me to stand in rapt contemplation before it while a lot of people are jostling me and making remarks about my eyes and hair and mouth as if i were on exhibition and not mr blank's picture well it is you whom they want to see said mrs bobby the new york public doesn't care much for art but it does take an interest in the people whom it reads about in the papers a weakness that we needn't quarrel with since it has made the portrait show a success and given us so many thousands for our hospital well at least said elizabeth 
I have done my duty in contributing my portrait to the good cause. So don't ask me to be present in actual flesh and blood, and above all not to face such a crowd as was there the other day, when we tried to look at it and my gown was nearly torn off my back in the process. You could go early, suggested Mrs. Bobby, as I did the other day. You have no idea how much better it looks in that light than it did at the studio. I am very tired of it in any light, said Elizabeth. People have talked to me so much about it. But if you insist upon it, I will go. I will go early. There are some of the other portraits, too, that I should like to look at if I can do so in peace. And with this concession, the conversation was allowed to drop for a moment. It was Elizabeth who resumed it, speaking slowly and tentatively, with many lapses, and eyes carefully turned away from her friend. You talk, she said, a great deal of my successes, and I suppose, in a way, I ought to be satisfied. And of course I am, she added hastily. People have been very nice to me. I, I couldn't ask for anything more. And yet, there is one person, I don't know if you have noticed it, one person with whom I am a distinct failure, who I think almost dislikes me, and that is your friend Mr. Gerard. What, Julian? said Mrs. Bobby in a tone that was absolutely devoid of expression. You think he doesn't like you? I am quite sure of it, said Elizabeth. But why? questioned Mrs. Bobby in apparent bewilderment. What reason have you for thinking so? A great many, but any one of them would be enough. To begin with, he never speaks to me if he can possibly help himself. His avoidance of me is quite pointed. You surely must have noticed it. She fixed her eyes anxiously upon Mrs. Bobby. I... Mrs. Bobby checked the impulsive words that rose to her lips. Julian is... is very peculiar, she said in a noncommittal tone. I don't think he cares for women. Perhaps not. But still I have seen him talk to them, in a bored sort of way, it is true. But to me he never talks in any way whatsoever. He never has a chance. You are always surrounded. He would have the same chance as the others. No, it isn't that. He disapproves of me. I can feel it, as he looks at me through those dark half-shut eyes of his, and it gives me an uncomfortable sense of wickedness. He thinks me flippant and vain and frivolous, and I am when he is there, or I seem so. When he is listening, I say all the horrid, cynical, heartless things I can think of. I have to say them somehow. It is fate. It began the first night that I met him. It was in the country, do you remember? She paused and again looked questioningly at Mrs. Bobby. Yes, the latter answered softly. I remember. I was rather excited that night. It was the first time I had ever been out to dinner. I talked in a flippant sort of way about hating the country and longing to go out and wanting to be always amused. It was very young, I suppose. Elizabeth spoke with all the superiority of a girl halfway through her first season towards her more unsophisticated self of a few months before. He didn't like it. The sort of woman whom he admires knows her catechism, and is satisfied with that situation in life where it has pleased Providence to place her. I shocked him. He has never got over it. He showed me that very evening how he disliked me. It was so pointed that it was almost rude. You asked me, do you remember, to play? She stopped. I remember, said Mrs. Bobby again softly. I never heard you play so well. I never have since. I seem to have just for the moment some strange power over the keys. Such feelings come to one, you know, sometimes. And then, when I stopped, he had asked me for the fire music. I felt somehow that he was fond of music. He is fond of it, passionately fond. But when I stopped, he looked at me blankly for a moment, till he suddenly remembered what was expected of him, and thanked me in a cold sort of way, and walked off. And I shouldn't think so much of that, but... Since then he has never, never once asked me to play, though he has often heard other people ask me. I have noticed, said Mrs. Bobby quietly, that you will never play when he is in the room. I couldn't, said Elizabeth. It would have such a dampening effect to feel that there was one person in the room who disliked it, who, no matter how well I played, would always preserve his critical attitude. You see that I am reduced to the unflattering alternative that it is myself that he objects to, or my playing. But it is the same with everything. There is my picture, for instance. 
he is the only person i know who has said nothing to me about it has probably not even seen it that must be rather a relief said mrs bobby placidly since you are so tired of the subject if i am said elizabeth that is no reason why he shouldn't go through the conventional formula of telling me that he has seen the picture and adding something civil about it as the most ordinary acquaintances never fail to do no of course mrs bobby agreed softly the most ordinary acquaintances never would but perhaps he doesn't consider himself exactly that whatever he considers himself said elizabeth with some heat he is not exempt from the common rules of civility but i suppose he doesn't really admire the picture and is too painfully truthful to pretend to the contrary and then she stopped and laughed a little at her own vehemence but without much spirit it really is very illogical she admitted i don't care for mr gerard's admiration it would probably bore me extremely to have it and yet it's not pleasant to be so absolutely ignored mrs bobby was watching her with an odd little gleam in the dark eyes that were almost hidden by her long curling lashes i will tell you she said what it is that he doesn't like it isn't you or your playing or your conversation it's your hair my hair elizabeth took up mechanically one of her long shining locks and passed it through her fingers i may have been inordinately vain she remarked after a pause but i never supposed before that there was much the matter with my hair nor would most people i imagine but he has some odd ideas and among them it seems is a prejudice a superstition as he calls it against red hair but mine isn't red said elizabeth quickly of course not said mrs bobby he is color blind as i told him but there's no use in arguing the point with him he insists that your hair is red enough to to be dangerous those are his words and he avoids you in consequence he has had some unfortunate experience in the past i should imagine which has given him this prejudice there my dear i shouldn't have told you mrs bobby went on leaning back in her chair and still watching elizabeth narrowly through half-closed lids if i didn't know of course that it can make no real difference to you what julian thinks of course not elizabeth made answer mechanically with dry lips as she still drew her comb absently through the offending hair you have so many admirers mrs bobby continued serenely it can't matter very much that one person should hold aloof and that i shouldn't care about julian's opinion for he never admires any woman ever since that unfortunate experience which happened i think when he was very young he has been a confirmed cynic avoiding all young girls and horribly afraid of being married for his money i really despair now of his ever falling in love i have talked up almost every girl in town to him and all in vain no even you elizabeth spoiled as you are couldn't expect to make a conquest of julian i don't know what i should expect said elizabeth rather coldly but i certainly don't wish to it would hardly be worth while she rose with one long look in the glass and moved wearily towards the door i am so very tired dear she said i think i will say good night good night said mrs bobby cheerfully sleep well you need to and don't waste another thought on that tiresome creature julian oh i'm not likely to elizabeth responded with rather a pale smile i'm much too tired and yet she did think of him more than once as she stood before the mirror arranging her hair into two heavy braids which reached below her waist and repeating to herself that as mrs bobby had said it could matter little about the one dissenting voice and the general chorus of admiration which had attended her triumphant career in spite of which assurance her last thoughts as she fell asleep might have been somewhat surprising to those who having watched that career entirely from the outside regarded her as the most fortunate being in the world elizabeth's aunts were on the whole more to be envied than the girl herself that winter there was no alloy in their happiness no undercurrent of dissatisfaction even though they wore their old black silks and miss joanna's friend the butcher was heard to complain somewhat bitterly of her sudden parsimony in regard to joints of meat what did it matter they would have dressed cheerfully in sackcloth and lived on bread and water for the sake of such glowing accounts of elizabeth's triumphs as mrs bobby constantly transmitted or of the girl's own brilliant letters which seemed to breathe the radiant satisfaction of a mind without a care 
Elizabeth's aunt at Bassett Mills also watched her career, which was chronicled at that time in the papers. Poor Aunt Rebecca, after a hard day's work, reading her niece's name and possibly a description of her costume in the list of guests at some smart festivity, would look up awestruck at Amanda. Only to think, she would say, with the old contradictory note, half pride, half jealousy, to think that it should be Malvina's girl. But Amanda, still pale and wasted from the fever, with her hair quite long and very soft and wavy, would give an odd, furtive look from her light eyes and say nothing. End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 of The Ordeal of Elizabeth This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by P. J. Morgan Chapter 27 of The Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous It was a bleak December day, and Central Park seemed the last place where one would wish to loiter. The sky hung lowering overhead, gray, cold, heavy with the weight of invisible snowflakes. The wind made a dull moaning sound as it stirred the bare branches of the trees. The lake, where at another season you see children sailing in the swan boats, was nearly covered with a thin coating of ice. But Elizabeth Van Vorst, as she stood with eyes intently fixed upon the small space of water still visible, did not seem to notice either the cold or the dreariness of the scene. She was leaning against a tree and looking at nothing but the lake, till at the sound of footsteps on the path she turned to face Paul Halleck. "'So you got my note?' she said, speaking listlessly, without a sign of surprise or satisfaction. She did not give him her hand, which clasped the other tightly in the warm shelter of her muff. "'Yes, I got it. But I could wish you had chosen a warmer meeting-place, my dear. The last months had changed him, and not for the better. His figure had grown stouter, his beauty coarser. She shrank away in invincible repugnance from the careless familiarity of his manner. "'It was the best place I could think of.' she said curtly. At home we are always interrupted. At your studio. It is impossible. I had to see you. Somehow. Somewhere. She sat down on a bench nearby, and shivering drew her furs about her. You do me too much honor, Paul returned lightly. He took the seat beside her, his eyes resting in involuntary fascination on the rounded outlines of her cheek, the soft waves of auburn hair beneath her small black hat. "'It's a long time since you have wished to see me of your own accord, my dear,' he said in a tone in which resentment struggled with his old instinctive admiration of her beauty. She turned to him suddenly, her eyes hard, her face very white and set. "'You know the reason. I had to see you, to—to to talk things over. You assume a right to control me. You ask me for money. You try to frighten me with threats. There must be an end of it. I—' She paused for a moment and drew her breath quickly while she flushed a dull crimson. "'I have promised Mr. Gerard,' she said, "'to to marry him next month.' He interrupted her with a scornful laugh. "'To marry him next month? And how about that ceremony which we know of, you and I, in the church at Cranston?' The crimson flush faded and left her white, but still she did not flinch. "'I have thought of that,' she said steadily. "'and I have decided that it should not make any difference. "'I don't believe the marriage would be legal, "'but that's neither here nor there. "'I don't want a divorce. "'I don't want the thing known. "'I don't consider that we were ever married. "'I don't think such a marriage as ours, "'which we both entered into, "'without the slightest thought, "'which we have repented of. "'Speak for yourself,' he interposed. "'Which I have repented of, then,' she went on. "'Ought to be binding. "'The clergyman who married us is dead.' The witnesses, so old that they are childish, probably remember nothing about it. There is no one now living who remembers except you and I, and for me I have determined to think of it as a dream, and I want you to promise me to do the same. But there is the notice in the parish register. He was staring at her blankly, admiring in spite of himself the calm resolution of her manner, the business-like precision with which she was unfolding her arguments, as if she had rehearsed them many times to herself. "'I have thought of that, too.' she said, in answer to his last objection. "'And I don't think it in the least likely that anyone will ever see it. Why should they, without any clue? At all events, this is the only way out.' 
She faltered as her mind wandered for a moment unwillingly to another way which she had now despaired of. Too easy a solution to her difficulties ever to come true. What a fool she had been to think that he would die! People like that never die. As she saw him now in the full pride of his health and good looks, it seemed impossible to believe that any misfortune could assail him, least of all death. There is no other way, she repeated with a little involuntary sob. The risks are not great, but at any rate I must take them. Now there is only one other thing. She paused for a moment and then drew out of her purse a plain gold ring and showed it to him. It was the ring which she had once worn on her finger for a few minutes, which she had kept carefully hidden ever since. She glanced about her. There was no one in sight except the policeman, who in the distance near the carriage drive was pacing up and down at his cold post and beating his hands to keep them warm. Elizabeth rose and went to the edge of the lake. With well-directed aim she threw the tiny circlet of gold so that it struck the fast-vanishing surface of water and quickly disappeared. She drew a long sigh of relief. There, she said, that is over. Paul watched her curiously. He saw that she attached to this little action a mysterious significance. He sneered harshly. Very pretty and theatrical, he said. But do you really think that by a thing like that, throwing away a ring, you can dissolve a marriage? She turned to him, her white face still resolute and intensely solemn. I don't know, she said quietly. But I wanted to throw it away before you, so that you would understand that everything is over between us, and that day at Cranston is as if it never had been. Never had been, you understand? She repeated with eager emphasis. I want you to promise to think of it like that. He shrugged his shoulders. How we either of us think of it, I suppose, doesn't make much difference, so far as the legality of the thing goes, he said. But have your own way. If you choose to commit a crime, it's not my affair. A crime? She started and stared at him. Do you call that a crime? He smiled. It's a rough word to use for the actions of a charming young girl, he said. But I'm afraid that the law might look at it in that light. Elizabeth returned to the bench and sat down. She seemed to be pondering this new view of the matter. "'I can't help it,' she said at last in a low voice. "'If that's a crime, why, I understand how people are led into them. And I can't ruin his happiness, crime or no crime.' "'And my happiness?' he asked her bitterly. "'You never think of that? You professed to love me once. You took me for better, for worse, and how have you kept your word? If my life is ruined, the responsibility is yours.' If you had gone with me as I wanted you to, I should have been a different man. There was a curious accent of sincerity in his voice. He really believed for the moment what he said. The reproach was not without effect. She looked at him more gently, with troubled eyes that seemed to express not only contrition, but a certain involuntary sympathy. It's true, she said. I have treated you badly, and broken the most solemn promise anyone could make. I don't defend myself, but... I'm willing to make what amends I can. I can't give you myself, but at least I can give you what little money you would have had with me. When I am married to... She paused and flushed, but concluded her sentence firmly. To Mr. Gerard, I will give you all the money I have. Paul paced up and down, apparently in deep thought. It was evident that her offer tempted him, yet some impulse urged him to refuse it. He stopped suddenly in front of her. Principal or interest, you mean? he asked in a tone in which the thirst for gain distinctly predominated. The doubtful sympathy in Elizabeth's eyes faded and was replaced by a look of unmistakable disgust. "'I suppose I could hardly give you the principal,' she said coldly. "'But I will pay over the income every year,' she named the sum. "'Isn't it enough?' "'That depends,' he said, looking at her coolly. "'It is enough, of course, for Elizabeth Van Vorst, but for Mrs. Julian Gerard.' He stopped as an electric shock of anger seemed to thrill Elizabeth from head to foot. "'You don't suppose,' she cried, "'that I would give you his money.' "'Then,' said Paul curtly, "'he doesn't know?' "'Certainly not,' she said haughtily. He began again reflectively to pace up and down. "'I don't see,' he said, "'how you were to pay me over this money without his knowing it.' "'Don't trouble yourself about that,' said Elizabeth contemptuously. Mr. Gerard will never ask what I do with my money. Well, he has enough of his own, certainly, said Paul philosophically. And yet, 
Poor fellow, I am sorry for him if he ever finds out how you have deceived him. He never shall find out, said Elizabeth. She rose and pulled down her veil. It is so cold, she said, shivering, and indeed she looked chilled to the core. I cannot stay here any longer. This thing is settled, isn't it? You will promise? There was a tone of piteous entreaty in her voice. How am I to know, he asked, still hesitating, that you will keep your word? Once married to Gerard, you might forget. If I do, she returned quietly, you will always have the power to break yours and ruin my happiness. So be it, then. I won't interfere with you. After all, we probably shouldn't have got on well. Come, let us part friends, at least. He held out his hand, but hers was again securely hidden in her muff, and the smile that gleamed on her face was pale and cold as the winter day itself. Goodbye, she said, and turned away. He fell back with a muttered oath. Upon my word, my lady, he said, you might be a little more gracious. At that moment Elizabeth came back. There was a softer look on her face. I loved you once, she said. Goodbye. And she held out her hand. He took it in silence. Thus they parted for the last time. It had been a successful interview. She had gained all that she dared hope for. Seated in the warm car going home and shivering as from an egg, she told herself that she had silenced forever all opposition to her wishes. Yet it did not seem a victory. Words which Paul had said lingered in her mind, stinging her with their contempt, the fact that even he could set himself above her. A crime! She had never considered it in that light. Surely it was impossible on the face of it that she, Elizabeth Van Voorst, could commit a crime. And then again, what was it he had said? Poor fellow, I am sorry for him if ever he finds out how you have deceived him. But he never shall, she said to herself, resolutely as before. Crime or no crime, his love is worth it. He never shall find out. End of chapter 27 Read by P. J. Morgan Chapter 28 of The Ordeal of Elizabeth This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by P. J. Morgan Chapter 28 of The Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. Elizabeth had little time in those days for thought. There was still less time, even, when she was alone with Gerard. The days passed in a whirl of gaiety in which she had been swallowed up since her return to town. It was a state of things which bored Gerard extremely, but secure in the promise he had at last obtained from her that the wedding should be at the end of January, he possessed his soul in such patience as he could muster and when he requested as a special favor that she would refuse all invitations for the 31st of December and see the old year out in peace, she consented at once, and the hope of a quiet evening buoyed him up through other weary ones, when he would lean in his old fashion against the wall and watch her across a ballroom, the center of an admiring court. Yet even as he did so, the proud consciousness of proprietorship swelled his heart. She was his, his! He had no longer any doubt of her or jealousy of the men who talked to her. Why, then, was the expected evening, when it came, fraught with an intangible sense of gloom, of oppression, which made the time pass heavily? The old Dutch clock, which the Misses Van Voorst had brought with them from the country, seemed to-night to mark the hours with extraordinary slowness, as if the old year were in no hurry to be gone, even though the noises in the street, the blowing of horns and of whistles, were enough, one might have thought, to hasten his departure. Elizabeth was pacing restlessly up and down the room. Her hands were clasped carelessly before her. Her long house dress of white cashmere, belted in by a gold girdle, fell about her in graceful folds. There was a flush in her cheeks, a somewhat feverish light in her eyes. She started nervously now and then as some enterprising small boy blew an especially shrill blast on his horn. "'I don't know why it is,' she said at last, with a petulant little laugh, coming back to her seat by the fire opposite Gerard, and taking up a piece of work in which she absently set a few stitches. "'New Year's Eve always gets on my nerves. I think of all my sins, and that's very unpleasant.' She broke off, pouting childishly, as if in disgust at the intrusion of unwelcome ideas. 
he was watching her lazily with the amused indulgent smile which certain of her moods had always the power to call forth the smile of a strong man who felt himself quite able to cope with them with such terrible sins as yours elizabeth he said it must be indeed a dreadful thing to think of them she turned quickly towards him you don't think they can be very bad i should be willing to take the risk of offering you absolution she bent down over her work so that her face was hidden ah you you don't know she rather breathed than spoke he only smiled incredulously as one who knew her better than she did herself play for me darling he said after a while and she went mechanically to the piano but her playing was always a matter of mood and tonight her fingers faltered the keys did not respond as usual she passed restlessly from one thing to another snatches of brahms chopin tchaikovsky with the same jarring note running through them all she broke off at last with a wild clash of chords i can't play tonight," she said and came back to the fire how calm you are she said standing beside gerard and looking down at him with eyes almost of reproach this horrible evening doesn't get on your nerves at all how can it gerard possessed himself of her hand and raised it to his lips how can i waste any regrets on the old year he said when the new year is to bring me so much happiness she started and caught her breath as if the words held a sting ah yes she repeated very low it is to bring you so much happiness for a moment she left her hand in his and then withdrew it with a stifled sigh she went back very still and pale to her seat on the other side of the fire and taking up her work she fixed her eyes upon it intently and so you think it is to bring you happiness she said in a low voice continuing the subject as it seemed in spite of herself you are quite sure of that julian you have no doubts she raised her eyes with a wistful questioning that puzzled him doubts elizabeth he stared back at her reproachfully his brows drawn together frowning why do you harp so much on that my darling why should i have doubts why some men might you know her eyes were bent again upon her work you yourself you had them you know when you first knew me he flushed don't remind me of that he said hastily well it may have been a true presentiment she gave him an odd furtive look i've wondered sometimes if i were as nice naturally as other girls i know i hadn't to begin with the sort of mother that most girls have she hesitated a painful crimson flooded her face her eyes filled with tears gerard stared at her in amazement he had never heard her allude to her mother before and had supposed her entirely ignorant of all painful facts in the family history darling he broke out indignantly who has told you things like that who oh i don't know she put the question aside listlessly one always hears unpleasant facts somehow i always knew that she wasn't the the sort of person that the neighborhood would call on a painful smile hovered about her lips it used to make me very unhappy but lately it hasn't seemed to matter and yet i think of it sometimes she broke off suddenly and looked at gerard with a strange light in her eyes doesn't it make a difference to you doesn't it occur to you sometimes that i may be my mother's daughter that it would be wiser to distrust me her voice died away at the last words into a hoarse whisper elizabeth gerard sprang to his feet he went over to her and took both her hands in his strong grasp elizabeth never let me hear these morbid fancies again never suppose that anything your mother did or left undone can make a difference in my faith in you he stood looking down at her with eyes full of an imperious tenderness she trembled and shrank away before them as if frightened you trust me then she repeated and she drew a long sobbing breath you're quite sure you trust me absolutely gerard's smile lit up his face how often you exacting woman he asked do you want me to promise that i will never doubt you again there was silence for a moment the noises in the street sounding suddenly with redoubled violence in the stillness seemed to punctuate gerard's words with an outburst of derision to elizabeth's fancy the whole atmosphere of the room was tense vibrant filled with jarring echoes of the noise without even the old dutch clock whose ticking was one of her earliest memories seemed to beat with a new discordant note of mockery as if it too were uttering its ironical comment on the wisdom of a man's faith elizabeth shuddered and thrust gerard's hands away i wish i wish i deserved your trust julian she broke out wildly then she laid her face on the arm of the chair and sobbed he fell back and stared at her aghast 
the tender smile was arrested frozen on his lips for him too as for her the room was suddenly filled with discordant vibrations a sense of unreasoning dread in a moment elizabeth looked up with a great effort she conquered her tears she went to gerard and put her hand on his arm the face she raised to his was white trembling in a pathetic appeal the tears still glistened on her long lashes there was a tremulous sweetness in her great dark eyes and the quivering lines about her pale lips julian she said if i'm not not worthy of your trust not worthy of your love even she faltered if i had deceived you were deceiving you still she paused and looked him in the face with an agonized questioning yes gerard's hoarse voice urged her on if you were deceiving me it isn't it can't be true but, but if you were if i were she went on steadily if i had kept one thing from you against my will oh god no sorely against my will her voice broke if it had been a weight on my mind day and night if i had longed to tell you and had tried to do it and always my courage failed me and and if at last at last i told you would you think me so very much to blame couldn't you forgive her voice again faltered piteously the last word was barely audible he broke away from her and took two or three turns up and down the room breathing heavily like a man who had been running tell me what the secret is he broke out fiercely pausing suddenly in front of her how can i tell if i could forgive till i know what it is again the silence elizabeth's white lips tried apparently in vain to form an answer the courage which a moment before had possessed her seemed to shrivel up and die away before that fierce light in his eyes tell me he repeated inexorably what it is she put out her hand suddenly with a pleading gesture ah uh, let us first see the old year out together she murmured as we planned i should like to feel that you loved me till the very end of it you may not afterwards it won't be long see it's nearly time she glanced up at the clock it was ticking faster now as it seemed and steadily the hour hand well towards midnight elizabeth went to the window and flung it open the current of cold air which flooded the room seemed to give her relief she leaned out as far as she could inhaling it in long fevered gasps gerard followed and stood behind her in an agony of impatience distraught by a hundred incongruous terrible suggestions the prolonged suspense seemed in his overwrought state a very refinement of cruelty yet some instinct kept him silent left to her the mastery of the situation in the street there was unwanted stir and bustle a crowd assembled to greet the new year small boys whose horns made the night hideous pranced about like uncouth imps of darkness the street lamps as they flickered cast a weird uncertain light on the snow-covered ground but the moon riding overhead shone peacefully and myriads of stars studded the wintry sky down towards the battery one could hear above all coarser sounds the chimes of old trinity ringing faint but true elizabeth's eyes were riveted upon st george's clock which stood out not many blocks away above the roofs of intervening houses her lips moved but no sound came one hand grasped convulsively the curtain behind her to gerard as he watched her those fifteen minutes before the new year were the longest of his life suddenly all noises slackened upon the listening crowd outside there fell a pause a hush of expectation st george's clock boomed out the hour in twelve majestic strokes the old dutch clock within the room echoed it in quieter tones and then as the last stroke died away the crowd stirred there arose a hideous babel of sound catcalling shouting blowing of horns and whistles pandemonium set loose it raged for several minutes and stopped abruptly exhausted by its own violence there was again silence and then a burst of laughter someone in the crowd cried loudly and heartily happy new year elizabeth shivered as if with a sudden consciousness of the cold she shut the window and faced gerard against the vivid background of the crimson curtain in her clinging white dress her pale beauty crowned by her red gold hair stood out with a strange unearthly quality like that of some pictured saint there was a look on her face which was tragic in its despairing resolution yet which had in it a certain exaltation as if she had risen for the moment at least above herself to heights hitherto unknown you shall know the worst of me at last you won't she gave an odd little laugh you won't grant me absolution julian i'm afraid but oh i'm 
sick god knows i'm sick of lies she paused and caught her breath as if for one supreme effort this is the truth she said i was married to paul halleck before i knew you more than a year ago he staggered back as if she had struck him a blow you were married to paul halleck yes she repeated in a dull monotone married to him more than a year ago he was still staring at her as if stupefied married he repeated married all this time when you professed to love me when a pause you promised to marry me oh it's impossible he cried with a sudden flash of incredulity and he put out his hand and touched her involuntarily say you're only playing with me he begged her trying my faith say it's not true his voice shook unconsciously his hand closed upon her wrist with a grasp that might have hurt her had she been capable just then of feeling physical pain it it is true she said and stood motionless white and rigid as a statue her head bent he still stared incredulous for a moment and then the reality of what she said seemed to sink into his soul with a quick involuntary gesture which wounded more than words he let her hand fall and began to pace up and down the room good god she heard him mutter married all these months and i who loved you trusted you he broke off with a gesture of angry despair her lip quivered her eyes followed him for a moment and then filled with tears she went over to the mantelpiece and resting her arms upon it she hid her face it was a long time before he stopped beside her but then his voice showed recovered self-control will you tell me he said exactly how and when this marriage took place she turned with a little shuddering sigh and raised her white exhausted face to his it was at cranston she said quietly one day in july i did it hastily my aunts were opposed to it and i hated to make them unhappy but i i thought i loved him it was a mistake i went up to cranston to meet him and we were married it was in church there were witnesses we signed a register it was all legal or at least i suppose so and then when we came out she paused yes when you came out gerard repeated the words hoarsely his brows drawn together his eyes fixed upon her in an agonized questioning what then elizabeth she hesitated staring straight before her as if she were trying to recall the whole thing exactly as it happened when we came out of the church i felt i don't know why i felt frightened i seemed to realize indeed i think i had realized all the time what a mistake it was he begged me to come away with him and i i refused he had promised me that i should go home and that he wouldn't claim me for six months and i held him to it he gave in at last and so we parted ah gerard drew a long breath you parted yes i left him and came home i got there about four my aunt suspected nothing he went abroad and after a while he stopped writing i thought he had forgotten me it all began to seem like a dream and then eleanor van antwerp asked me to come to town and the rest you know no not all gerard insisted when the fellow came home why didn't he claim you how have you kept him quiet all this time ah oh, that was easy she spoke listlessly he didn't care anything about me i used to give him money i sold my pearls all my jewelry in fact yes as gerard uttered a horrified exclamation it was a terrible bondage but what could i do he had me in his power i used to wonder if the marriage were legal but there was no one whom i dared ask and then i thought sometimes that he might die i had all sorts of wild ideas but nothing happened and meanwhile he threatened to tell you everything i bought him off twice and then this last time she paused this last time i promised him all my income if he would give me up forever and never trouble me again ah oh, you think it unpardonable i see she put out her hand with a deprecating gesture but you don't know what it is to be tempted desperate i was determined i wouldn't ruin my life and then then her voice faltered this evening when you seemed so happy so trustful that was what hurt me julian it was easier when you were jealous suspicious as you were at first it came to me suddenly that i couldn't begin the new year i couldn't begin our life together with this this terrible secret weighing on my soul and so i i told you elizabeth's voice faltered she raised her eyes in a half-conscious appeal 
it seemed to her for the moment as if the agony of that confession must make amends to some extent even for such deceit as hers but gerard's face did not soften her whole conduct seemed to him monstrous and credible he could not accept as atonement this tardy repentance the fact that she had told him the truth at the eleventh hour the thought occurred to him which she had herself suggested earlier in the evening he remembered chance gossip of the neighborhood about her antecedents listened to vaguely even before he knew her and haunting him afterwards in the first days of their acquaintance till love had made him cast it aside as a thing of no importance now it recurred to his mind as the only explanation he did not accept it as an excuse of this weakness which seemed otherwise inexplicable no doubt there must be he told himself and the child of such parents it would be strange if there were not some hereditary taint some lack of moral fiber which curiously imperceptible in other ways must needs assert itself in any great moral crisis the thought which might have softened him seemed at the time only to steel him the more against her he fell again to pacing up and down thinking it over seeing past incidents afresh in the merciless light of his present knowledge recalling this or that insignificant circumstance which at the time had aroused unreasonably as it seemed his distrust her occasional uneasiness and distress that air she had of being on her guard the look in the picture ah he understood it now it was the shadow of falsehood which for months had clouded her every thought and action what a fool he had been he reflected fiercely how he had allowed himself to be deceived made an easy prey by the extent of his infatuation how she had juggled with the truth telling him the worst of herself in such a way that he had believed all the more determinedly the reverse he stopped at last his restless pacing to and fro and paused beside her the fierce tide of anger the first bitterness of his disillusion had subsided he was cold with the coldness of despair his face was worn and haggard as if from the suffering of years but it was set in rigid lines from which all feeling seemed to have vanished his eyes were dry and hard i think he said and there was a dull toneless sound in his voice he spoke slowly like one who either weighed his words with great care or was afraid to trust himself too far i think there had better be an end to this i should only say if i said all i thought things i might afterwards regret and i wouldn't his voice broke ever so little god knows i don't want to be unjust but i cannot he let his hand fall with a look of dull despair i cannot understand how you have kept this from me all these months he paused as if expecting an answer an excuse perhaps of some sort but she said nothing and he went on after a moment his voice growing more uncertain it isn't so much the marriage that could be perhaps he hesitated his heavy brows drawn together frowning the man must be an absolute wretch he said suddenly there must be for your sake i hope so some way out oh for me she made a little gesture of utter carelessness for me it can make no difference now for myself he went on not heeding her words perhaps not fully grasping their meaning i couldn't whether the marriage held or not i couldn't forgive being so deceived he stopped and again seemed to expect some protest but she only repeated in a dull voice of complete acquiescence no i didn't think you could forgive being so deceived even if i could forgive he said i could never trust no she repeated you could never trust her face was colorless but impassive as if it had been turned to stone her voice was almost as firm as his you are quite right she said i deserve all the harsh things you could say it is kind of you to say so few perhaps later you'll judge me more gently but i couldn't expect it now and so she faltered and caught her breath as if her strength failed her and so good-bye she said at last i think it can only hurt us both to discuss this any longer her calmness stunned him he had been prepared for tears excuses but she offered no defence and made no effort to arouse his pity there was a dignity in her complete submission he looked at her his face working with varied emotions and then he said good-bye mechanically and took her hand for an instant it was icy cold and lay impassively in his he dropped it and moved towards the door as if under some spell deprived of all capacity for thought or feeling involuntarily her eyes followed him was this the parting after so many months but at the door he paused he looked back the firelight played on her hair on her white dress the drooping lines of her slender form 
the deathly pallor of her face, the despair in her eyes. He softened, perhaps, or it might be that the mere physical spell of her beauty held him, even when all that made the glory of his love had been rudely shattered. He came back, caught her in his arms, and pressed burning kisses on her lips. She trembled as if they had been blows, but she made no effort to free herself. And then, as if ashamed of his weakness, he let her go and went out hastily. A moment later she heard the front door close, with a dull sound that echoed through the quiet rooms. She stood where he had left her, staring blankly about her at the familiar objects which seemed to have acquired, during the last hour, an air of change, of unreality. What had happened? What had she done? A while ago she had been borne up by a courage that seemed almost heroic, a sense of moral victory. Now that had failed her. She was simply a woman despised and heartbroken, who by her own suicidal act had destroyed her happiness. "'How! How can I bear it?' she broke out at last fiercely, and sinking down on the hearthrug she lay prostrate, her face hidden, while her whole frame shook with convulsive sobs. The old Dutch clock ticked softly, pitifully, in the silence. The fire flickered and died away. But outside in the street spasmodic whistles kept on blowing, and belated wayfarers still bade each other with laughter and jollity. Happy New Year! End of chapter 28 Recording by P. J. Morgan Chapter 29 of the ordeal of elizabeth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson chapter 29 of the ordeal of elizabeth by anonymous it was 8 days later Elizabeth Trouble and the New Year were both a week old. She had lived through the time somehow or another, had even faced those smaller trials which follow in the wake of any great catastrophe. She had told the whole truth to her aunts. It was only less hard than telling Gerard. She had written to her friends to announce the breaking of her engagement, and had countermanded the orders for her trousseau. These affairs disposed of, she was ready to face the world with such strength as she had left for gerard the situation was simpler he had taken at once his man's way out of it and pacing the deck of an ocean steamer he tried to distract his mind and forget his trouble in plans for extensive travel and scientific research they had been his resource once before when a woman had disappointed him he had not seen elizabeth again he dreaded perhaps to trust himself or perhaps his anger was still too great but he had written before he left to her aunts urging them to consult a lawyer and take steps at once to free her from the results of her rash marriage to himself he justified this weakness if it were weakness by the thought of halleck's baseness i could not bear to think of her as his wife he said to himself a fellow who could give her up for money upon elizabeth's aunts the affair had come like a thunderbolt they were quite unprepared for it though many suspicious circumstances the mystery as to elizabeth's jewels her own occasional words might have suggested the idea that something was amiss but absorbed in their delight in the engagement their affection for gerard they had not the heart to formulate any doubt they might have felt. Now, in the first shock of their awakening, they remembered unwillingly the same facts of family history which had occurred to Gerard. What could they have expected from Malvina's child but deceit, folly, and disgrace? But they were gentle souls and had no reproaches for Elizabeth, only a silent, sorrowful pity which hurt the girl's proud spirit more than the sharpest words. She was lingering that morning, pale and languid, over her untasted breakfast, and Miss Cornelia, from behind the coffee urn, stole anxious glances towards her, all sense of injury lost in her distress over the girl's wretched looks, and fear that she was going to be ill. They too were alone, Miss Joanna having already started to do her marketing, when the maid entered with the belated newspaper. 
Miss Cornelia held out her delicate, tremulous hand for it, nervously apprehensive of that paragraph which, no doubt in the society columns, announced that the engagement between Miss Van Vorst and Mr. Gerard had been broken by mutual consent. It was not this notice which met her eyes, but some exciting headlines on the first page which had already attracted the attention of the cook and the housemaid. Elizabeth, said Miss Cornelia, in a stifled voice, Elizabeth, what is this? Elizabeth raised her vacant eyes and saw Miss Cornelia deathly white and staring in horror at the paper. Is it? she said. It must be. What a dispensation! So young, too. Auntie, said Elizabeth impatiently, why don't you say what it is? I am afraid he was very ill prepared said Miss Cornelia, apparently talking to herself, and oblivious of her niece's presence. But suddenly she seemed to realise it, and placed her hand over the paper. "'My dear, don't look at this just yet,' she faltered. "'You—it will be a shock, Elizabeth. Prepare yourself.' Elizabeth did not wait to hear more, but went to her and seized the paper from her hand. The headline told, in large type, how Paul Halleck, the prominent young singer had died the evening before of a mysterious draught of poison which had been sent to him by mail there followed in smaller type the details of the affair but elizabeth did not read them she sank into the nearest chair and sat staring before her with dilated eyes that seemed to express less surprise or terror than a sort of awe as at some unexpected manifestation of providence it was I who killed him, she said. She spoke in a dull, dreamlike way, not in the least conscious, as it seemed, of anything extraordinary in the words. Poor Miss Cornelia could form no other conclusion than that she had suddenly lost her mind. Elizabeth, my darling, she remonstrated, what do you mean? But Elizabeth was still staring before her vacantly, absorbed in her own thoughts. And so it has happened, she said in a low voice, at last, when I had given up hope. She was quite oblivious of her aunt's horror, or of the staring eyes of the maid who stood listening, the coffee-pot in her hand, her mouth wide open. But at that moment Miss Cornelia suddenly remembered her presence, and signed to her to leave the room, an order obeyed reluctantly. Now, Elizabeth, Miss Cornelia faltered out as the door closed, do my darling explain what you mean it's quite absurd you know to say that you had anything to do with this i wished it said elizabeth gazing at her with dull expressionless eyes i wished i even prayed that he might die and my wishes always come true only it is in such a way that it does no good but you can't urged miss cornelia in desperation you can't kill people by wishing elizabeth of course there are things that one can't feel as sorry for as one would like her voice faltered as she thought of certain individuals connected with her own life whose death it had been hard to regard in the light of an affliction we can't help her thoughts she murmured we can only pray not to give way to them ah but i didn't said elizabeth i encouraged them and now I shall have remorse, I suppose, all my life. She sat pondering a moment, while the expression on her face grew softer. I am sorry he is dead, she said at last. It does me no good now, and he seemed so full of life the last time I saw him. But it was his fate, no doubt. A fortune teller told him he would die before the year was out. It was his unlucky year, as well as mine and the prediction has come true in both cases but how did it happen urged miss cornelia do read elizabeth how it was did he drink poison by mistake elizabeth took up the paper and read the story which grew to be a famous one in the annals of new york crime halleck had received on new year's eve a package which contained a small hunting flask of sherry there was no name or card with the present if present it were nothing to identify the giver except the handwriting on the package which he did not recognize 
he suspected nothing however imagining the card to have been forgotten and accepted the flask as a belated christmas present but kept it unopened in the hope of discovering from whom it came he had brought it out and showed it the night before to some friends and the flask and the box in which it arrived were passed from one to the other but each disclaimed all knowledge of them to me said d'hauteville who happened to be present it looks like a woman's handwriting disguised to seem like a man perhaps he smiled it contains a love potion or a death potion suggested another man laughing i'm not afraid said the young singer lightly of either catastrophe with a smile he poured some of the wine into a glass and raised it to his lips to the health he said of the mysterious giver he emptied the glass and put it down observing that it must be after all a woman's gift since no man would have chosen such poor wine try it he said but by some fortunate chance no one did and in a few minutes halleck was taken desperately ill and died before the hastily summoned physician could save him this is briefly put the account which elizabeth read at first with a strange sense of unreality as if such tragedies of which she had often read before in the papers could not possibly occur within the circle of her own acquaintance then followed a growing horror a feeling of passionate remorse for her own indifference read it auntie she said thrusting the paper into miss cornelia's hand i i must be alone to think it over she went quickly and shut herself in her room but when there she did not lie down and cry as might have been best for her she had not shed any tears since new year's eve she paced up and down going over the whole thing in her mind imagining the details with a feverish vividness struggling above all with this irrational yet terrible sense of guilt it was irrational this she realized even in her state of feverish excitement the vindictive wish which had crossed her brain would never have gone beyond it and resolved itself into action she would not even she knew this now have been a passive factor in paul's death she would have been the first to go to his aid had she seen him suffering no selfish remembrance of her own gain would have stopped her and yet and yet with all her reasoning her mind always returned to the same point she had wished for his death and her wishes had been fulfilled too late for her own advantage only as it seemed to add to her punishment the idea occurred to her all at once that she must go and look at his dead body it presented itself in some irrational way in the light of an atonement the fever in her blood the beginning of an illness made the strained hysterical thought seem natural and almost inevitable she was not conscious of doing anything unusual hastily she dressed herself choosing instinctively a black gown and tying a black veil over her face and went out into the street where the cold air which she had not faced for a week blew refreshingly on her burning cheeks she walked all the way rapidly choosing unfrequented avenues and looking neither to the right nor the left her mind intent on the one object yet with a strange relief in motion and the intense cold she reached carnegie hall in a surprisingly short time but here she encountered unexpected difficulties take you up to mr halleck's studio said the elevator man looking with surprise and suspicion at the veiled young woman who made such an extraordinary request i can't take you up the police has charge and there ain't a soul allowed to go in but mr d'hauteville elizabeth was not in a mood to be gainsaid she placed a coin in the man's hand i must see him she said in a hoarse whisper if you won't take me up i'll walk i am his wife she went on and he still stared at her wondering i have a right to see him well it's the police that settles that he rejoined gruffly but still he took her up reflecting that after all it was no business of his he brought the elevator to a standstill with a shake of the head and an anxious look toward the fatal studio but elizabeth moved towards it as if she had no doubt whatever of entering 
and at the same moment mr d'hauteville opened the door of his rooms on the same landing and came face to face with her miss van vorst he exclaimed staring at her then in a lower voice for heaven's sake don't come here halleck is dead haven't you heard yes i i have heard she looked pleadingly at him mr d'hauteville she said take me in to see him i i must see him it was such a shock i am his wife you know she added the disclosure which she had once so dreaded fell from her lips indifferently as if it were a thing of small importance compared with the gaining of her purpose his wife d'hauteville fell back and stared at her incredulously then his mind quickly grasped the explanation of facts which had puzzled him he looked at her and saw that she was suffering from terrible distress and excitement do you really wish to see him he said it would be painful yes i i must see him elizabeth raised confidingly her troubled eyes and d'hauteville apparently could not resist their appeal slowly and reluctantly he unlocked the studio door and allowed elizabeth to enter the hall was empty but from behind the portiere at the end came the sound of voices d'hauteville cast an anxious glance towards them but he opened quickly another door and led the way into the bedroom which was still and dark and close with a strange oppressive atmosphere d'hauteville treading softly drew up the shade then he fell back and turned his eyes away elizabeth felt no fear though her only recollection of death was connected with a horrible moment in her childhood when they had led her in trembling to look at her father in his coffin but now she felt indifferent to any trivial terrors she stood by the bedside looking down at the dead man and put out her hand and touched the curls which clustered about his forehead he was not much changed the greatest difference which death had made was in a certain look of dignity which his face had never worn in life it was impossible standing there to think of his faults or of any harm that he had wrought in her life she only remembered that he had been her first lover nothing more a few moments passed and then d'hauteville pulled down the shades and drew her gently from the room the tears were falling fast behind her veil and the hand that rested against his was icy cold i had better see you home he said anxiously but she shook her head no no thank you you have been very kind but i i would rather not mr d'hauteville she said raising piteous eyes to his who who could have done it god only knows said d'hauteville with a sigh no one else i believe ever will he had rung the bell and they stood waiting for the elevator when she turned to him it was not i she said don't ever think that it was i and at that moment the elevator stopped and she was borne away before there was time for further words but d'hauteville stood paralyzed for heaven's sake he asked himself why did she say that who accused her elizabeth as she went her way was quite unconscious of the impression her words had produced her head felt confused and after she left carnegie there followed a blank interval during which she wandered aimlessly but found herself at last as if led by some involuntary instinct in the park beside the lake into which a few weeks before she had thrown her wedding ring now as before it was nearly covered with a thin coating of ice yet there was a strip of water visible and upon this her eyes fastened with a thrill of terrified fascination she pictured it involuntarily closing over her head dragging her down blotting out all thoughts all feelings a moment of agony perhaps and then rest oblivion an end of all struggle no more tomorrows to be faced no more regrets the thought of death the one way out the only remedy swift and sure appealed to her with a force almost irresistible if only the water were not so cold in an instant there swept over her quite as inevitably the natural healthy reaction the revulsion against the icy pond 
and all the weird uncanny frightful unpleasant associations that it conjured up ah she had not the courage not then at least she closed her eyes shutting out the strange fascination of the water gleaming in the pale chill sunlight and promising its sure and terrible relief she closed her eyes and turned resolutely away a horror seized upon her of herself and of loneliness of the bleak desolation on every side she hastened breathing heavily towards the entrance of the park her hurried footsteps on the crisp hard path sounding unnaturally loud in the wintry silence End of chapter 29chapter 30 of the ordeal of elizabeth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson chapter 30 of the ordeal of elizabeth by anonymous several weeks later the hallock poisoning case was still so far as the general public was concerned an impenetrable mystery for a day or two various clues were investigated with a great appearance of zeal and then a lull fell upon the efforts of the police their final investigations if they made any were conducted behind closed doors but no results appeared from their labors the coroner's inquest was postponed from week to week for lack of sufficient evidence the public grew impatient and clamoured that someone should be arrested it did not seem greatly to matter whom and then there began to be strange rumours of influence exerted to conceal the truth of suspicion which pointed in such high quarters that the police were afraid to continue their search these rumours were still comparatively new when eleanor van antwerp took up one day a scandalous society journal one of those papers which no one reads but whose remarks in some mysterious way everyone hears about and came across a paragraph which seemed to her at once insulting and inexplicable they say it began with this conventional formula that certain highly dramatic developments are to be expected soon in the famous poisoning case the evidence that the district attorney has collected is now said to be complete and to inculpate rather seriously a well-known beauty the lady is related though on her father's side only to one of our old dutch houses and was introduced to society where she was before entirely unknown by the representative of another old knickerbocker family under such circumstances her success was certain not content with taking the town by storm she made special capture of a certain prominent society man and eligible party to whom her engagement was announced this gentleman has however according to latest reports left the forlorn beauty and fled to parts unknown what did it mean the hot indignant color rushed to mrs bobby's cheek and then retreating left her deadly pale she took the paper to her husband and pointing out the offending paragraph she stood beside him as he read it her dark eyes fixed intently upon his face and seeing there to her dismay more indignation than surprise well she said as he looked up at the end tell me what does it mean it the editor of that infernal thing ought to be horsewhipped he said fiercely she put the remark aside as irrelevant why that should have been done long ago but what does it mean she persisted holding to the main point he put the paper down with a sigh it means what it says eleanor i'm afraid he said she stared at him a shade paler while the dread in her eyes grew more pronounced means what it says she repeated then it isn't merely a wild concoction of the kind they're always inventing it's more than that i'm afraid bobby rose and began to pace up and down they do say nasty things he said apparently addressing the walls or anything rather than his wife her eyes followed him with an intense anxiety as her white lips barely framed the question at the clubs he nodded 
yes there and at other places besides at the district attorney's for instance you don't mean she began incredulously that they suspect her yes mrs bobby sat down as if her strength suddenly had failed her but that's absurd impossible she said after a moment perhaps but it's the impossible that sometimes happens mrs bobby was silent in incredulous horror and he went on after a pause you see she's in a confoundedly unpleasant position there are all kinds of queer stories going the round they say now that she was secretly married to halleck that he had some kind of power over her at least and then having every motive to get rid of him being engaged to gerard bobby said his wife in a horrified tone how can you repeat such disgusting gossip i'm only telling you what they say said bobby apologetically i don't wish to know it bobby held his peace why should she have any motive said his wife after a moment's reflection when her engagement was broken they say but i thought you didn't wish to know i don't but i suppose i must know what do they these disgusting people say they think that gerard found out something which made him break the engagement as for the poison that was sent before you know bobby said his wife with a little cry you don't mean to suggest that she that elizabeth van vorst she paused as if at a loss for words and bobby concluded the sentence sent the poison he said quietly no i don't suggest it not for a second i don't believe it even he cried with sudden emphasis but there are other people who who do both then they must be fools bobby made no reply where she said in a moment do they suppose she got it the poison that they don't know as yet but they know or think they do where she got the flask there's a shop in brooklyn where they sell others like it he stopped well she said what of it i dare say there are a good many shops where they sell them the man who keeps this particular shop said i believe that he sold one on the twenty-third of december to a young woman thickly veiled rather tall and with wavy red hair her hair isn't red said mrs bobby quickly some people call it so you know said bobby she was silent hundreds of women have that sort of hair she said presently half the actresses in town he said it seemed to him natural how should he know said mrs bobby contemptuously and why on earth should she choose a place like brooklyn i don't think she ever went there in her life she seems said bobby gently to have done a great many things that you didn't think of eleanor and again his wife fell silent have they any other evidence she asked after thinking a moment or what they call evidence i might as well know the worst they have her letters which were found among halleck's papers she told him to burn them but he didn't they were signed e v v one of them was about her engagement to gerard it seemed he had threatened her and she offered him money to keep him quiet the other was just a line asking him to meet her in the park it's evident that she was afraid of him and had to keep him supplied with funds she sold all her jewelry they say to do it ah her jewelry mrs bobby drew a long breath that is what she did with it then she remarked involuntarily bobby turned to her sharply you notice then he said that she didn't have it of course there were her pearls which she never wore last summer the watch i gave her too i used to feel hurt that she never carried it but i never suspected oh what a fool i was what a fool and i who thought myself so clever in bringing about a match between her and julian she stopped and suddenly burst into tears i made a nice failure of it all didn't i she said then in a moment her mood changed and she turned upon bobby indignantly why didn't you tell me all this before i didn't want to tell you said bobby slowly a moment sooner than was necessary personally i don't see the use of having all this exploited as a matter of fact i'd pay a good deal to have it kept quiet 
partly for your sake and partly because well i like elizabeth she may not have behaved well but i don't think she deserves to be made conspicuous in this way i don't mind confessing that i've done what i could to arrest the zeal of the police but i'm sorry to say without success you don't mean she said incredulously that they refused money well the new district attorney is very zealous bobby explained and between ourselves i think he wants the eclat of a sensational case to put a young society woman in prison against the efforts of all her friends shows roman stoicism or so he thinks but you don't believe said his wife piteously you don't think it could come to that bobby to prison he said i don't know eleanor upon my word i don't know and he began again thoughtfully to pace up and down what did gerard say he asked presently when he wrote to you before he sailed it was just a hurried note hard to make out he said the engagement was broken by her of course he'd say that what did she tell you that it was his wish but he was not to blame and she would tell me more some other time she looked so unutterably wretched that i couldn't ask any questions just then ah said bobby softly i don't believe poor child that it was her doing eleanor if it was julian's she said he must have had some good reason and with that they both fell into thoughtful silence i don't see was her next objection uttered musingly i don't see how they ever thought of elizabeth in the first place it seems such a wildly improbable idea it certainly does bobby agreed then elizabeth poor child as it happens rather put the idea into their heads herself it seems that she went into the studio the day after the poisoning and insisted upon seeing him she said she was his wife d'hauteville saw her i believe but he said nothing about it it was the elevator man who told the story he took her up and he heard d'hauteville call her by her name he says that d'hauteville took her into the studio and when she came out she was crying and the man vows he heard her say i didn't do it don't think i did it or something of the kind why i never broke in mrs bobby heard anything so extraordinary the man must have been drinking it's impossible that elizabeth could have done such a thing why it was that day that day she paused and thought that day after the murder she continued triumphantly i remember distinctly going to see her in the afternoon and she was ill in bed with grippe and her temperature very high i can believe that said bobby rather grimly after what she went through in the morning for i'm afraid there's not much doubt eleanor that it's true one of the detectives too saw her pass through the hall and i don't think that d'hauteville denies it they want him to testify at the inquest but so far they can't get him to say one thing or another he would deny it of course if it were false said mrs bobby in a low voice her husband bent his head well she said rallying after all i don't see anything in that it would be pretty stupid if she were really guilty to defend herself before she was accused no one but a fool would have done that and the person who sent that poison couldn't have been a fool and she wouldn't have gone near the studio that's the last thing the real culprit would have done that's what i say said bobby it doesn't seem on the face of it the act of a guilty woman but they have some theory of hysterical remorse and there is other evidence i haven't heard which fits into that they say that when she heard that it had really happened she lost her head completely there have been such cases you know oh and then another thing they're comparing the handwriting on the package with the letters the letters broke in mrs bobby anxiously yes that i told you of you remember written to him they've got experts examining them now ah well if the experts have got hold of the case said mrs bobby resignedly we might as well give up hope they'd swear away any person's life to prove a theory well at least said bobby it's the life of a young and beautiful girl that really seemed to me when i heard all this the only hope 
even handwriting experts are human but his wife only sighed despairingly i think she said after a while i must go to elizabeth i haven't seen her for several days and she mustn't think that her friends are giving her up you won't tell her anything asked bobby anxiously do you think she doesn't know she would be the last person in the natural order of events to hear of it then i shall say nothing said his wife after a moment's reflection you wouldn't would you she added as she caught an odd look in her husband's eyes i i don't know bobby seemed to reflect if if she were to go abroad just now he said doubtfully it might not be a bad plan bobby mr van antwerp's wife faced him indignantly you wouldn't have her run away from all this you wouldn't have her frightened by anything those people can threaten eleanor van antwerp's dark eyes sparkled she held her head proudly her husband looked at her half in doubt half in admiration you would face it yes if it cost me my life the look of admiration on bobby's face brightened and then faded to despondency oh well you are right theoretically of course but would elizabeth do you think have the same courage or if she had could you knowing what you do take the responsibility of allowing her to face it this was the doubt the horrible doubt which troubled mrs bobby as she drove to elizabeth's home and at the thought of it her heart failed her her husband had judged her rightly she could be braver for herself than for others would it not be better after all to suggest to the mrs van vorst the desirability of a trip abroad she looked thoughtfully out of the carriage window it was a bleak february day and people in the street had their coat collars turned up against the chill east wind the climate of new york at this time is detestable a change would do anyone good she would go herself to the riviera and take elizabeth with her mrs bobby had hardly reached this conclusion before the carriage stopped in front of the quiet apartment house in irving place where the van vorsts were spending the winter it was an old-fashioned house with an air of sober respectability that seemed to make such wild thoughts as filled mrs bobby's brain peculiarly strained and improbable like the hallucinations of a fevered brain it was a shock keyed up as she was to the tragic point to enter the peaceful little drawing-room with its bright coal fire and general air of comfort and to find elizabeth prosaically engaged in looking over visiting cards and invitations and yet mrs bobby was shocked by the change in her appearance which every day made more apparent her face was haggard there was a deep purple flush in her cheeks her lips were dry and feverish there was an odd strained look in her eyes the hand she held out to her visitor burned like fire i'm so glad you came in she said with a wan smile i've been looking over these stupid things and my head aches you see i've neglected my social duties shamefully not sending cards or even i'm afraid answering some of my invitations people must think me horribly rude oh they know you've been ill mrs bobby answered vaguely she sat down all the wind taken out of her sails and stared wonderingly at elizabeth how could she how could she look over visiting cards and talk about invitations with this terrible danger hanging over her head was it possible that she had no suspicions and yet did not her eyes betray her but mrs bobby could not think of any way of introducing the subject of which her mind and heart were full and there was silence till elizabeth spoke again it's odd isn't it she said languidly that mrs lansdowne hasn't asked me to her ball have you cards for it i i believe so well she has left me out said elizabeth mrs bobby started and looked at her with some interest i suppose she thinks elizabeth went on i'm i'm not much of an addition just now i certainly am not to look at she laughed a little in a feeble way of course i shouldn't go she added but it isn't nice to be left out 
Perhaps it's a mistake suggested mrs. Bobby not very impressively She was quite convinced to the contrary Perhaps Elizabeth acquiesced But if so several other people have done the same thing the van Aldens never asked me to their dance and I haven't had an invitation to a dinner for weeks People forget one quickly in New York don't they and she made another painful attempt at a laugh I Suppose said mrs. Bobby they think you don't want to go I Don't said Elizabeth, but they might at least give me the opportunity of refusing and Then there was a pause in the midst of which miss Joanna entered Oh mrs. Van Antwerp she said how glad I am to see you do tell Elizabeth that she ought to be in bed You can see for yourself. She has a fever. It is the grief of course she has never really got over it Yes, said mrs. Bobby looking doubtfully at Elizabeth. It is the grief of course The grief is a convenient disease said Elizabeth in a low tone. It means so many things She took up a sheet of paper and began to write hastily It does me good she said to employ myself and I can't stay in bed. It drives me wild Miss Joanna as if weary of expostulation moved to the window Yes, I declare she announced in the tone of one who makes a not unexpected discovery There are those men again every time I look out one or other of them seems to be watching the house Watching the house repeated mrs. Bobby startled Yes, that's what it looks like at least and the other day when I went out one of them stared at me so most impertinent I declare if it goes on we shall have to make a complaint and one of them followed Elizabeth didn't he my dear I thought he did said Elizabeth indifferently, but I didn't notice much I have thought several times lately that there were people following me perhaps it is because my head feels so queer What do the men look like asked mrs. Bobby? Oh quite respectable said miss Joanna. They don't look like beggars certainly Cornelia thought they looked rather like detectives. She said they made her feel nervous but that of course is quite ridiculous Quite ridiculous echoed mrs. Bobby to herself. She was saying ah that trip abroad Eleanor has an invitation for mrs. Lansdowne's ball auntie said Elizabeth suddenly changing the subject Which did not seem to interest her by the introduction of one that evidently rankled in her mind She thinks it odd that I wasn't asked I told you she went on with a bitter smile that people are giving me up since my engagement was broken off But that is nonsense remonstrated miss Joanna in distress Tell her she said turning pleadingly to mrs. Bobby that it isn't so Mrs. Bobby started up and took Elizabeth's hand I Don't know she said speaking with strange earnestness who gives you up Elizabeth dear and I don't care I never will remember that dear child I will stand by you whatever happens and then as if conscious of having said too much or fearful perhaps of saying more Mrs. Bobby swept hastily from the room leaving her hearers petrified Miss Joanna was the first to speak how very strange she was she said in a low voice What what do you think she meant? Elizabeth was staring vacantly at the door, but at her aunt's words she turned I don't know she said what she meant but one thing I understand that my social career is ended With a little pale smile she swept aside the cards of invitation Locked them into a drawer and left the room End of chapter 30Chapter 31 of the ordeal of Elizabeth this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Natalie Paula. Chapter 31 of The Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. Mrs. Bobby regained her carriage, and consulting her engagement book, she ordered her coachman to drive her to the house of one of her friends, whose day at home it was. It was a sudden resolution she had gone about very little that winter since she had no longer the incentive of chaperoning elizabeth 
and had not paid a visit for weeks on the plea of mourning for an uncle but now she set her teeth and said to herself that she must mingle with the world to find out if possible what the world was saying was it fancy or did she distinguish as she stood in the hall of mrs van alden's house leaving cards amidst the hum of voices in the drawing-room words that bore upon her own fevered anxiety shocking affair and she is really involved in it surely she had heard those sentences and then the conversation ceased abruptly as the butler drew aside the portiere and she stood for a moment on the threshold her eyes were bright her head erect she glanced around taking mental stock as if it were of the company five or six women were seated about a blazing wood fire with an air unusual at functions of this kind having come to stay and of forming or this again might have been her fancy a sort of council of justice there was mrs lansdowne to whose ball elizabeth had not been invited and there was sybil hardington and one or two others who knew mrs bobby and did not as it happened love her very much enemies she thought drawing her breath sharply and discussing elizabeth and me it's the same thing i'm sure i feel it if it were i under suspicion elner van antwerp had certainly never known such a feeling before but her bearing had never been more instinct with the nonchalant confidence of a woman who seems absolutely unconscious of her position for the reason it has never been questioned i seem to have interrupted the conversation she observed lightly after she had been rather nervously greeted and kissed by her hostess and had taken her place in the circle some one was telling a very interesting story i caught fragments of it as i came in she glanced her eye around the group it was you kitty i think she said won't you please begin the story over again and tell it for my benefit kitty thus appealed to colored and bit her lip oh the story isn't really worth repeating she said hastily she had no wish to offend mrs van antwerp and was heartily wishing that she had not spoken so loud sybil hardington helped her out by observing with her placid smile it's a story about a friend of yours my dear eleanor so kitty is afraid to tell it about a friend of mine said mrs bobby as she opened her eyes very wide then there's all the more reason she said decidedly why i should hear it her glance challenged the group but no one spoke and at last the hostess interposed my dear eleanor i am sorry you should have heard anything about it we were only talking about poor elizabeth van vorst and regretting that there is all this unfortunate gossip about her for my part i don't believe there is a word of truth in what they say but it is certainly uncomfortable it makes it hard to know what to do said mrs lansdowne a woman with a deep bass voice and an air of being not so much indifferent to as unconscious of other people's feelings i couldn't for instance ask miss van vorst to my ball while there are these queer rumours about her i was sorry to leave out any friend of yours mrs van antwerp but if a young woman gets herself talked about no matter how or why i can't encourage her it's against my principles let the girl behave herself i say and keep out of the papers i'm sure that's simple enough it's not always so simple said mrs bobby and though the indignant colour had rushed into her cheeks her tone was seraphic not so simple for every one as it is for your daughters mrs lansdowne a subdued smile as she spoke went the round of the circle unfortunately mrs lansdowne was not quick in her perceptions no it's true she admitted my daughters have had unusual advantages i can't expect every one to come up to the same standard but one has to draw the line somewhere and when a girl has done such queer things as miss van vorst there seems nothing for it but to drop her but what what has poor elizabeth done asked mrs bobby with eyes of innocent wonder and again there followed an awkward silence well you know eleanor they tell very queer stories the hostess said at last depreciatingly i never pay attention to gossip but these things are sometimes forced upon one haven't you seen that thing in scandal i don't said mrs bobby unmoved read scandal mary and chit-chat chimed in some one else there was a long paragraph in chit-chat it seems that she was mixed up in some way with that dreadful poisoning case they say that she was actually married to that young hollock at the same time she was engaged to julian gerard said mrs harrington with her calm smile it's no wonder that he poor man when he found out got out of the affair as best he could mrs bobby looked steadily at the speaker as a friend of mr gerard sibyl she said i can state on his authority that the engagement was broken by miss van vorst sibyl harrington's calm faintly amused smile again rippled across her face i never doubted my dear eleanor she said 
that mr gerard is a gentleman the entrance of another visitor at that moment was not altogether unwelcome to mrs bobby who felt that she was being worsted but the newcomer immediately continued the same subject i had just been hearing the most extraordinary news she exclaimed sitting on the edge of her chair and too much excited to notice mrs bobby's presence i heard it at luncheon they said that elizabeth van vorst but here the speaker suddenly caught sight of mrs bobby and stopped short well what do they say said mrs bobby with a rather bitter smile don't keep us in suspense miss dare and above all don't mind my feelings i'd rather know the worst of this well i don't believe there is any truth in it they say that she's really seriously implicated in that dreadful poisoning case and that the police have letters she wrote to hollock and all sorts of unpleasant things but of course it's impossible a girl like that whom we all know do we said mrs hardington softly do you think that we any of us know much about her you didn't eleanor did you turning to mrs bobby you just took her up in that charming impulsive way of yours didn't you because people in the neighborhood didn't have much to do with her and you felt sorry for her mrs bobby made a scornful little gesture you flatter me sybil she said i'm afraid i'm not so charitable as all that i took up elizabeth van vorst as you say because i liked her and for no other reason it was for my own pleasure entirely that i asked her to stay with me and i have never regretted it mrs hardington gave a barely perceptible shrug of the shoulders i congratulate you she said it was a rash action some people thought at the time a girl whom you so slightly whose mother was such an impossible person or at least so they say i don't of course she went on her soft drawling tones know much about it myself but it does make all this gossip seem less extraordinary doesn't it why yes of course that accounts for it said mrs lansdowne looking relieved that sort of thing runs in families a girl is a queer mother sure to be queer herself and get herself talked about i never thought her very good style some one who had not yet spoken now found courage to observe her hair is so conspicuous i never could understand why men seemed to admire her mrs harrington raised her eyebrows ah the men she said with serene scorn she is exactly the sort of girl who would appeal to men mrs bobby felt that she had stayed as long as the limit of human endurance could permit she rose to her feet her cheeks were flushed her eyes brilliant her voice rang out with crystal clearness it's hardly necessary for me to tell you she said that elizabeth van vorst is my most intimate friend i love her very dearly and always shall what her mother might have been is no affair of mine but as for the men liking her she turned suddenly to mrs hardington they do like her sybil and i think they show good taste but if you mean the inference you seem to draw from that she paused and drew her breath quickly why it's not very flattering i think to either men or women mrs hardington gave a short little laugh my dear i'm not drawing inferences one way or another i'm merely stating a fact complimentary one might think to your protege but you take things so seriously she drew herself up with an air of some annoyance mrs bobby's hands were tightly locked together inside her muff she faced the group appealingly her dark eyes wandered from one to the other certainly i take this thing seriously she said and there was a thrill of earnestness in her voice which moved more than one of her hearers it's no light matter for me to hear my friend spoken of like this i had elizabeth van vorst with me all last winter i feel as if i know her like my own sister i believe in her implicitly no matter what any one might say and if if some of you instinctively her eyes flashed upon one or two whom she felt she was carrying with her if you would try to think the best and give her the benefit of the doubt show that women can stand by one another sometimes her voice faltered and she broke off suddenly there were tears glistening in her eyes as she held out her hand to her hostess forgive me mary she said i don't want to make a scene but i can't help feeling strongly and in this case i want every one to know exactly how i feel and with that she left the room quickly before any one could speak yet conscious as she went of a subtle wave of sympathy which seemed to have made itself felt since her entrance but it's useless useless she said sadly to her husband when she got home you may as well try to stop the course of a torrent as fight against the world's disapproval when it is once roused against any poor defenceless girl it isn't if she were a great personage or even if she were still engaged to julian they've nothing to gain by standing by her yet there are one or two i think even of those women this afternoon who felt with me and at least she consoled herself a little 
at least they shall see that she has friends. She'll need them, poor girl. The inquest, I just heard, is coming off next week. He took up a paper knife and played with it, while he stole a furtive glance at his wife. I think you'd better prepare Elizabeth, he said. Prepare her, she repeated anxiously as he paused. For some confoundedly unpleasant questions, yes. Have you the strength to tell her? His eyes questioned her anxiously. She was white to the lips, but she met them without flinching. One can always find strength. It's confoundedly hard, I know. Bobby began to pace up and down helplessly. You don't know how I hate to have you mixed up with all this, Eleanor, he said. I'd give anything to have you out of it. Wouldn't it be better for you to go abroad for a while? And desert Elizabeth? My dear Bobby, you wouldn't have me do that? Well, you can't help her, you know, he urged. I can show that I believe in her, and thank heaven social position does count for something. It may help me to fight Elizabeth's battles. It doesn't count for much, unfortunately, before the law. Not theoretically, no, said his wife skeptically, but practically it counts with everyone and everywhere. By the way, she added, struck with a sudden idea, what sort of man is the district attorney? I might ask him to dinner. She looked prepared to send the invitation on the spot. My dear Elner, I'm afraid it's too late for that now. The thing to do now, since matters have gone so far, is to prove Elizabeth's innocence, and for that the first step is to prepare her, so that she won't be taken unawares. Her aunts, too. They must be told, I suppose, poor things. I believe it will kill them. People don't die so easily. It would be more merciful, I sometimes think, if they did. She sat and thought for a moment. I think I'd better go there at once, she said, at last, nervously. I couldn't sleep tonight with this hanging over my head. And so, for the second time that day, she drove to the Van Vorst apartment, feeling her unexpected appearance in itself must prepare them for some calamity. And indeed, the telling proved easier than she feared. She saw Elizabeth alone, and sat holding the girl's hand, trying by many tender circumlocutions to break the force of the blow. But Elizabeth understood almost immediately. They think I sent the poison? Is that it? she said, going at once to the point which her friend was approaching so carefully. Well, that isn't so strange. Sometimes I feel, she added wearily and putting her hand to her head, as if I'd done it myself. I think I, I might have done it. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, what do you mean? Because I wished it, you know, Elizabeth went on to explain quite calmly. I was married to him, and I wished that he might die, so that no one would ever know it. I didn't tell anyone but Julian. I wouldn't have told him if I could have helped it. That was the reason he gave me up because I told him that I had been secretly married all the time. He was angry because I hadn't told him before. But, interrupted Mrs. Bobby, with intense anxiety, you did tell him at last? Yes, of course I told him, said Elizabeth in surprise. I told him New Year's Eve. Why else should he have given me up? Then, cried Mrs. Bobby, rising to her feet in excitement, that seems to me an unanswerable argument. If you had expected Paul Halleck's death, you certainly wouldn't have told Julian Gerard of your marriage. That's clear as daylight. Oh, Elizabeth, how fortunate you told him. Fortunate, said Elizabeth listlessly. I don't see that it is very fortunate, since he has given me up and will never forgive me. It may save you. Elizabeth looked at her blankly. Oh, my dear child, cried Mrs. Bobby, don't you understand that they suspect you of of the murder? You don't mean that they would put me in prison? Mrs. Bobby only answered by her silence. Elizabeth sat staring at her for a moment. Then the color rushed to her white face. Her eyes flashed. How would they dare do that? She cried, when I am innocent. Of course you are, said Mrs. Bobby. No one but a fool would think otherwise, and we will prove it, never fear. But you mustn't talk any more of this morbid nonsense about being guilty of his death and all that. I know you mean well enough, but the general public doesn't understand such psychological subtleties. And besides, it's not true. The guilty person had no thought of doing you a service. Be sure of that. Paul Hollick would have died, my dear, if you had never known him. And now keep up a brave heart, Elizabeth. Your friends will stand by you, and when all this is over happily over you will look back upon it as a bad dream nothing more mrs bobby had almost talked herself into feeling the confidence she expressed but elizabeth listened languidly with drooping head all color had faded again from her face it looked haggard worn her hands plucked nervously at some fringe on her gown 
when she wiped her eyes at the last words the smile she conjured up was piteous it's a dream she murmured that is lasting a terribly long time end of chapter thirty one Chapter thirty two of the Ordeal of Elizabeth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Natalie Paula. Chapter thirty two of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. There is an old prison well in the heart of the city, which presents a grim medieval front to the busy world outside. Elizabeth knew that it existed, but had never seen it. She did not know even where it was, till she found herself condemned to spend eight months within its walls. This was after the inquest, when the evidence had gone as she had seen herself very much against her. It was a curious feeling, this bewildered perception of a net closing around her, whose meshes she had woven herself. The verdict of the jury was hardly a surprise, and then they broke it to her gently, the fact that bail was refused, and they brought her across the bridge of sighs the name which gave her an odd little thrill, into the prison. The inmates of the tombs are mostly of the lowest class. Such a prisoner as Miss Van Vorst was disconcerting to the wardens and matrons alike. The situation was unprecedented. They hardly knew how to deal with it. Elizabeth was placed in one of the ordinary cells. No other, indeed, was to be had. It was small and dark, and had for furniture a cot bed, a faucet set in the wall, and one cane chair light and air which there was of either came in through the corridor above and below the iron grating which barred the doorway there was no window elizabeth to whom an abundance of light and air had been one of the necessities of life who had a passion for space and luxury for fresh dainty surroundings looked about her in blank dismay yet she said nothing from the first she seemed to school herself to a silent stoicism which her friends call courage and her enemies insensibility and which may have been a combination of both the last two months had been crowded with so many startling events so intense conflicting a tumult of thought and emotion that her capacity for acute suffering was for the moment exhausted yet the mere physical horror that the cell inspired her with was very great the first time that the key was turned upon her and she was left entirely alone with the twilight coming on and no power to free herself nothing to do but wait for the matron's return she felt as she had felt once when for some childish offence she had been locked into a dark closet now as then she threw herself against the door trying with fierce unreasoning efforts to force the lock uttering hoarse cries for help then the door had been quickly opened her aunts had let her out with remorseful tears and the experiment had never been repeated now no help came to her and she was left to adapt herself to the situation as best she might the struggle left deep marks on her young face a look in her eyes which they never afterwards lost there were many ways in which the prison routine was softened in her favour social distinctions count as mrs bobby had said with every one and everywhere money is powerful even in the tombs the warden and the other officials reaped in those days a harvest of gold coins from mrs bobby a more comfortable bed a hand mirror all sorts of forbidden luxuries found their way into elizabeth's cell neither warden nor matron apparently recognised their existence she was permitted to receive her visitors alone to have a light in her cell after dark to walk for an hour a day in the corridor or the court at these times she would see the other women her fellow prisoners huddled together in an abject group and feeling thankful at least that she was not obliged to mingle with them her meals were served to her in her cell and she could order what she wanted her friends sent her constantly an abundance of fruit and flowers the people who came to see her and there were many of them used to go away wondering at her calmness they went prepared for tragedy and elizabeth received them as she might in her own drawing-room they noticed no change in her except that her head had never been held so proudly and she never looked so pale but there were no confidences no tears no consciousness apparently of the extraordinary state of things even to her aunts even to eleanor van antwerp she maintained this attitude of proud reserve they could only guess at the thoughts which lay beneath it there were times, indeed, when she did not think, when her brain would seem dazed. In those days she would read eagerly all the books that people brought her, read them through from beginning to end, but she never had any idea of what they were about. There was one form of reading which no one suggested, which she did not apparently think of herself. No one brought her a newspaper, and she never asked to see one. Perhaps she did not realize how much her case was discussed. 
perhaps she realized it only too well her aunts were thankful for her lack of curiosity they could not themselves open a paper or enter a street cart without agony of dread as to what they might see or hear for the yellow journals of course they were exploiting the affair it was mrs bobby's opinion indeed that it had been started originally on, on their account for the enlivenment of a dull season this may or may not be true but certainly they made the most of it they published elizabeth's picture and long accounts of her conquests there were pictures too of her grandmother that stately beauty whose frame was traditional and of old van vorst who had held important offices and served city and state with credit in colonial and revolutionary times then by contrast there were accounts of her mother's past and her mother's kindred through several generations of moral and social disrepute the neighborhood was often overrun by disguised reporters who made copious notes of local items and took photographs of the van vorst homestead of the village of bassett mills and even of the church thereby causing the rector's wife nervous spasms in her anxiety lest any of elizabeth's moral perversions should be laid to the account of the religious teaching that she had received bassett mills was all a flutter in its excitement over this gratuitous advertisement but in the neighborhood the staid aristocratic old neighborhood there was a feeling of humiliation a presentiment that could never recover from the disgrace of such notoriety and yet in spite of all the discredit what a subject for conversation in the neighborhood as well as bassett mills nothing else was talked of at the various tea-parties of which so many had never been given before people who had guests took them over on sunday afternoons to the homestead and wandered about the grounds relating the family history while strangers stared with interest at the old house and the horseshoe on the door there was a dreary look about the place for the misses van vorst were not coming back that summer and the old gardener left in charge had not the heart under the circumstances to keep it in order grass grew in the gravel walks the flowers in the garden hung their heads the foliage was sadly in need of clipping a shadow seemed to brood over the house and grounds as in the day of old madame vorst in town where there were more things to talk about the great poisoning case still took precedence of all other subjects and society was divided on account of it into warring camps there were those a very large number who followed mrs harrington's lead and spoke of elizabeth as a sort of adventuress who had thrust herself into circles which she had no right to enter a party which disowned her entirely believed implicitly in her guilt but there was another party smaller perhaps but not less influential which took uncompromising the opposite side the people who composed it were friends many of them of mrs van antwerp and there were others who had cared for elizabeth for her own sake and again others to whom the romantic facts of the case appealed irresistibly inducing them to espouse her case regardless of reason these all spoke of her as a suffering martyr and regarded her imprisonment as an outrage they did not discuss the evidence but met all doubts with the one unanswerable argument of their own intuitions but the first side had in point of logic so much the best of it this conviction intruded itself reluctantly on eleanor van antwerp's mind as she looked up from the exhaustive summary of the case for the prosecution the article presented in clear remorseless details all the links in that terrible chain of evidence her hasty marriage and then her repentance her efforts to buy off her husband the trouble she had to supply him with money her evident fear of his betraying her to gerard her refusal to name her wedding day till she had in sheer desperation decided on the murder then when the thing was at last accomplished her sudden remorse her strange actions the rumour that she had in the first excitement confessed her guilt before witnesses the description too of the woman who had brought the flask which fitted elizabeth exactly in height colouring and general appearance the resemblances which the experts were said to have discovered between her letters and the handwriting on the package never was chain more strongly forged and what the article further demanded had her friends to offer in rebuttal to but her social position her youth and her beauty it's not much certainly mrs bobby's anxiety admitted and yet a good deal too her aristocratic instincts involuntarily responded and will have their weight with the jury her cynicism added but then again despair overwhelmed her and she put the unavailing question bobby is there do you think there is any hope bobby stared back at her his face hardly less white than hers god only knows eleanor if she were just a man or even an ordinary woman i should say no but for a young girl there's always a chance let her he dropped his hand on the table beside him with a deep sigh 
Let her look as pretty as she can. It seems to me about the only hope. She won't look pretty, his wife returned with a little sob. She is just a shadow of her old self. If she stays in that place much longer, I believe it will kill her, Bobby, she cried with a sudden burst of indignation, staring up at him with tragic eyes. If that child dies there, it will be murder, and yet you say the law is just? Bobby had said so much in the last few weeks in perfunctionary defense of the law that he was weary of the subject, and so he attempted no further protestations but watched his wife sadly as she walked impatiently to and fro a slight childlike creature her cheeks flushed her eyes brilliant with impotent anger dashing herself as if it were against impenetrable barriers only once before in her life had eleanor van antwerp been confronted with an obstacle that did not yield to her wishes that was when the baby died and she had resigned herself to what she believed to be divine providence but this seemed mere human stupidity if only men were not so logical she exclaimed despairingly women if they intended to get her off would do it no matter what the evidence was but men they are so bound hand and foot by their sense of justice their respect for law and heaven knows what that they are quite capable even if they believe her innocent of finding her guilty just because the evidence was against her well that's what they're supposed to do bobby put in depreciatingly they've got to abide by the evidence it was the twentieth time that he had made this explanation, and for the twentieth time she brushed it aside. "'What does it matter?' she demanded, about the evidence, when anyone with common sense must know the girl is innocent. "'But I see how it is, Bobby,' she went on, her lip quivering. "'You don't really believe in her the way I do. You have doubts. At the bottom of your heart you have doubts. Tell me the truth, and I will try to forgive you. Haven't you?' She stopped before him, her dark eyes fastened upon his— seemed to read his soul but he answered steadily eleanor upon my honour i believe in that child's innocence as you do i'd give anything in the world to get her off yes and i would he added to himself for your sake if she had committed twenty murders she drew a long sigh of relief oh bobby you are nice she said gratefully you've been very good to me all this time never once saying i told you so when the whole thing has been all my fault for not taking your advice your fault you poor child how do you make that out if i had never asked elizabeth to stop with me she said tremulously all this wouldn't have happened you warned me don't you remember and you were right i've come to the conclusion bobby that you generally are right and i wrong her tone of submission was as edifying as it was surprising but bobby with unwonted quickness cut it short nonsense he said almost roughly you were right in that case as you generally are and i was wrong and no harm would have come of it if elizabeth well i don't want to hit people when they're down he said apologetically but if she had only been frank with us from the first all this wouldn't have happened my dear this in response to a reproachful look from his wife i don't mean to be hard on her i can't hear you blame yourself for what has been poor elizabeth's own fault helped out by a most extraordinary train of circumstances she was to blame certainly faltered his wife reluctantly but i can understand i believe i should have done the same in her place no eleanor said bobby briefly with some sternness you would not it's true she admitted i don't think i could keep a secret if i tried but then neither apparently could elizabeth to the bitter end that is one thing i can't understand she went on why don't any of you attach more importance to the fact that she told julian herself because said bobby slowly we have only her own word that she did so but her aunts began mrs bobby they can't know what passed between them what people think is that he discovered the marriage and charged her with it it seems improbable that after deceiving him so long that she should suddenly repent and of course he would shield her as far as possible so his version goes for nothing all the same i should like to hear it said mrs bobby decidedly if i were mr fenton i would summon him at once as a witness mr fenton was the counsel for the defence why fenton thought of it said bobby he spoke about it to elizabeth and she cried out oh not he not he of all people in such a way that he well he thought he'd better not send for him fear of discovering something that would go very much against us it did look badly you know that she should dread gerard's evidence so mrs bobby's reply was unexpected is mr fenton considered a clever lawyer dear she asked the best money can get said bobby somewhat taken aback but why eleanor 
Oh, well, I hope he knows more about law than he does about women, that's all. Now I say, send for Julian at once. Well, you know, Eleanor, I can't help thinking that if he knew of any evidence in her favor, he'd have turned up of his own accord before this. It looks badly, I think, his staying away, as if he were afraid of being questioned if he came. Mrs. Bobby sat for a moment, reflecting deeply, her brows knit. I don't believe, she said suddenly, that he knows a thing about it. Where is he? Do you know? Someone saw him ages ago in London, said Bobby. Goodness knows where he is now, but in all events he must have heard. I doubt it. It happened, you know, while he was on the ocean, and by the time he had landed the first excitement was over, and there was nothing about it in the papers for a long time, so that even if he bought an American paper he might not see anything about it, and the foreign ones, of course, would have nothing. You know how little interest they take in us over there. Oh, it might easily happen, strange as it seems, that he has heard nothing. But why is it, do you think, said Bobby, that Elizabeth doesn't want him here? My dear Bobby, how dull men are. Of course she doesn't want to call upon him at a time like this. She's too proud. But nothing will prevent him, if I know him rightly, from coming at once if there's anything he can do to help her. Well, if you think it any good, I'll send a detective after him, said Bobby, with the composure of one to whom money is no object. End of chapter 32《Chapter Thirty Three of the Ordeal of Elizabeth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marion Carwin. Chapter Thirty Three of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. The services of a detective proved imperative in finding Gerard. His banks, when applied to by cable, regretted to reply that they did not know his address. He had left no directions to have his mail forwarded. Apparently his one idea had been to efface himself and break with some home ties. It was a proceeding which did not altogether surprise Mrs. Bobby, who understood the phase of mind which it indicated, but to Mr. Fenton it was proof positive of his own suspicions that Gerard dreaded to be summoned as witness on behalf of the woman whom he had once loved. She is glad to have him out of the way, thought the astute lawyer to himself. No doubt he has evidence which she is afraid of. Yes, she lied, no doubt, when she said she had told him herself of her marriage, just as she lied when she said she couldn't remember what she had done on the 23rd of December. She remembered... I could see that plainly very well. The counsel for the defense was reluctantly convinced of his client's guilt, but he had good hopes of saving her nevertheless, though he did not think it was to be done by means that were strictly legal. He said little and accepted Gerard's disappearance with philosophy. Even though he did not absolutely discourage Bobby Van Antwerp from sending a detective on his track, it could at least, the lawyer argued, do no harm, since he was quite certain that Gerard, however urgently summoned, would not come. Bobby lost heart and would have let the matter drop, but his wife's influence again carried the day. The detective started with urgent directions from Mrs. Bobby to find the witness at any cost, and equally urgent directions from Mr. Fenton by no means to find him, unless his evidence were desirable. Meanwhile the summer came, and life in the tombs assumed a different phase. The atmosphere in Elizabeth's cell grew unbearable, and the warden allowed her to spend a large part of her time in the prison court. Here, too, since the intense heat, the other women assembled for an hour every day, and she was brought in actual contact with them for the first time. The court was large, and she could sit on the bench which the warden had placed for her in the shadow of the wall and yet though she tried to she could not ignore them she found herself little by little observing them taking even some faint interest in them she grew to know them by name and would talk to some of them asking timid questions partly with an instinctive desire to get away from her own thoughts partly with the feeling that they were human beings in trouble like herself 
There was a lurking sympathy in her heart for even the most depraved. She would share with them her fruit and flowers, or make little presents of one kind or another, even though the matron, discovering this, assured her that they were in many cases quite unworthy of her kindness. "'They won't thank you for it, miss,' she said. "'They won't indeed. They're just as likely as not to say the worst things of you behind your back.' Elizabeth stared at her thoughtfully for a moment beneath knit brows. "'I don't know that I care about their thanking me,' she said at last. "'And even if they're not worthy, that doesn't make it any the less hard for them, does it?' To the matron the sentiment had a taint of immorality, and she drew herself up primly. "'Why, on that principle, miss,' she said, "'there's no use at all in good behavior. Her point of view was the correct one, of course, at least for a prison official. But it was natural that Elizabeth, in revolt against the hard judgment of the world, should take the opposite side. And certainly the women, even the roughest of them, seemed to be grateful in their own way for her kindness, and respected absolutely the intangible barrier between them. There were one or two, indeed, younger and more imaginative than the rest, who would follow her with wistful eyes as she passed, or flush in involuntary, awkward delight if she spoke to them, to whom her presence in their midst appealed irresistibly, touching some latent sense of romance, and lending a new interest to the prison routine. There was something wraith-like, spiritual about her, as she grew from day to day, more frail, her face more thin and wasted, her eyes more unnaturally large and strained, and the shadows beneath them deeper and darker. Her gowns, since the hot weather began, were always white, unrelieved by color, even at throat or belt. Only her hair made a gleam of brightness, the more vivid for the pallor of her face and the grayness of the prison walls. It was this soft, wavy hair at which visitors to the tombs looked most curiously, recognizing one of the strong pieces of evidence against her. There was a number of visitors to the tombs, even on those hot summer days, people who only stared at one prisoner, and asked, before they left, one question of the prison officials, which met the one answer. The warden, a gruff old man, hardened by long contact with the lowest offenders, seemed when his turn came to hesitate. Guilty, she? he repeated, staring up at the questioner with his shrewd old eyes. Well, there ain't a guilty person in the tombs, not to hear him talk, but she— He paused a moment. She never says nothing, but bless you. Carried beyond himself by an unwanted burst of sentiment, I'd as soon suspect an angel from heaven. Ah, he has had a large fee, the more cynical would observe as they left. And it was true— but the canny old warden was quite capable of accepting all the money in the world and reserving the right to his own opinion, which he had stated in this case with absolute honesty. And it was shared, moreover, by the entire prison, jailers and criminals alike. Elizabeth grew conscious of the general sentiment, and it cheered her more than its intrinsic value seemed to warrant, for it was based on no tangible evidence was the result of a hundred unconsidered, unimportant words and actions, the effect of which, to those who had not seen or heard them, it was hard to explain, and it could penetrate little to the outside world, but she felt strangely indifferent to the outside world. Her horizon was bounded by the prison walls. One day, sitting dull and languid on her bench in the shadow of the wall, she chanced to overhear a fragment of a conversation between the warden and a visitor. They stood within the door of the office, and their voices came to her distinctly. "'I tell you,' the warden said, apparently bringing his argument to a conclusion, "'they'll never put a woman, let alone a young and pretty one like her, in the electric chair.' "'Ah, but if she's guilty,' the visitor's voice demanded. And then, with an odd grunt from the warden, they passed on. She could not hear the rest, but what she had heard thrilled her with a new sharp pang of terror, the reason of which she could not have explained. There was nothing in the warden's assertion, nothing even in the visitor's protest. 
she knew of course that there were people who believed her guilty and the man's words were reassuring rather than otherwise yet something in them called up before her vividly for the first time the very danger which he disclaimed yes she was to be tried for her life incredible stupidity how was it she had never realized it before there was after all nothing extraordinary unprecedented in the idea it was one which had exercised over her in times past a curious fascination she remembered well having read a graphic account of the last hours of a noted criminal everything that he had said and done the way in which he had met his fate his last words it all came back to her with a startling distinctness she had tried at the time to put herself in his place to think how she would have felt it was so futile she had desisted from it at last with a smile at her own absurdity the healthy instincts of her warm young life asserting themselves as they generally did against the occasional morbidness of her imagination now looking back on it the whole thing seemed one of those presentiments with which people doomed to misfortune are visited yet the idea was absurd even now there was no danger for she was innocent that man was guilty or so the paper said she remembered that he had protested his innocence to the end and perhaps he had spoken the truth what did the paper say about her own case the evidence against her was strong she had always vaguely known that but what was it the man had said they'd never put a woman guilty or innocent in the electric chair but what woman would accept her life on such terms as that elizabeth raised her head with that characteristic proud little motion which not all the humiliations of prison life had availed to break her of entirely i would rather die she said to herself i would rather die and then she remembered how she had shrunk from death that morning months ago in the park she felt again the intense physical repulsion the instinctive clinging to life the dread of the unknown that evening when the younger matron the one she liked the best came with her dinner she put her through a series of questions which embarrassed the kind woman not a little had she ever elizabeth demanded seen people who were condemned to death and how had they behaved did they seem frightened or were they calm and brave were they did the matron really believe that they were guilty beyond possibility of doubt are innocent people ever condemned asked the girl sitting huddled together on her bed and staring at the matron with haggard eyes surely there couldn't be you don't suppose there could be such a terrible mistake i the matron's voice suddenly failed her her eyes filled with tears heaven knows i hope not miss she said and went out hastily elizabeth sat still staring before her she believes me innocent but she is afraid i will be found guilty a little shudder passed through her in spite of the intense heat and then again the dull cloud of weary indifference descended upon her and she said to herself that she did not care but as time went on she knew that this was false a few days later mrs bobby came back after spending a week in the country much against her will it seemed to her that elizabeth looked much worse than when she saw her last she sighed as she realized more emphatically than ever how much of the girl's beauty had left her with that wealth of color and outline which had been its most striking characteristic certainly any one who judged of her by the famous picture taken in her first bloom would be woefully disappointed now there was only the soft sweep of the hair and the strange shadow in the eyes of which the first premonition as it were had somehow crept into the picture but for these points of resemblance one would hardly know her from the same woman no mrs bobby reflected they won't acquit her for her beauty but aloud she talked cheerfully giving the neighborhood news what there was of it skimming the cream of her letters from friends at gayer places profoundly uninteresting just then and mocking the scene about them with its frivolous incongruity but what matter anything to keep going the ball of conversation but at last in spite of herself there came a pause 
it was intensely hot the sun beat down upon the rough uneven stones which paved the prison court it baked the wall against which the two women leaned before their eyes there rose up sharply the walls of the men's prison and beyond a fragment of the courthouse with which the bridge of size formed a connecting link invisible from where they sat a little way off in a small circle of shade a group of women prisoners gathered silent inert a great stillness brooded over the place broken only by the buzzing of flies and the noises in the street which sounded dreamily as if it were many miles away a man was crying strawberries fresh strawberries and his voice floated into the prison bringing with it a tantalizing suggestion of coolness and freedom and green fields involuntarily elizabeth made a gesture of weariness and raised to her parched lips the great bunch of roses fresh from the country which mrs bobby had brought they already hung their heads i suppose the girl said dreamily her eyes half shut our flowers must be all out at the homestead it always looks so pretty there now before the heat has lasted too long i can see it the river with the sails on it and the fields covered with daisies they must be out now ah and the wild roses she drew a long breath oh i'm sick sometimes for a sight of it all she broke out with sudden vehemence i'd give anything to lie down in the grass with the trees over me and the cool wind in my face and and so sleep her voice sank away she made a weary gesture i'm so tired she said i'd like to sleep forever my dear child mrs bobby caught her breath a mist of tears in her eyes don't you ever sleep here she asked tentatively after a moment and elizabeth answered in the same dreary way unconscious apparently that she was departing from her usual reserve no i don't sleep often she said especially since the nights have been so hot but when i do she paused and stared reflectively before her while the shadow in her eyes grew deeper there's a dream that haunts me now she said at last whenever i fall asleep i dream about my trial and it always goes against me i stand there all alone the judge pronounces sentence and i i try to speak i try to tell them that i'm innocent but the words won't come i wake up half strangled she broke off shuddering oh you can't imagine how horrible it is she said worse even than lying awake mrs bobby was silent for a moment but when she spoke her voice was steady it's a horrible dream she said but it's impossible quite impossible that it should come true you won't be left alone we shall all stand by you you will be acquitted surely surely in spite of herself her voice suddenly faltered in a way that belied her words you think so said elizabeth quickly you hope so but if you should be mistaken she put out her hand and grasped mrs bobby's wrist tell me the worst she said i'd rather know it is there much danger do you in your heart of hearts do you think that i shall be acquitted involuntarily her grasp tightened her strained dilated eyes searched her friend's face with a look that seemed to compel only the truth to tolerate no evasions and eleanor van antwerp with all her courage could not meet it she turned her face away with a little sob elizabeth sat rigid for a moment waiting for the answer that did not come then her fingers relaxed their hold she took her hand away and sank back against the wall there was a long silence the noonday sun crept toward them dazzling the eyes a few flies buzzed aimlessly about upon eleanor van antwerp's mind the prison court as she saw it then baking in the noonday heat the group of women huddled together the rags of some the tawdry finery of others the look of dogged misery on their coarse faces the whole scene impressed itself calling up always in after years a sense of powerless despair at last elizabeth turned to her and a faint smile hovered about her white lips 
do you know she said did the warden show you in that corner where they have the old scaffold what's left of it at least they keep it as an interesting relic oh he wouldn't show it to me she smiled again painfully he's too considerate i heard him telling one of the visitors they don't have anything of the kind now he said there is sing sing in the electric chair and that is or so they say more merciful but is it do you really think it can be she paused and stared up at mrs bobby with eyes full of dawning terror to have a hood put over one's face she went on her voice trembling that's how they do it isn't it to wait wait for the shock she stopped the look of terror in her eyes grew deeper she lifted the roses from her lap and held them up before her face as if to shut out with their color and fragrance some horrible vision oh i see it day and night she said day and night if i see it much longer i shall go mad mrs bobby's hand tightened convulsively upon hers elizabeth my dear she cried you mustn't think of such possibilities it could never come to that they would never carry their cruelty to that extent her voice faltered elizabeth put down her roses and looked up at her her face showed recovered self-control why because i'm a woman she asked with a pale little smile that's what the warden said that they wouldn't condemn a woman to death but even if they stopped short of that what imprisonment would this sort of thing or worse she swept her hand with a comprehensive gesture round her. Wouldn't death on the whole be better? And Mrs. Bobby could not answer, for she thought in her heart it would be infinitely better. But in a moment she rallied her energies. Elizabeth, she said, there's no necessity to consider either alternative. I believe firmly that we shall get you off, but in order to do it you must help us to defend you. You seem indifferent about it mr fenton complains that you keep things back you can't afford to trifle tell us everything isn't there she leaned forward eagerly and grasped elizabeth's hand doesn't julian gerard know something that would help us she felt elizabeth start and shiver then stiffen into sudden rigidity the hand she held was withdrawn and with the action the girl seemed to release herself mentally and physically from her grasp i don't know she said and her voice was cold almost as though she resented being questioned i don't know why you think that i don't think i feel it there is something that he can say mrs bobby's eyes seemed to challenge a denial elizabeth met them with a look of defiance there is nothing she said he knows nothing or if he did she lowered her voice with a sudden change of tone if he could save me i'd rather die than have him sent for ah you'd rather die mrs bobby caught her breath and you think that is fair to yourself to your aunts to us all i don't know the girl's voice had the ring of weary obstinacy that suffering will sometimes assume i only know i don't want him sent for mrs bobby seemed to reflect we can't send for him she said at last we don't know where he is elizabeth started you don't she repeated in a low voice know where he is no he left no address his mail is at his bankers they don't know where to forward it elizabeth turned her face away ah i see she murmured he doesn't wish to be reminded of anything at home a pale cold smile flitted across her white face it is better so she said firmly far far better i am glad that he is away and that there is no use in sending for him but if there were all mrs bobby's self-control could not keep the tremor from her voice if there were elizabeth isn't there something that he could testify in your favor do tell me dear she urged the girl sat silent you see i have guessed it it can do no harm for me to know what it is Elizabeth spoke at last, low and hesitatingly. He knows that on the 23rd of December, when, when that man said he saw me in Brooklyn, I was with him, with Julian. I went out that morning meaning to do some shopping, but I met him accidentally. He persuaded me to go up to the Metropolitan Museum. 
There was a picture he wanted to show me. We were there some hours, and, and that is all. And that was, said Mrs. Bobby breathlessly, on the 23rd of December. You are sure? Quite sure, said the girl listlessly. But what difference does it make? I wouldn't tell Mr. Fenton. I said I couldn't remember what I did that day, and I wouldn't tell you now, if I thought that you could send for him. You can't send for him, can you? She looked at Mrs. Bobby with sudden alarm. You really don't know where he is. Upon my word and honor, Mrs. Bobby assured her, I don't. And then she said little more, but kissed Elizabeth presently, bade her keep up her courage, and left sooner than she generally did. No, I don't know where he is, she said to herself as the hansom bore her swiftly uptown, and she stared out absently at the deserted streets. We don't know, but please God we shall soon, if only that man finds him, if he can only get him here in time. End of chapter 33 Recording by Marion Chapter 34 of The Ordeal of Elizabeth This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeanie Whitfield Chapter 34 of The Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous This was in the early summer, and Elizabeth's trial was to be in November. The time approached and nothing had been heard of julian gerard efforts were made to postpone the trial that this important witness might have time to appear but the influence of people like the van antwerps which seems in some ways all-powerful is in others curiously slight the district attorney was acting in the interest of the yellow journals and they according to their own account in the interest of the people which required, as they set forth in high-sounding editorials, that no more favor should be shown to Miss Van Borst than to the lowest criminal. After all, the girl's health had suffered so severely from the long confinement that it seemed a cruelty to lengthen it. Even with the hope of Gerard's return, Mr. Fenton himself was of opinion that the trial should not be postponed. He had done his best for his client, though hampered, more, perhaps, than he realized by his secret doubt of everything she said. He did not believe in this alibi, which she had trumped up, as he decided, when the one person who could confirm or deny it was safely out of the way. Yet he tried to find some other witness who remembered or imagined having seen her at the museum on the morning when she was supposed to have been in Brooklyn. No such person could be found. The case for the defense was lamentably weak. Mr. Fenton admitted the fact to himself with a shrug of the shoulders, and fell back philosophically on his conviction that no jury would send a young woman of Elizabeth's position and attractions to the electric chair. Perhaps the person most to be pitied in those days was Miss Cornelia, who had been summoned as witness for the prosecution to corroborate the testimony of Bridget O'Flaherty, her former waitress. As to her niece's words and manner on the morning after the murder, the poor lady was in a pitiful state of agitation. "'What shall I say?' she asked, looking appealingly from one to the other of Elizabeth's friends and advisers. "'Say anything,' said Mrs. Bobby hastily. "'Any any lie that you can invent.' She stopped. Mrs. Cornelia drew herself up with dignity. "'I don't think our child's cause can be helped by, by lies, Mrs. Van Antwerp,' she said. Mrs. Bobby felt herself rebuked. "'Well, I'm not given to lies myself as a rule.' she explained apologetically, but in a case like this it seems to me that the end justifies the means. It's a doctrine brought into discredit, I know, by the Jesuits, but 
still it seems to have certain foundation in common sense i don't know anything about the jesuits said miss cornelia with some stiffness but i shall try to act as our church would advise even even if elizabeth here her voice broke i think said bobby van antwerp coming to the rescue that miss cornelia is right eleanor it is much better to tell the exact truth and fenton will make the best of it good heavens he said afterwards to his wife you don't suppose that poor lady could invent a plausible story or even keep back anything that wouldn't be brought out in cross-examination and make a worse effect than if she gave it of her own accord but upon miss cornelia the opposite side of the question was beginning to make an impression her mind moved slowly it was not easy for her to break from the old tradition her conscience had hitherto recognized the broadly drawn line between right and wrong no indefinite subtle gradations as she had said once to elizabeth fully meaning it one could always do right if one tried but if if one could not tell what the right was miss joanna sitting opposite to her in the twilight broke the silence hesitatingly i suppose sister she said i suppose you remember exactly what the poor child said that morning you haven't miss joanna caught her breath you haven't forgotten there was a note of entreaty in her voice miss cornelia could see it so plainly the breakfast table and the paper with those startling headlines and the look on elizabeth's face when she had made that extraordinary assertion a confession of guilt that was the way in which it would be construed there seemed to be no way out of it miss cornelia did not think that the most merciful jury could acquit her after that and yet the child was innocent miss cornelia knew that as surely as she knew that the bible was inspired was it reasonable was it right that she should be required to give evidence against her over miss cornelia's mind there swept a sudden sharp sense of injustice a passionate rebellion against fate but a lifelong habit of truth-telling is hard to overcome she answered miss joanna after a moment i i haven't forgotten sister she said and the hot tears scorched her eyeballs miss joanna put away her knitting with a hopeless sigh well of course sister you must speak the truth she said drearily but it does seem hard then she went out of the room crying quietly miss cornelia sat motionless in the twilight while that new tumult of rebellion still raged within her ah yes it seemed more than hard it seemed cruel and just that such a thing should be required of her those strange people the jesuits whom she had always held in horror had some reason on their side after all there were cases to which the simple old-fashioned rules of right and wrong did not apply which were extraordinarily unprecedented miss cornelia could not help asking herself with a thrill of self-condemnation indeed and yet another feeling which defended the question whether in certain circumstances the wrong were not more to be commended wiser better than the right she spent a sleepless night thinking it over the whole foundations of her life of her faith seemed shaken she looked the next morning so exhausted when she went down as usual to the tombs that elizabeth at once divined that some new misfortune had happened and it was not long before she drew it out of her she sat for a long time very still one hand clasping miss cornelia's the fingers of the other tapping on the ledge 
of the wall beside her. Of course, Auntie, she said at last quietly. You must tell exactly what happened. There's no good to be gained by lies, at least, she made an attempt at a smile. My own success in that mind hasn't been very striking. I was a little out of my head that morning, and I don't remember exactly what I said, but whatever it was, she raised her head proudly, I don't want anything kept back. Let them know the whole truth. Then if they condemn me, well, and good. At least I shan't have anything. Her voice faltered. Anything more to reproach myself with. Elizabeth, the old woman gave at her admiringly, you are so brave. You are a, a lesson to me. But you, you don't realize, my darling. Sobs choked her voice. Oh, yes, I realize. A pale smile flitted across the girl's face. I have realized quite clearly all these months. But that's no reason, Auntie, why you should save me by lies. And then she turned the subject and began to talk calmly enough about one of the women prisoners in whose case she took a keen interest. Nothing more was said about her own affairs. She had relapsed since that conversation months before with Mrs. Bobby into her old reserve and spoke very little of herself. The cooler weather was helping her. She seemed stronger and always quite calm. Miss Cornelia went away feeling rebuked for her own cowardice. Elizabeth was right, she thought with a pang of self-reproach. Nothing but the truth must be told in her defense. But meantime, Miss Cornelia tried to reconcile two opposite instincts, offering up day and night two apparently irreconcilable petitions, that she might be enabled to speak the truth exactly and yet do no harm to her niece's cause. End of chapter 34。Chapter 35 of The Ordeal of Elizabeth。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter thirty five The Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous It was the first day of Elizabeth's trial. She could hardly realize that it had come. This event which they had anticipated so long, the thought of which had lately crowded out every other. There was nothing alarming about the present proceedings. The appearance of one juryman after another generally followed in each case by a peremptory challenge one was objected to because he was thought to have formed a favourable opinion another an unfavourable one and still another because he was apparently incapable of forming any opinion at all if she had not been on trial for her life she might have thought it dull her gaze wandered to that wide courtroom window opposite from which she could see an expanse of roofs flagstaffs and chimneys Full of charm and excitement after the unbroken outline of blank walls which for many months had bounded her view then forgetting herself she glanced about the room quickly turned and shrank back while the color rushed into her white face there were some women whom she knew thickly veiled in the crowd behind her women who were against her those who were her friends had the consideration to stay away and there were others whom she did not know who crowded as close to the bar as they could, eyeing her with eager curiosity, making remarks about her in a stage whisper, as the heroine of this sensational case, she was a disappointment both in dress and appearance. Well, her hair waves prettily. The words came distinctly to Elizabeth's ears in a lull in the proceeding. But that's about all. I don't see why she was ever called a beauty, do you? why no indeed her features aren't regular not a bit and isn't she thin and white hush a kindlier voice broke in suppressing the others it's no wonder poor thing most people would lose their looks if they'd been through what she has 
a pang shot through elizabeth none the less distinct because the reason was in the view of what was going on so trifling and absurd she had dressed herself that morning with unusual care resolved to present as far as possible an undisturbed front to the world and she had not realized that the plain black gown and the unrelieved somberness of the black hat which would once have thrown into more dazzling relief her fresh young beauty now emphasized with startling plainness the change in her appearance for a moment the fact forced itself upon her and hurt even then when a woman has always been regarded as a beauty it is hard to become accustomed to a different point of view after all what difference did it make she had not realized the effect which her looks were supposed to produce on the jury for a while the prospect of any jury at all seemed dubious the hours passed the day came to an end and there were exactly two men in the box it was not till the end of the third day that the number was complete twelve most unhappy men whose faces eleanor van antwerp scanned eagerly some she decided were kind others too logical all of them were more or less intelligent there were one or two she thought to whom the pathos of elizabeth's pale and faded looks might appeal with some eloquence that fresh colouring and rounded curves would have lacked entirely upon these men she based her hopes and so the trial once fairly started dragged on in its weary length mrs bobby spent her days there sitting beside elizabeth her whole life just then seemed bounded by the courthouse walls she had no interest in anything outside and elizabeth's aunts too came every day it was pathetic to see these timid elderly women plunged for the first time in their sheltered lives into this fierce glare of publicity under which they bore up unflinchingly in the effort to show to all the world their firm faith in their niece's ultimate acquittal as for elizabeth she had little hope but neither had she except at times any great fear the worst had been that first day and now she was used to being stared at used even to the thought that she was being tried for her life the scene and its accessories the listening eager crowd behind her the judge before her with his impassive face in which she thought she could perceive now and again or did her hopes deceive her a gleam of sympathy the jury weary but resigned the reporters taking notes scanning her with eyes that noted every detail of her manner and bearing placed upon them heaven knows what construction bobby van antwerp moving restlessly about holding long conferences with the lawyers her counsel and the district attorney wrangling glaring at each other over the heads of unfortunate witnesses the whole thing lost its terrors grew to be an accepted part of her life's routine the evidence at first was technical there was much she did not understand she wondered if the jury did there were the doctors showing with many long words and tedious explanations with what sort of poison the murder had been committed and then there were the handwriting experts with still longer words and more tedious explanations now what was it that they had brought out those unfortunate letters which she remembered so well having written in great haste and anxiety the experts were pointing out the numerous points of resemblance between them and another piece of paper which she had never seen before and now it was the secret marriage they were proving though what was the use of that when no one denied it the question of motive was absolutely clear the district attorney had expatiated upon it at great length in his opening speech all this elizabeth grasped more or less distinctly she realized that the evidence was strong against her but she could not weak and dazed as she was keep her mind on it the voice of the witnesses would grow indistinct a mist would pass over the anxious faces around her a lull would come in the nervous tension of the atmosphere the blue sky which she saw from the window would seem very near and she would float off into phases of oblivion from which she would be roused perhaps by a touch on her arm or a voice in her ear listen darling that was a point in your favor her aunt saw eleanor van antwerp would say 
these points were few and far between but there was one which elizabeth understood she hoped that the jury did mr fenton was examining one of the medical experts for the prosecution a man who had had large experience in poisoning cases the counsel for the defence was putting him through series of questions the drift of which was not altogether plain what sort of a crime did he consider poisoning an atrocious one was it not generally committed by hardened criminals had the witness ever been in contact with a case of poisoning where the whole scheme had been concocted and carried out by a girl of twenty far removed by education friends and antecedents from any connection with crime no the witness could not in his own experience recall any such case but he had no doubt that it had been known though he agreed in response to mr fenton's next question that it would be slightly abnormal and here the district attorney interposed with one of those objections which any lawyer seemed to make mechanically whenever a question proved inconvenient to his side but the judge decided in favor of mr fenton and he went on imperturbably shifting his ground a little poisoning is a crime don't you think so that calls for a great deal of thought and calculation yes the witness thought it would undoubtedly the person who planned it would have plenty of time to consider the consequences the witness responded i should think so he or she whoever it was that planned it would be probably of a cold-blooded and calculating disposition probably and not likely do you think so to suffer from hysterical remorse as soon as the act was accomplished here the opposing counsel again intervened and was again silenced by the judge mr fenton repeated his question i ask you he said addressing the witness with a certain solemnity as a man who has had experience with criminals and human nature whether you think it likely that a woman strong-minded and cold-blooded enough to commit this diabolical crime on hearing of its accomplishment a thing she has been expecting for days would be seized by a fit of hysterical remorse would utter wild incriminating words in the presence of no matter whom anyone who chanced to be present and would rush up at once to look at the body of the man whom she had murdered the witness hesitated it it doesn't seem likely he admitted at last it would be much more don't you think said mr fenton quietly like the conduct of an innocent woman who was suffering from a nervous shock and had no thought of controlling her actions because she had no idea of being suspected the witness after a long pause yes it would certainly seem so it certainly does said mr fenton thank you doctor i have no more questions to ask and he sat down with an air of one who had scored a point thereupon the prosecution as if to prove the strength of the evidence which he had anticipated placed upon the stand bridget o'flaherty formerly maid-servant to the mrs van vorst who swore upon her solemn oath that the prisoner had in her hearing declared herself guilty of the murder of paul halleck yes those were her very words the maid declared that she had killed him and she had added that it had come at last just as she despaired of it or something of the kind referring no doubt to the fact that halleck had kept the poison some time before taking it the woman's testimony was full and circumstantial and she gave the impression of telling the truth mr fenton on cross-examination proved that she had been dismissed without a character from the services of mrs van vorst also that she had been paid for her evidence by a yellow journal its effect was distinctly undermined when he permitted her to leave the stand and with that the prosecution called upon miss cornelia to corroborate the maid's statement miss cornelia was deathly white her head shook her thin silvery curls fluttered as if they had caught the infection of her own nervousness in one hand she grasped her smelling sorts desperately with the other she revolved in an agitated way a small black fan a murmur of sympathy ran through the courtroom as she took her place even the district attorney seemed sorry for her and put his opening questions with unwonted gentleness his tone was still bland when he came to the important point 
had she noticed anything peculiar in her niece's manner on the morning after the murder miss cornelia's answer was low but it was quite audible she was shocked naturally naturally but did she seem surprised miss cornelia's answer was this time still lower and given with more hesitation i i think so you mean you are not sure i i was so upset myself began miss cornelia that you did not notice no i i did not notice said miss cornelia relieved you thought that her manner was unremarkable and simply what you might have expected under the circumstances yes i i thought so said miss cornelia she added to herself the mental reservation that she had no idea what sort of manner under the circumstances she should have expected the district attorney assumed a more impressive manner miss van vorst he said do you believe in the sacredness of an oath yes i i certainly you would not speak anything but the truth no said miss cornelia this time more firmly then i ask you said the district attorney suddenly drawing himself up to his full height and fixing his eyes upon her i ask you on your sacred oath did your niece or did she not on the morning after the murder of paul halleck say to you that she had killed him or words to that effect there was a long silence miss cornelia looked desperately about her as the judge whose face showed more than ever a touch of human sympathy at mr fenton white with anxiety trying to telegraph a hundred things which she could not understand at the jury bending eagerly forward then back at those most interested her sister in an agony of suspense mrs van antwerp flushed and trembling in her vain desire to intervene lastly miss cornelia's haggard eyes sought elizabeth herself the girl was sitting white and rigid motionless as a statue her hands clenched her eyes resolutely bent upon the floor if it was a terrible moment for her how much worse was it for the aunt who had brought her up who was now called upon by a refinement of cruelty to destroy what seemed to be her only chance oh for the courage it seemed to her almost noble to utter one good lie but there were the lynx-like eyes of the district attorney fixed upon her there was the oath she had taken weighing upon her conscientious soul suddenly she felt with a sense of despair that her silence had already spoken louder than speech and even as the thought passed through her mind her answer framed itself on her lips and seemed to be uttered without her own volition one word barely audible but caught at once and registered by twenty reporters while a suppressed sigh went the round of the courtroom yes thank you said the district attorney that is all i wished to know end of chapter thirty five Chapter thirty six of the Ordeal of Elizabeth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter thirty six of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. Chapter thirty six there was still cross-examination mr fenton too began with unimportant questions he gave miss cornelia who looked ready to faint time to recover herself a little the questions he asked were easy to answer had her niece in the course of her education given them much trouble had she ever deceived them kept anything from them before this fatal secret ah no no miss cornelia gave her answers tremulously yet with a fervent relief an eager desire to make herself heard throughout the courtroom then with your knowledge of your niece's character mr fenton asked speaking almost carelessly you didn't think of her as the sort of person likely to commit a crime miss cornelia drew herself up with sudden dignity and her voice was plainly audible and without a tremor most certainly not she said then how 
inquired mr fenton calmly did you account for her extraordinary assertion that she had committed this murder miss cornelia hardly hesitated i thought she was out of her mind she said i couldn't account for it in any other way it never occurred to you for a moment that it was true not for a moment the words came out indignantly you naturally did not suppose that were she really guilty she would proclaim it quite so readily as that miss cornelia stared i never she said simply thought of such a thing as her being guilty but you asked her did you not for some explanation of her words i asked her faltered miss cornelia what she meant by saying such a dreadful thing and she said she said yes said mr fenton encouragingly take your time and tell us the exact truth what did she say she seemed to be rather dazed she said that she had wished so much for it to happen that when it did it seemed almost like an answer to her wishes as if she were accountable for it and you accepted her explanation said mr fenton it seemed to you plausible i knew what she meant yes but i could see that she was overwrought and excited or she wouldn't have thought of it did she seem distressed over halleck's death miss cornelia hesitated mm, not at first she said she couldn't seem to realize it and afterwards yes she seemed distressed then i thought said miss cornelia firmly that she felt very badly indeed when she realized it and there was nothing in her manner that could induce you to believe that she expected it or knew a thing about it beyond what she read in the papers nothing with this word firmly pronounced miss cornelia's ordeal came to an end she descended white and dazed elizabeth leaned over as she returned to her place and pressed her hand with a faint little smile it's all right auntie i'm glad you spoke the truth and so the episode passed she really has done no more harm than we expected bobby van antwerp observed to his wife it is one of those things which sound much worse than they really are after all what does it amount to the hysterical assertion of an excited girl a guilty woman is more careful what she says i will tell elizabeth said his wife in relief what you say but though she found an opportunity after the day's session to whisper this encouragement into the girl's ear elizabeth listened vacantly and did not seem fully to grasp it the maid's evidence her aunt's corroboration had brought up vividly to her mind the danger that existed all the time behind these slow technical deliberations that night the horrible waking dream from which for a while she had been set free returned more startlingly real than ever and the face of the judge who sentenced her was the same face in which during the long days in the courtroom she had thought she detected some involuntary gleams of sympathy it had seemed a kind face in the daytime but in her dream it was inexorably stern the next morning at the trial her mind did not wander she kept it resolutely fixed on the evidence mr d'hauteville was on the stand and she wondered what more fatal revelations and she wondered what more fatal revelations were to be made of her words and actions on that unfortunate morning when she hardly knew what she said or did but no new developments were brought out there was no trace in mr d'hauteville's evidence or his easy unembarrassed manner of the suspicions which he had been perhaps the first in town to entertain yes he had seen miss van vorst on the morning after the murder and had himself taken her into the studio was there anything peculiar in her manner certainly she seemed much distressed as was natural he thought under the circumstances had she tried to possess herself of the fatal flask or of any other incriminating objects as for instance her own letters no most emphatically no was it true 
as the elevator man had already stated that she had defended herself against his accusations he could not remember anything of the kind certainly he had not accused her as he had no reason to suspect her mr fenton on cross-examination drew from him a description of her tears of the fearless way in which she had entered her apparent indifference to being observed was it mr fenton demanded the manner of a guilty woman the witness fully agreed that it was not and then he left the stand saying to himself philosophically that all was fair in the cause of a beautiful and unfortunate girl whom he had admired extremely and with whom his friend gerard had been and might still be desperately in love the next witness was the brooklyn tradesman whose evidence had been already so much exploited by the yellow journals that it lacked the force of novelty he deposed to having sold the flask on the morning of the twenty third of december to a woman in black thickly veiled slight and tall and with reddish hair the witness was quite sure about the date and as to the time he was less explicit but convinced that it was somewhere between the hours of ten and twelve he was a middle-aged man with a plain honest face and evidently anxious to tell what he knew and no more when the district attorney in a dramatic manner desired him to look at the defendant and declare if she were the woman to whom he sold the flask he seemed to shrink in distress from the terrible responsibility thus placed upon him i it is so long ago he protested and you must remember that she wore a veil which entirely obscured her face no not entirely the witness reluctantly admitted look at the defendant the district attorney insisted and tell the court if her general appearance recalls that of the woman to whom you sold the flask he turned to elizabeth and requested her to rise she grew a shade paler and stared at him for a moment as if startled then slowly she obeyed him and stood facing the witness who brought reluctantly his anxious gaze to bear upon her she was ashy white but she held her head erect her eyes met his without flinching thus they stood for fully a minute and the silence in the courtroom was tense with nervous excitement then the witness spoke i there is a certain resemblance he said then you identify her said the district attorney the witness was silent he looked again at elizabeth she was trembling now and caught hold of a chair as if for support the witness cleared his throat he was thinking that he had a daughter of about elizabeth's age i i really could not tell he began take your time said the district attorney impressively this is a very important point and then there was again a long silence in the midst of it the sun bursting through a gray mass of clouds touched elizabeth's hair with a wave of light it stood out a shining halo against the rim of her black hat the witness stared at it as if fascinated then he uttered a sound it might almost have been a sob of relief that is not the same woman he said the hair is quite different the other woman's hair was much deeper red it didn't shine and glisten and her whole air the way she held herself was different i am sure it is not the same and this opinion once announced he clung to tenaciously nothing the district attorney said could shake it mr fenton would not even cross-examine and there was great rejoicing in the ranks of the defence but the next day the prosecution placed upon the stand a druggist's clerk who remembered having sold a bottle of arsenic to a woman dressed in black on the morning of the twenty third of december the occurrence was impressed on his mind because he had demurred as to selling poison and she had presented a physician's certificate she was handsomely dressed and seemed like a lady he had noticed particularly that her hair was reddish and when asked to identify elizabeth he swore unhesitatingly 
that she was the same woman upon mr fenton's cross-examination it became evident what important questions may hang on the colour of a woman's hair mr fenton you said did you not that the woman's hair was red witness cautiously i said reddish that's not quite the same thing mr fenton explain the difference witness confused well i i don't know i meant to say it was sort of sort of light you mean to say in other words that it was not black witness recovering himself and speaking stubbornly no i meant to say that it was reddish sort of sandy ah like the district attorney's moustache for instance there was laughter in the courtroom the district attorney's moustache was a brilliant carrot colour which at the opposing counsel's words was emulated by his face i object to these personalities he said mr fenton was instructed by the judge to be more serious but held to his point your honour it is necessary to find out what the witness means by the vague word reddish if he thinks it applies to the district attorney's moustache but i don't objected the aggrieved witness to the renewed amusement of the courtroom i call that carroty then point out among people present what hair you consider reddish the witness's eyes wandered till they alighted upon the distinctly sandy locks of one of the experts for the prosecution i call that hair reddish he announced with some satisfaction at finding a way out of his dilemma ah now oblige me by looking at the defendant's hair and tell us if you think it is like that of this gentleman the witness glanced helplessly at elizabeth it isn't much like it he admitted and yet you describe both as reddish the witness was desperate well i i don't exactly know he said what you mean by reddish said mr fenton well no said the witness i see that you don't it's not necessary for you to tell us that you are colour-blind evidently and by reddish you simply mean anything between black and tow colour but you can't swear away a woman's life with such vague descriptions as this you can go now i have no more questions to ask the crestfallen witness gladly retreated but in spite of his discomfiture his evidence had been a serious blow to the defence and when a few days later the prosecution closed its case it was admitted on every side to be a strong one the defence opened quietly enough mr fenton too brought out his handwriting experts who were prepared with an equally startling array of technical details to swear to the exact opposite of what had been solemnly declared by the experts of the prosecution the court settled down into a dreamy mood and the spectators for the most part went to sleep there was a break in the monotony and one which created much excitement when elizabeth took the sand on her own behalf she had been very anxious to do this and mr fenton had reluctantly consented with many misgivings and elaborate instructions to which he saw to his alarm that she listened most vacantly but when she began to testify his doubts disappeared she gave her evidence very simply and directly and there was something in the soft low tones of her voice an indefinable ring of girlishness of youth and inexperience which carried with it an illogical thrill of conviction she had never she said bought the flask which contained the poison nor had she ever seen one exactly like it she had not gone to brooklyn on the twenty third of december she had never gone there in her life she had spent the morning of the twenty third of december at the metropolitan museum she had not bought the bottle of arsenic and knew nothing of it she had no reason to expect paul halleck's death she had read of it in the papers no she had not meant the assertion literally when she said that she had killed him she had been startled because his death had seemed to come in direct answer to her wishes and she had somehow felt accountable for it yes it was a morbid idea she realized it now but she had not been at all well at the time 
that was the reason she had gone up to the studio she had been in a state of nervous excitement and hardly knew what she did no she had not thought of the police suspecting her in consequence such an idea had never entered her mind on the whole mr fenton was satisfied with the effect that she was producing he had made the agreeable discovery that he was beginning to believe in her himself and if this conviction was impressing itself more and more upon his own suspicious mind it must he thought be all-powerful with the jury whom he had already mentally appraised as kindly men anxious to escape from an unpleasant duty and willing to give the prisoner the full benefit of every doubt but when mr fenton at last sat down and the district attorney took his place then indeed began a very bad quarter of an hour for elizabeth question by question the lawyer drew out of her her reasons for keeping her marriage secret and for wishing halleck dead her engagement to gerard and the manner in which she had deceived him her color changed from white to red and back again to a ghastly pallor her voice faltered and broke piteously but still the terrible inquiry proceeded behind her her aunts were biting their lips in agony and mrs bobby was beside herself with indignation i'd give anything in the world she said to her husband to get even with that man elizabeth's counsel was keeping up a running fire of objections but in vain the district attorney got in his questions somehow or other and elizabeth answered them as best she could why she was asked among other things was your engagement to mr gerard broken off because she faltered i i told him of my marriage why did you suddenly tell him when you had kept it concealed so long elizabeth looked up with a piteous appeal in her eyes which was answered by an objection on the part of her counsel and she was told by the judge that she need answer no question unless she wished but by this time she had recovered herself i am quite willing to answer she said i told him because i was sorry i had deceived him i had no other reason you are quite sure that you did tell him and that he did not find out for himself there was an insulting tone to the question but she answered it steadily without anger i am quite sure she said who was with you on the day that you say you went to the metropolitan museum this was the next question put with disconcerting suddenness she turned still whiter if that were possible than before and her answer was barely audible mr gerard was there anyone else with you no one is he the only person who can corroborate your statement yes then it is a pity he is not here she was silent mr gerard observed mr fenton when he went abroad left no address we made efforts to communicate with him but so far we have not succeeded it is most unfortunate most unfortunate certainly echoed the district attorney for the defendant but perhaps he was not anxious to be summoned we have heard of witnesses who went to the ends of the earth to avoid it he turned to elizabeth do you know of any reason he asked why he should not wish to come elizabeth's hands were clasped together nervously i i cannot tell did you send for him as soon as you knew that his testimony was needed i did not why did you not said the district attorney in his sneering voice the color flushed into her face because i because i her voice faltered and broke I did not wish him sent for she said with a sudden flash of defiance then she turned deathly white and put up her handkerchief to her lips i will not answer any more questions she added faintly after all it had been very bad worse far worse than she had expected she felt as she left the stand that she had done her cause only harm it seemed to her moreover that whether she were acquitted or found guilty she would never after the abasement of that cross-examination 
hold up her head again the outlook was gloomy and the case for the defense was almost closed but when mrs bobby arrived in court the next morning she was greeted by mr fenton with a broad smile we must put the handwriting experts on again he said cheerfully it will be dull but anything to gain time i have had a cable from mr gerard he will be here in a few days end of chapter 36 chapter 37 of the ordeal of elizabeth this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 37 of The Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous Julian Gerard paced impatiently the deck of the steamer, on which for eight miserable days he had existed without sight of a newspaper. It was early dawn, the outlines of the Goddess of Liberty loomed uncertainly through a thick fog. He remembered how, when he had last seen his native shores, he had been distraught with bitter anger against the woman to whom his heart now turned with an eager longing, a passionate remorse. For the hundredth time his mind analyzed and condemned that strange whim, the expression of a passing but very real phase of his disappointment and disillusion, which had led him to cut himself off from the world he had left behind. He had no wish to hear from home to be reminded of home ties, or of the woman whom he had resolved to forget. Beneath his self-repressed exterior there was a strain of adventure in his blood, which made him turn, in a crisis like this, to the primitive resources of uncivilized life. He had left home with no definite plans, but in London he met with a friend, who was about to start for his farm in South Africa. Gerard at once decided to accompany him. South Africa was as good a place as any other, when all one desired was solitude and hardship, and to get away from oneself, and the unsatisfactory tone of the world. The farm was deep in the interior of the country, many miles distant from railroad or telegraph station. For months the two men saw no one but the natives. They had no connection with the outside world. Gerard rode and hunted and studied, and took notes on the condition of the country. It was not a bad life, on the whole, with a certain charm for a man satiated with all that wealth can give. He might even have enjoyed it, if he could have forgotten what had driven him to it, or erased from his memory the one face which haunted him. The worst of it was that she always seemed to be unhappy. He always saw her as he had left her, white and sad, with pathetic eyes. The thought of her which he had carried away that night seemed to have entirely effaced his earlier impressions of her, as she had first flashed upon him in the vivid radiance of her fresh beauty, as he had seen her often in a ballroom, a being meant only for smiles. He had never pictured her then as suffering, but now he could not think of her in any other way. One evening, as he and his friend sat together smoking, he found himself impelled, as it were, in spite of himself, to tell his story. The doubts, the misgivings which tortured him, had grown too strong. It was a relief to put them into words. He spoke low and bitterly, in hurried phrases that were evidently the expression of his constant thoughts, not excusing the conduct of the woman who had deceived him, dwelling upon it rather with some harshness, for the very wish, perhaps, which he was conscious of to do the reverse. The other man, as he spoke, scanned his face keenly. At the end he made only one comment. "'And yet she loved you.' Gerard stared at him for a moment, the colour flushing into his dark cheek, and then his face softened. Yes, it was not his money and position. He could at least do her that justice. "'I believe she did,' he said at last, in a low voice. "'Then for heaven's sake,' the other man flashed out, "'what more do you want?' Why, good Lord, if a woman loved me! And here he broke off, and sat in silence, staring fixedly into the fire. Gerard paced the floor that night, and his friend in the next room smiled grimly to hear him. The same smile flickered across his impassive features when Gerard the next morning announced his departure. 
his reasons were plausible. He wished to go about the country, and study for himself the political situation, of which he had hitherto seen little or nothing. His host, after that first involuntary smile, heard him through unmoved, and expressed his approval. He escorted him to the nearest town, wrung his hand at parting, and went back, with a grimmer look than ever, to his own solitude. Gerard had no plans. He was conscious of only one wish, to be where he could have news of home. At Cape Town he met the detective, who had followed him, led astray by various false clues till he had at last found the right track. An hour later the two men started for New York. And now, at last, the wretched journey was over, and Gerard paced the deck of the ship, and wondered miserably what new developments might have occurred. There was a sensation in the courtroom when he appeared. There had been rumours for days that the trial was being delayed for the arrival of an important witness, but it had hardly been expected that this would prove to be Elizabeth's missing lover, who had disappeared from few, as the prosecution had asserted, to avoid testifying against her. At least that reason for his absence could not be true, since it was Mr. Fenton who was bringing him in with an evident air of triumph. Gerard himself had a worn and haggard look which showed even through the sunburn which had darkened his face. He had grown very thin, and there were white threads in his hair which were not visible a year before. His features were set in lines of absolute, impassive rigidity. He glanced neither to the right nor left, but sat down at once in the ranks of witnesses. There was a short pause of breathless expectancy, and then the prisoner was brought in. Her aunts and Mrs. Van Antwerp were with her, as usual, and behind followed the police officer, a little in the background, with the air he considerately wore of effacing himself as much as possible. Those who were near Gerard saw him wince and flush painfully. He had been prepared for this, but the reality shocked him almost beyond his powers of self-control. How changed she was, paler even than he remembered her, and thin and worn till but for her eyes and hair he might scarcely have known her. It gave him a shock, too, somehow, to see her all in black. He had always pictured her, illogically, in white, as she had been that last evening. For a moment she hardly seemed the same woman he had thought of, dreamed of, all these months. A rush of remorseful tenderness swept over him, all the greater because she was so changed. He would have liked to go to her before them all, and proclaimed to the whole world his love and faith. But what he actually did was to turn his eyes away, to spare her. She knew that he was there. She had read the news and the trembling joy depicted on her aunt's faces, before Eleanor Van Antwerp had whispered, "'Darling, prepare yourself. He has come. He has come to save you.' It hardly seemed a surprise, now that it had happened. She had always known in her heart that he would come." But she was not glad. She did not wish to be saved. By him. She still felt as she had felt from the first, that she would rather die than sit in her place of humiliation and see the pity in his eyes. Ah, thank heaven, he had turned them away. For him, no doubt, as for her, it was a painful moment. He felt sorry for her, of course, a woman whom he had once loved, who was being punished more than she deserved but there was an invincible pride in her nature which rebelled against his pity, which would have preferred condemnation, contempt. Yet, after all, pity was all that she deserved. She had never been worthy of his love. Let her take what poor remnant of it was left, and be thankful. Yet, deep down in her heart, there was, in spite of herself, a feeling of joy that the world would know that he had not forsaken her. There was little time for these conflicting thoughts to oppose each other in Elizabeth's weary brain. Gerard was called to the stand, and then she could do nothing but listen, and listen gratefully, while in quiet, even tones, speaking very simply and to the point, he corroborated all that she herself had testified. Yes, he remembered perfectly the morning of the twenty-third of December. He had spent it with Miss Van Vorst at the Metropolitan Museum. They had been at the museum for several hours, and he had left her at home at half-past one. 
Had he known, then, of her marriage to Halleck? No, not then, but soon afterwards. She had told him on New Year's Eve. No, he had not suspected it, or drawn out the avowal in any way. It had been entirely voluntary. Naturally their engagement had been at an end, and he had gone abroad immediately. That was his evidence. It materially strengthened the defence on two points. First, that the prisoner had not bought either the flask or the poison. Second, that she had not expected Paul Halleck's death. The district attorney, realizing this, tried to undermine its credibility. It was not an easy thing with a man of Gerard's character and high standing. But, after all, a man in love is hardly an accountable being. The district attorney dwelt sarcastically on the improbability of his having remained in ignorance all this time of the impending trial, and insinuated that he must have had serious objections to returning, which had finally been overcome by the efforts of the defence. He asked his questions in a blustering way, which fell just short of insolence. Gerard answered them quietly, apparently unmoved. Yes, he admitted, it seemed improbable that he should not have heard of the trial, but it was nevertheless absolutely true. He had spent the greater part of his absence on a farm in South Africa. He had led a rough, solitary life, read no newspapers, received no letters. He had first heard that his evidence was needed at Cape Town five weeks before. No, he had not received a letter from the defendant urging him to come to her rescue, nor did he believe that any such letter had been sent. It would have been quite unnecessary. "'Your disinterested chivalry, in other words,' sneered the district attorney, "'was sufficient without such an appeal?' "'It is not a question of chivalry,' said Gerard coolly. "'It is a question of telling the truth.' "'Which, of course, you are anxious to do?' "'Of course.' His imperturbability seemed proof against all the offensiveness of the other's manner. The district attorney, shifting his ground, questioned him as to the broken engagement, and here he was rejoiced to find his man more vulnerable. A tremor would cross Gerard's face. He changed color more than once, but still his answers were given quietly, in low, measured tones. Yes. It was true that Miss Van Vorst had kept him in ignorance of her marriage, but he did not think that her reasons for her silence need be discussed, since they were quite irrelevant. "'And you mean to assure us,' said the district attorney, incredulously, "'that she told you at last of her own accord without the slightest necessity?' "'Most certainly.' "'And what she told you, then, was the only information you received of her marriage?' "'Yes.' It was the only reason for breaking the engagement? Yes. And now that that reason no longer exists, said the district attorney, the engagement, I suppose, is likely to be renewed? The question was so unexpected that Mr. Fenton was not ready with an objection, and Gerard spoke before he could interpose. I don't think that I am bound to answer questions as to what may or may not occur in the future. Mr. Fenton hastily agreed with him, and he was sustained by the judge. But the district attorney defended his line of inquiry. "'Your Honor, it is important for me to show how far this witness is biased in favor of the defendant. He has wished to marry her once. It is possible, apparently, that he may be in the same position again. You won't deny,' he went on, turning to Gerard, "'that there is such a possibility?' Gerard hesitated for perhaps a second. Then he looked the lawyer squarely, defiantly in the face. He was very pale, but there was an angry light in his eyes. His voice rang out clearly. "'I deny nothing,' he said, "'except that my feelings toward Miss Van Vorst have influenced the truth of anything I said.' Mr. Fenton again formally entered his objection, and after some wrangling question and answer were stricken from the record. Still, the jury had heard them, and could form their own conclusions. Mr. Fenton was not dissatisfied. There was a romantic element in the situation, which must, he thought, appeal irresistibly to the popular imagination. And indeed, as Gerard left the stand, the general sympathy was on his side, even among those who secretly thought that he had stretched a point here and there, on behalf of the woman he loved. It was possible that his evidence was false, 
but the people who thought thus, if they were men, did not blame him. If they were women, they admired him rather the more. The eyes of the courtroom were fixed upon him as he crossed over to where Elizabeth sat and shook hands with her quietly, as if they had parted yesterday. And then he seated himself near her in the little circle of her supporters. Eleanor Van Antwerp put out her hand to him, her dark eyes shining through a mist of tears. "'Julian, you don't know how happy I am to have you back,' he shuddered. "'Don't speak of it, Eleanor. I can never forgive myself for having gone.' Elizabeth heard the words, but her eyes were resolutely bent on the ground, and she refused to take any of the comfort that his presence might have imparted. It was natural that he should feel remorseful, eager to show the world as much as possible that he had not forsaken her, that he thoroughly believed in her innocence. But for anything more, such a possibility as the district attorney had suggested, which he did not deny, could not, of course, very well deny under the circumstances. Ah, uh, no, there could be no question any more of love between them. Her own pride would not permit it, even if what she called his pity could influence his judgment to that extent. And then, with a start, she remembered that she was still on trial for her life, and that all thoughts of love and marriage were incongruous, almost grotesque. The case for the defense was closed. The district attorney was to make his final address the next day. The thing would soon be decided, one way or the other. The next morning a box of flowers was brought to her, the white roses which he had always sent her. For a moment she hesitated, touched them lovingly, and then at last she took one of them and fastened it into her belt. "'It may bring luck,' she murmured, as if to excuse her action, and then she bent her head and pressed her lips to its fragrant petals. A little later, when she entered the courtroom, the eyes of all were fixed on the flower. It was the first touch of color that had ever relieved her black gown. "'You see,' one woman whispered, "'it's the sign of innocence.' Her companion, less easily moved, replied cautiously, "'Perhaps.'" End of chapter 37《三十三》Chapter 38 of The Ordeal of Elizabeth。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeanie Whitfield. Chapter 38 of The Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. The tide of popular sentiment was turning in Elizabeth's favor. It had not been with her at first, in spite of her youth and pathetic circumstances of her position, nay, against her all the more on that very account with many people, who feared a display of mawkish sentiment, and to whom the cold-blooded character of the crime stood out the more harshly, by contrast with her soft and girlish looks. But now, one thing and another, an intangible something in her manner on the witness stand, Gerald's return, and his evidence on her behalf, his apparently unchanged devotion. And this had created a strong revulsion of feeling, which was increased rather than diminished by the district attorney's charge. The district attorney was in a brutal mood. He did not spare Elizabeth. He left it, he said, to the jury to determine the weight of Gerard's evidence. For himself, he would not for the world suggest that a gentleman of Mr. Gerard's high character would testify falsely. Yet, he might be mistaken. He might easily make some slight error in dates, misled by his, his interest in the defendant. While he talked, Gerard bit his lip, inwardly cursing that dictate of civilization which had abolished dueling and made even horsewhipping a doubtful expedient. Mrs. Bobby was considering ways by which one could be avenged on a horrible man, not in society, whom one couldn't snub by not asking him to dinner, or anything of that kind. Elizabeth felt, with a new thrill of pain, that she was involving Gerard in her own disgrace. But Mr. Fenton, 
surveyed the district attorney unmoved through half-closed eyes and said to himself coolly that he was going too far his own charge was a skillful defense of gerard's evidence a criticism not too violent of the district attorney's brutality and an appeal not too open to the sympathies of the jury elizabeth blushed as she realized that this was the point after all she was to be saved on issues that would not have been effectual with a man and then the judge's charge began and she forgot all sense of humiliation but the thought that her fate hung in the balance to be decided one way or the other by those carefully balanced judicial phrases did she imagine it or was there through all the calm analysis of evidence the impartial weighing of this or that detail a conviction of her innocence so decided that it made itself felt almost unconsciously strong on our side bobby van antwerp's voice unusually animated and exultant sounded in his wife's ear at the end the prosecution are furious they say it's horribly unfair but of course we won't quarrel with that eleanor was deathly white her hands were tightly locked together at bobby's words she gave a little sob of hysterical relief oh bobby she murmured under her breath thank god the judges are human after all now if the jury are anything short of brutes they'll acquit her at once and make an end of this but the jury fell short on this test of humanity and retired to deliberate mrs bobby scanned their faces anxiously as she had done at the beginning of the trial they were careworn and gloomy naturally with a woman's life in their hands but surely surely they should look happier since it was in their power to save her i wish bobby she murmured with that sob again in her throat but this time not one of relief i wish we had tried if they wouldn't take money don't eleanor said bobby they're all honest men and besides one can't do such things to himself he was thinking that women really seemed on such occasions as this to be entirely without principle and yet that somehow one liked them all the better for it this was at two o'clock three four five o'clock came and still they made no sign the long deliberation seemed ominous to the anxious group who waited in a small dark room on the ground floor of the courthouse starting at every sound and counting the moments as they dragged wearily along mr fenton and the other counsel came restlessly in and out with a cheerful air that covered but indifferently their intense anxiety bobby and julian gerard stood by the window talking occasionally in low tones more often silent and gazing at the prison walls that rose up grimly before their eyes elizabeth sat at a small table in the middle of the room and her aunts and mrs van antwerp sat around her in a forlorn circle it was a long while since any one had spoken all consoling suggestions were exhausted elizabeth's hands were clasped tightly in her lap her eyes wide open yet unseeing stared steadily before her vaguely she was conscious that there were people in the room that by the window stood the man whose presence might have mattered more to her at some other time than anything else on earth that her aunts and eleanor van antwerp were beside her and would bend forward now and then one or the other of them to press her hand in a dull mechanical way she was thankful to know that they were there yet nothing they said or did could help her a great gulf seemed to yawn between her and the outside world it is thus perhaps that the dying feel when they see with their failing sight the faces of friends and know that even love is powerless to reach them elizabeth suffered during those hours of suspense the agony of death a hundred times over but as the afternoon wore on hope faded and the numbness of despair crept over her tortured nerves i don't like their staying out so long bobby van antwerp could not help murmuring to gerard 
after the charge i thought they'd let her off at once they all wanted to that's certain but there were one or two of them who looked infernally conscientious i don't want any of them gerard began but stopped to go against his convictions was what he had meant to add but the words remained unspoken there are limits to even a puritan conscience good god bobby he whispered hoarsely a man who could convict her deserves to be shot i agree with you old man said bobby tranquilly and then they once more fell silent and the shadows lengthened and someone lit a feeble gas jet which brought out in ghastly relief the look of strained expectancy on each face at six o'clock there was a rustle an excitement mr fenton came in and spoke to bobby and he spoke to his wife she touched elizabeth on the shoulder dear we we go up now she said elizabeth rose and mechanically put her hand to her hair do i look all right she said and then smiled vaguely at the commonplace question a merciful stupor had descended upon her in the last hour when she looked at her aunts she saw they were suffering far more than she i am not frightened she said please don't be frightened she was determined that she would be brave this was the thought uppermost in her mind they went up to the courtroom, and on the threshold, Mr. Fenton said to her, Remember, that even if the verdict is, is unfavorable, it's not final. We shall appeal. She bent her head, wondering mechanically that anyone should speak of things to happen after the verdict. Her whole life seemed bounded by the events of the next few minutes. She could not look beyond the thought crossed her mind of how slight a thing would decide her fate. The difference between one word or two, guilty or not guilty. A mere trifle, a word in three letters, yet all the difference between honor and dishonor. Life and death, her mind fastened upon the irrelevant detail and dallied with it, the while she was conscious with sickening intensity of each movement in the courtroom, the breathless atmosphere of a suspense in which the mere rustling of a paper jarred upon the nerves, the jury filing in, the formal opening question, Gentlemen of the jury, have you decided upon your verdict? Her throat was parched, balls of fire danced before her eyes, there was a sound in her ears like the rushing of many waters, guilty, or not guilty one word or two the question beat upon her brain with a dull persistence and she was conscious vaguely that the answer was of vital importance but somehow she could not bring herself to realize it not guilty the words rang clear and confident across that gulf which separated her from the outside world as through a mist she saw the relief on the faces of those around her but still she herself was conscious of no feeling she sat white and dazed staring before her while her lips moved mechanically repeating the words that seemed so meaningless not guilty there was a pause and then a stir a murmur of relief some women sobbed aloud but she herself still sat staring before her repeating the answer that seemed to have no meaning not guilty end of chapter thirty eight chapter thirty nine of the ordeal of elizabeth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. 
Chapter thirty nine of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. By the next morning, she had realized all that the verdict meant. She had had time even to grow used to it. The first joy had spent itself, the inevitable reaction was setting in. Life isn't everything, she thought, and stared before her with knit brows. The fire, it was a long time since she had sat beside one, gave out a cheerful glow. The little drawing room wore a festive air and was bright with flowers that had been sent to her. A feeling of physical ease and contentment, of relief in the mere change of scene, stole over her wearied senses. But still it did not suffice. She struggled indeed against it. She took up and re-read a letter which had been left for her a little while before, and had caused her, in her state of exhaustion, something of a nervous shock. "'They have just told me,' it said, "'that you are acquitted. As for me, I am very ill. They say I can't live much longer. That's why I ask if you will come and see me at once. There are some things I'd like to tell you, and if you don't come quickly it may be too late. Amanda. The address was that of a hospital. I didn't know, Elizabeth said, that Amanda was so ill. Her aunts, who were hovering about the room, devouring their recovered treasure with tender eyes, looked surprised at her introduction of an irrelevant subject. I heard that she had gone to a hospital, Miss Cornelia said dryly, and her mother came down to be near her, but dear me, that girl always has something the matter with her. I don't know why you should trouble yourself about her, my dear. Both she and her mother have behaved in a very unfeeling way all this time, never coming to see you or sending messages or anything. Well, Amanda has sent me a message now, said Elizabeth. She wants me to come and see her, and I think— She hesitated a moment. I think I shall go at once, she announced with a sudden decision. The words sounded strangely to her as she uttered them. It was so long since she had said that she would do this or that, and even now her wishes met with some faint opposition. Her aunts looked at each other. "'But won't that be painful for you, my dear?' urged Miss Cornelia after a moment. "'I'm used to painful things, Aunt Cornelia. The girl's smile was bitter. There was a tone of petulant willfulness in her voice. Her aunts still looked at one another. Unspoken words trembled on the lips of each. "'My dear,' Miss Joanna began at last, "'Julian—' She stopped. "'He said he hoped to see you this morning,' said Miss Cornelia, taking up the sentence. "'He hoped that after you had rested—' She faltered as a look crossed Elizabeth's face, which did not promise consent. And then suddenly she took courage and crossed over to Elizabeth and took her hand. "'My dear,' she cried, "'you—you must see him. He has been so unhappy. He—he loves you, Elizabeth.' Again her voice faltered. The girl sat passive for a moment, and then she flushed and dragged away her hand. "'I can't see him,' she broke out hoarsely. "'It—it would be more painful than seeing Amanda. And if he loves me, why so much the worse?' Then softening, as she met their dismayed looks, "'Oh, don't you understand?' she cried. "'Don't you understand that the kindest thing I can do for him is—not to see him?' And then the tears sprang to her eyes, and she hurriedly left the room. When she came back a few minutes later, she was dressed for going out, in the black gown and hat that she had worn at the trial. She had tied a black veil over her face. "'I must go see Amanda,' she said, speaking very quietly and without any trace of emotion. "'I should always regret it if—if anything happened before I went.' She paused as if in expectation of further protest, and then, as none came, she went to them and kissed them both affectionately. "'You—you don't mind, do you?' she said, with a note of apology in her voice. Her aunt sighed resignedly. "'I wish you would let me go with you, Elizabeth,' Miss Cornelia said, feebly. Elizabeth smiled. "'Why should you, dear?' she said quietly. "'I've got to face the world alone some time, I suppose. And it will be nice to see what it's like. I've almost forgotten.' She gave a little sigh, but checked it instantly, and went out before they could say any more. Once in the street, the world seemed so strange that it was startling, and for a moment turned her faint and giddy. It was a mild midwinter day. The trial had lasted over Christmas and into the new year. Almost there seemed a foretaste of spring in the air. To Elizabeth the sunlight was dazzling. She put up her hand to ward it off. She walked slowly and feebly, as if she were convalescing from a long illness. She had not realized before how weak she was. Fortunately there was but a short walk before her, through the quiet regions of Irving Place, past Gramercy Park, and on to the hospital. She met no one she knew, but several strangers glanced at her curiously, or so she imagined, as if they recognized her even through her veil. They might know her from the pictures with which the papers had been filled. They had seen one, no doubt, only that morning, with an account of the verdict. They were wondering still, perhaps, if she were guilty or innocent. She was very tired when she reached the hospital, and the meeting with Amanda loomed up before her like a nightmare. Her hand trembled as she rang the bell. 
a woman in a sister's dress opened the door the hospital was under the charge of a protestant order there was something conventual about the waiting room into which she was shown there was little furniture pictures of saints hung on the walls the wide window was filled with stained glass through which the light streamed faintly and fell in bars of crimson and purple upon the polished floor the sister speaking in the subdued voice which the place seemed to demand bade elizabeth seat herself and took up her name elizabeth sank down with a sense of physical relief which obliterated all other feelings a moment later she looked up with a start the door opened and a woman entered it was amanda's mother well elizabeth so you've got off she said mechanically touching with dry lips her niece's cheek i'm sure i'm glad enough for the sake of the family and then i never thought you did it elizabeth flushed painfully that was kind of you aunt rebecca she said well a great many people did you know and probably do still for that matter but lord what difference does it make as long as you've got off some people might think all the more of you there was that girl at who committed that murder that everybody talked about she got a hundred offers they say right after she was acquitted and everybody knew that she got off just because she was a woman elizabeth shuddered please don't talk about it aunt rebecca she said faintly tell me about amanda a sort of contraction crossed aunt rebecca's face which might in anyone else have resulted in tears oh amanda's pretty poorly she said in an odd dry voice i guess all those sanitariums and new-fangled inventions haven't done her much good why the doctor sent her here i don't know it's a queer catholic place and i don't hold with such notions but amanda seems taken with the sisters she broke off abruptly as one of their number entered she was a woman of middle age with a grave fine face and a musical voice which harmonized with the place and her own costume in her presence amanda's mother for all her uneasy contempt seemed to sink at once into insignificance the sister took possession very gently but completely of elizabeth her charge had been very anxious she said to see her it was kind of miss van vorst to come and then she led the way up the stairs and down the long white corridors talking quietly as she went of amanda's case the girl was suffering from a complication of maladies and the sister thought that there was besides some trouble weighing on her mind under the stress of which she grew daily weaker no there was humanly speaking little hope though amanda's poor mother did not realize it but the sister thought it would do her patient good to see miss van vorst of whom she had talked a great deal all this time there was not a word not a curious glance to show that the sister knew that she had beside her the subject of so much discussion and yet elizabeth felt herself enveloped in an atmosphere of sympathy a tacit recognition of the fact that she had suffered which held in it not a trace of blame or suspicion elizabeth felt grateful the private room which amanda occupied as one of the few paying patients was near the roof of the house at the head of several flights of stairs sunlight poured in through the window the floor was covered with matting the walls bare and hung with religious pictures opposite the small iron bed and placed where the light fell full upon it was an engraving the copy of a famous picture of christ upon the cross it was singularly vivid and the sorrowful dignity of the face had attracted the eyes and soothed the sufferings of many an occupant of this room amanda's strange light eyes as they stood out unnaturally large and dilated in her thin wasted face were not fixed upon the picture but turned with eager expectancy toward the door she was sitting up in bed her head propped with pillows her skin had faded to a duller more ghastly tint than ever but a bright spot of red burned in either cheek as elizabeth entered she started and an odd look flitted across her face it was hard to tell whether it indicated relief or fear or perhaps a mingling of both so you've come she said and drew a long sobbing breath it was all her greeting elizabeth embarrassed murmured a few words of sympathy as she sank into the chair nearest the door the sister with a keen glance from one to the other left the two girls alone amanda immediately assumed control of the situation sit there she said in a quick sharp voice and pointing to a chair by the window sit there so i can look at you elizabeth mechanically obeyed and threw back her veil amanda's eyes fastened eagerly upon her face why you you've lost your looks she announced abruptly did you know it there was a note of involuntary satisfaction in her voice elizabeth tried to smile worse things have happened to me than that amanda she said i didn't think anything could be worse to you amanda said feebly elizabeth was silent she was thinking that suffering had not yet produced in amanda any regenerating effect well after all i guess it don't matter amanda said drearily after a pause you're acquitted just the same and mr gerard is just as crazy about you as ever they say i guess you've got the best of me still she sank into a gloomy silence 
elizabeth dared not speak she was wondering if she could not escape since her cousin had nothing to say beyond the old jealous complaint but suddenly amanda turned to her i've something i want to tell you she said speaking feebly and with difficulty sister made me promise that i would she said that if there was any any way in which i'd injured you it would ease my mind to tell you but first you must promise she looked about her suspiciously you must swear to me on your oath that you won't repeat anything i tell you she raised herself on her pillows her breath came in convulsive gasps she fixed her eyes intently upon elizabeth promise she said in her weak hoarse voice swear to me on your oath that you won't repeat what i tell you now elizabeth trembled her brain felt dazed those strained eager eyes held her with a terrible insistence i i promise she repeated hardly knowing what she said conscious only of a wish to have them withdrawn amanda sank back as if relieved on the pillows but still she questioned with a look of doubt you won't break your word you are sure quite sure said elizabeth her brain still seemed dazed her lips moved mechanically amanda seemed satisfied still she did not speak she lay quiet with half-closed eyes at last with a painful effort she raised herself up and fixed her eyes again intently upon elizabeth i sent the poison she said the words came in a hoarse whisper elizabeth stared at her without moving only a slight shudder passed through her the words echoed in her ear beat upon her brain the odd part of it was that they did not surprise her she seemed somehow to have heard or thought them before yes amanda repeated after a moment i sent the poison it was after i had left the sanitarium no one knew that i had left it i dressed as like you as i could i copied your handwriting i knew they would think it was you but i didn't a slight undertone of contempt made itself felt in her voice i didn't know how easy it would be for i didn't suppose you'd do all those stupid things that made them suspect you she was silent elizabeth stared at her motionless aghast but why why she faltered what object amanda could you have a look of intense bitterness crossed the sick girl's face she seemed to flare up all at once into a red heat of anger as dry withered wood will sometimes give out the fiercest flame what object she repeated you ask what object and you know how he scorned me didn't you wish him to die you admitted it in court because he stood in your way and do you think that is anything to being humiliated dragged in the dust as i was she leaned back panting on the pillows the fierce flame of anger which passed over her seemed to consume her feeble strength when she spoke again it was much more feebly that time when i i went to him at the studio she said i thought maybe he'd come back to me again seeing you didn't seem to want him i thought but there i was a fool most women are i guess when they care about a man he laughed at me and said that i deceived myself that it was i who did the love-making that was a lie but it was what he said i guess about most girls when he got tired of them i got wild it seemed as if my brain was on fire and i i threatened him he only laughed and then i taunted him about you that seemed to hurt him more i said as how you had so many beaux you didn't care any longer about him he said then i was mistaken that you were just as fond of him as ever really that you would do anything he wanted she paused her breath seemed to fail her elizabeth sat listening stupefied incapable of speech or motion amanda went on presently huddling one word upon another i didn't believe him i thought it was only to make me feel worse and then when i went out i met you the thought came to me that i'd find out the truth i came back I'd left the door open. I saw you give him money, but there was a look on your face that made me think you didn't do it for love. She paused again and struggled for breath. Elizabeth spoke involuntarily. But how did you know, she asked, about the pearls? What, that you'd sold them? Amanda spoke quietly with a slight smile as at the simplicity of the question. I knew it the moment I saw you that evening, and you didn't have them on then when i spoke of them i saw i was right i saw how i'd frightened you there was a secret i didn't know what but it was something you were ashamed of then when you got engaged to that other man i understood i knew you were afraid of his finding out i used to write to him warning him 
he never answered my letters or paid any attention i guess he thought i was crazy but i had to keep on writing i couldn't help it somehow i had to do everything i did it seemed as if something urged me on the only thing that kept me from from having my revenge was that you might reap the benefit and then this plan came to me and i saw how i could get even with you both the hoarse feeble voice grew fainter and died away as if from sheer exhaustion elizabeth interposed an indignant protest and so she said you wanted me to suffer for your crime you would have been glad if they had found me guilty amanda did not answer for a moment no she said at last i didn't want you to die i knew you'd get off everyone said so because you were so pretty and so swell they wouldn't the bitter smile again hovered about her white lips they wouldn't have said that about me but if they had found you guilty she paused i had quite made up my mind to confess it was horrible lying here thinking it over i don't believe death can be worse you couldn't have suffered anything like it for you were innocent she looked at elizabeth with a strange horror in her eyes her face was ghastly beads of perspiration stood on her forehead and on the little rings of dark red hair which clung about her temples oh you don't know what it is she said you don't know what it is it's the thought of that that's killing me inch by inch it's not the disease and yet i'm afraid i'm afraid to confess her voice broke piteously you don't want me to do you now that you've got off it won't do you any good any longer and as for me though i don't want to live i'm afraid to die the feeble voice again faltered and died away elizabeth sat silent her brain in a whirl before her there rose the thought of the long months of torture the prison cell the terrible unnecessary suspicion that still clouded her life if amanda would confess it would be something people would never again believe her guilty and yet mechanically her eyes wandered about the room the incongruous setting for this strange scene bright calm and peaceful filled with the pictures of martyred saints her gaze lingered fascinated on the face of christ in the engraving it might have been the effect of the light or the overwrought state of her nerves which made it appear so real instinct with mysterious life and power almost it seemed as if the lips moved the sorrowful eyes rested with a look of infinite pity on amanda you won't betray me the feeble voice pleaded i trusted you you promised you won't break your word no elizabeth spoke slowly and thoughtfully i won't break my word i did break a promise i made you once and repented it ever since but this time i shall keep it if you confess it must be for your own sake not for mine no one i care about believes me guilty let it go amanda drew a sigh of relief her head fell back her attitude of tension relaxed insensibly you are very generous she said faintly i i won't be ungrateful and then a silence fell upon them amanda's eyes closed she seemed exhausted elizabeth seeing this got up i had better go you are very tired no answer came but as she reached the door amanda's eyes unclosed she turned her face towards her good-bye she said i'm sorry you've lost your looks perhaps you'll get them back the words came out with a great effort and then she turned her face away and said no more the sister was waiting outside in the corridor she accompanied elizabeth to the door of the hospital as they parted she laid her hand for an instant on the girl's arm her grave clear eye scanned the white exhausted face my dear she said did your cousin tell you what she sent for you to say elizabeth met her gaze firmly with eyes as clear as her own it is a secret she said quietly i promised not to repeat it a cloud passed over the sister's face her hand rested for a moment tenderly on elizabeth's arm poor child was all she said it would have been hard to tell to whom she referred elizabeth or amanda an instant later the great hospital door swung to and elizabeth found herself again in the outside world amanda lay absolutely still she was conscious for the moment of nothing but the utter vacuity of exhaustion it was only little by little that her strength revived her brain began to work those thoughts weighed upon her again which were killing her inch by inch it is hard to understand the processes of a mind like amanda's diseased perhaps from the first made more so as life went on by illness and adverse circumstances as to how far she was accountable who can decide one thing is certain 
that some sort of moral struggle now took place within her her brow was contracted her lips moved now and then she stirred uneasily her piteous gaze fastened half unconsciously as elizabeth's had done on the face of the christ in the engraving for her as for elizabeth the pictured eyes held a curious fascination but we read into inanimate objects above all the symbols of our faith our own thoughts and convictions it was not pity which amanda saw in the sorrowful eyes which to her too seemed alive with a singular power when the sister came in a little later she asked her a question isn't it enough if we confess our sins she asked feebly you said that would be enough to have them forgiven the sister looked down on her gravely repentance is not enough she said unless we do what we can to make amends amanda turned away with a feeble moan it was late in the afternoon when she nerved herself as for a great effort she called the sister to her and whispered what she said did not seem to cause surprise the sister's face brightened she left the room quickly it was evident that she was prepared for an emergency like this an hour later the small room was filled there was a lawyer witnesses amanda's weak voice spoke steadily without pause when it was over she sank back exhausted and her eyes again sought the face in the engraving she found there what she expected with a long sigh of relief she turned her face to the wall and slept the sister quietly pulled down the blind she will rest now she said softly and it was true amanda never awoke end of chapter 39chapter 40 of the ordeal of elizabeth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by caroline morales chapter 40 of the ordeal of elizabeth by anonymous don't you think said gerard that i have waited long enough it was five months later the mellow afternoon sunlight pierced the foliage which interlacing formed an arch overhead wild roses grew in profusion along the roadside beyond the fields were thickly strewn with buttercups and daisies the air was fragrant with the scent of honeysuckle elizabeth wore a white gown the hands carelessly clasped before her filled with june roses so far she matched the day and the season but her head drooped languidly like a wilting flower the country air had brought no color to her cheeks lines of suffering still lingered about her mouth the eyes which were cast down almost hidden by their long lashes held a latent shadow in their depths the man by her side who had just come up from town noted all this with a keen anxiety don't you think he repeated with an impatience the greater for what her looks conveyed don't you think that i have waited long enough a quiver crossed her face but she did not look up it's not my fault that you have waited she murmured the man made a rueful gesture oh you need not tell me that he said if you had had your way you would have sent me back to south africa i believe he broke off with a bitter laugh as if in spite of herself a smile flickered beneath her drooping lids not quite so far perhaps the word sounded with a demure accent but in an instant the smile vanished her lip quivered she looked up at him with a tremulous earnestness ah uh, can't you understand she cried why i want you to go haven't i brought you trouble enough do you think that now she paused and caught her breath now that all this disgrace has come upon me she went on with an effort do you think I would burden you with it? Disgrace, he flushed hotly. I don't know why there should be disgrace, he said, when everyone knows now, even those idiots who doubted you, how baseless the whole miserable accusation was. P. 
people don't reason, she sighed warily. There will always be a cloud over me. I feel it even here. People at the mill stare at me. The neighborhood, she smiled painfully. The neighborhood feels that I have brought upon it eternal discredit. Ah, you can't blame them, as Gerard muttered under his breath an ejaculation. It will be the same in town, everywhere. People will always remember that I was horribly talked about, that I have been in prison. But for myself, her lip trembled. I'm hardened, but for you, for me. He put out his hand and took hers determinedly into his strong grasp. For me, it is inevitable that whatever troubles you have, I must share them. There was silence for a moment. They stood facing each other, the only actors in the peaceful country scene, the man strong, determined, his eyes aglow with the fire of mastery, the woman pale, drooping, exhausted, yet still with some power in her weakness that opposed itself to his strength. She put out her hand at last in a gesture of entreaty. Ah, don't let us go all over this again, she pleaded. Don't make it so hard for me. It's hard enough. The words seemed to escape her unawares. Ah, a gleam of triumph crossed his face. It is hard then? Most things are hard. She spoke with recovered firmness. Life is hard, but one must bear it. At least I'll try to bear it, alone. The only amends I can make to you. She clasped her hand suddenly in a passionate gesture of renunciation. The only atonement is to efface myself, to sink out of your life as if I had never been in it. She paused. Her breath came in convulsive gasps, but still she faced him resolute. The look in her eye, with which some penitent of the early church might have welcomed lifelong immolation. To efface myself, she repeated, dwelling upon the words as if they held some painful satisfaction. To sink out of your life, it is the only atonement I can make. You can't make it. Gerard's words rang out clearly. He took her hands again resolutely in his. You can't efface yourself, he said. It's beyond your power. A smile flickered across his face. His eyes looked into hers with an imperious tenderness, before which they fell abashed. Do you know, he said, why I went off in that idiotic fashion into the wilds, tried to cut myself off from the world, I was bitter, angry. I wanted to forget you. I thought, if there were nothing to remind me of you, I might. And then day and night I thought of you. Day and night your face haunted me. Oh, Elizabeth, his voice broke. Ask me to do anything except forget you. There was again silence. Elizabeth's lips parted. Her breath fluttered. A warm, lovely color flooded her face. He thought she had yielded. But almost instantly the color faded. She drew her hands from his grasp and shrank away, as if under the weight of some painful memory. And, and that deception, she gasped out. What has happened to change that? You said, don't you remember that you could never, her voice quivered, never trust me again? She lifted her head suddenly. She looked him firmly, steadily in the face, with eyes that seemed the index to her soul. I did deceive you, she said. Nothing can change that fact. Why should you trust me now? Ah, uh, it would be hard on most of us. The words sprung impetuously to his lips. If there were no forgiveness, if strict justice were always meted out. He put out his hand in a passionate gesture. A rush of feeling thrilled his voice. Elizabeth, he cried, don't bring up words which I said that night in anger, which I have repented, God knows, ever since. 
You have done an heroic thing in telling me the truth at last. Just when it was hardest, I, brute that I was, could only think of my own misery. But let the past go. It shall not ruin our lives any longer. He put his arm around her and drew her towards him. He felt her heart beat, her pulses throb. His voice took on a deeper note of tenderness. The future is ours, and love is ours, my darling. Does anything else matter? The argument may have not been a wise one, but it has gained more victories than all the logic in the world. Elizabeth, weary of struggling, resigned herself to her defeat. Later, she looked up, gave a little fluttering sigh, and her eyes sought his with a wistful sweetness. Dear, not worth it, she murmured, but I will try, oh, I will try so hard. Gerard, smiling, cut the sentence short. They walked on homeward through the fragrant lanes in which they too seemed the only wanderers. The Mrs. Van Voorst, sitting by the drawing room windows, saw them come with a little thrill of anxiety. Miss Joanna dropped the stitch in her knitting, and Miss Cornelia's thin, silvery curls fluttered, as if stirred by some intangible wave of sympathy. Elizabeth crossed the flower-studded lawn and came towards them, her white skirt swaying about her in the gentle summer wind. She held her head erect. Her color was brilliant, her eyes lustrous. The setting sun shone on her hair and lit it up into a vivid glory. Elizabeth's aunt stole a glance at her, at the look on Gerard's face. Then their eyes met and they smiled softly at each other through a mist of tears. End of chapter 40 End of The Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous